Hello. How's everyone doing? It's me again. With another session of uh, 428. Should we scramble? I am thinking of adjusting my uh, microphone filters. I don't know if I should uh, adjust that or not. As I've been told, it sometimes doesn't really pick up things. Sami Mario. If read, I'm trying to see if I could adjust the sound a little bit. How are you doing today, Fred? Interesting. I'm not sure if this is better or not. With this, um, okay, what do you think about the audio, Fred? The microphone audio is this currently better? Is this better, or do you not notice any difference whatsoever? I'm adjusting the uh, noise gate. I'm thinking at the moment. Um, As good as it always is. Hmm. I feel there is there are a few things. Sometimes when I uh, use the voice mod, like for example, if I'm speaking, sometimes it cuts off a little bit. So why does it? It does cut off sometimes, and then there. Every time I speak, there is this quiet um, hissing sound. Hmm. A lot more difficult to figure out what I should be doing here. Okay, so I need to adjust a few things with the voice mod stuff. About now, it's a better. It's a more terrible.
just trying to really see what the problem is, but um Hmm. Maybe now? I think that might be better. Yeah, I'm playing around with the filters. I really should understand them more, and I should have really done this offline, but uh, a lot more difficult to, to judge if I'm not actually online. Like, I've tested it thoroughly before without any voice mod, but it seems like voice mod just uh, has issues. Could it be the compressor? Maybe it's the noise suppression? Okay, let's try this. Um, I'm going to remove noise suppression. this button. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It might be an issue with the noise suppression that I had. It's automatic, so it's not something I really could adjust. I either turn it off or on. Staticky, all right. Even when I'm speaking now, is it is there more static?
Hmm, only with the mod. Let me see if I can monitor the audio just to test it. Uh, let's open up the audio settings. Let's monitor the... I'm monitoring so you're probably gonna hear double, I think. Are we hearing double? I don't think we're hearing double. Um, let's do... Am I hearing myself? Nope. Not hearing myself now. Hmm. Oh, I've been playing around with the wrong one. Let's see. Yeah, I can hear myself. And you can probably hear me twice. Let's test this as one. Yeah, that is static. Too much static. We need too much static. Yeah, there's a lot of static. Unacceptable level of static, really. Um, how can I fix it? Ouch. My ears. Uh, let's try noise suppression here. This is luck. So very bad. Still the name. I know. Yeah. I don't want to go now. That's it. It's too far off. It's that. I want that one. Oh, how about now? I think it's not going to be that. I was too It's actually really bad. Let's uh, adjust the level of the suppression. I think what is 20 as well. It's good. Yeah. Probably good. Snowbo. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Voices are better than others. This is fine. This is also fine, probably. This is fine. This is fine. So tell me, when is this bad transitions? Okay. I'll accept that, I think. As long as uh, this one. This works. Does this work? There's some going off of this. I don't know why it does that. The version I just said was the. Um. Shall I. Oh, 
this one. Yeah, this is too echoey. This voice, yeah. It's handsome, static. Not too much. This is fine. This is... No. I don't like this voice. How about... I'm looking for an alternative voice. This is fine. I think this is alright. Yeah, let's- I'm so Hello, friend. Let's see... Did you... One, one, two, three. I think this voice is... What about this one? I think this is fine. Yeah, this sounds good. I like this voice. Let's, uh... Let's save it. I'm gonna replace the narrator voice that I was using. And, uh, I'll just call this one Boomer. Boomer? Yeah. Boomer is good. I'll swap, um, I'll swap Osawa's voice for that one. Uh, which makes me think most of the recordings from the past sessions for Osawa were difficult to understand. But, what can you do? Maybe I need to replay the game and re-record it. Osawa's lines. Or maybe not. People should deal with it. It's fine. This isn't a perfect stream. If you want a perfect stream, there are plenty of perfect channels to check out. I can't name a single one, but that's irrelevant. Alright, let's uh, actually start playing. We spent 20 minutes fiddling around with the audio. I should set it up so I can actually hear my voice back every time I stream, but it doesn't actually get sent to you guys twice. I tried setting it up back in the past and it didn't really work. And um, I need to sit down and do it one day. Although it's kind of difficult to actually stream when you can hear your own voice because uh, it feels like you're speaking over someone else and subconsciously you just stop speaking because you hear somebody else speaking at the same time I can't do it but I need to get used to it you're too kind Fred too kind <laughs> Okay, we stopped yesterday where 
I think we got to, yeah, Osawa. The guy with the different voice now. He suddenly changed his voice and became much clearer. And um, his sentences don't cut off so much. But yeah, tell me if any of the voices uh, have issues with the stuff and I'll try and fix it. He reloaded the page and saw his earlier thread had gotten a reply. Oh, I yeah, pressed the wrong button. It was from Pretty Honey, a regular contributor to Osawa's threads. I'm opposed to the idea of Aya Kameki expanding into America. She should be able to enjoy the success she's earned in Japan without having to struggle overseas. I am pretty sure this is uh, Kano's uh, potential father-in-law now. They mentioned it's, uh, it's someone who knows about police and farming. I am certain it's him. And it's funny because yesterday, as soon as I jokingly said, oh, he should invite him over to join. They mentioned that, and yeah, it is him. I'm sure it's him. And I'm just trying to imagine him typing with all the emoticons. Aya has done so much for us. I'd like her to keep supporting Japan forever. The message was festooned with the sort of emoticons that a young girl might use. Pretty Honey claimed to be a 19-year-old female college student. I don't believe it. Although the community was meant for Aya Kameki fans 40 and over, the settings allowed anyone to post there. The only young woman among the members, however, was Pretty Honey. The thread continued. By the way, have you tried the Aya fortune teller yet? There is a link below. Fortune telling, huh? Fortune telling. The practice of determining a person's future luck or life events using cards, horoscopes, and or other methods of divination. Most people believe such pro prognostication when it foretells something good, and don't believe it when it, the outlook is bad. That's about as much faith in fortune telling as someone should have. Maybe that's too much, actually. Okay, if it's not, I sing. You want me to make another bet? I've already made two bets. One of them was correct. Okay, you know what? I'll 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 do it. Slightly lucky. That was uh, a letdown. Osawa stared. Should he ask it whether Maria was safe? If it gave him a good answer, he'd believe it. If it were a bad answer, he wouldn't. Then why bother? I remember <laughs> one time when I had a, I had a stalking incident once. I mean, it's a one-day stalking incident when I was uh, living in Glasgow. And I remember on the same day, my horoscope... When I was uh, checking my Yahoo account, they uh, they sent me my horoscope. I don't know why they sent it just that particular day. And they mentioned uh, someone uh, being a big fan of me and I'm going to get followers. And it was pretty funny because it was kind of applicable to the situation. <laughs> Obviously, it was just coincidence, but uh, still. I think there was also one time there, there, was, a, there was a satire horoscope on um, the university newspaper back when I was an undergraduate student and even though it was satire it actually applied perfectly on that day and I was telling somebody and they were laughing because it's it's meant to be a joke but it actually was accurate I don't remember what it said he clicked the link and the Aya fortune teller page came up it asked you to enter your birth date and sex and then Aya Kamiki would offer her advice Osawa followed the instructions, entering his date of birth, selecting mail, and then clicking next. A few seconds later, his fortune was displayed. You're a very work-minded person. He'd hoped for some insight on Maria, but instead it was just a write-up about his personality. You'd never be able to get by with the devoted support of those around you, but you probably don't realize that, do you? It's a big mistake to think you can get through all of life's challenges on your own. Oh, you want me to check my horoscope for today? I don't know where to even do that. Hmm. 
Let's see, I'll Google it. Let's see, horoscope for today. Be diplomatic and do your best to keep the atmosphere in the workplace as harmonious as possible. If this happens, you'll end up getting 1,000 Twitch subscribers in one day. Keep it up. Or not. <laughs> it just says, if a disagreement gets out of hand, someone will walk out and you could find yourself having to work overtime. That never happens. Are you single? Make the effort to get to know a new neighbor. Uh, I don't have a new neighbor. And I don't want to know my, new, my neighbors. There is nothing cool about being ignorant. If you don't get over your indifference to the world, the world might start to harbor quite a grudge. Find a way to connect more deeply with the people around you and start living a better life before it's too late. Just do that, and you're sure to have a wonderful future ahead. Wow, how generic. Famous people who got your result. Shinosuke Orai, playwright. Uh, we already know about Orai, we haven't met him yet, but... Uh, the head of the Wandering Angel Theatre Troupe. He has an interview appointment with Minoru Minorikawa at 2.30 this afternoon. And just before the interview, um, we had a keep out, so... I'm a Libra, apparently. Because I was born late September. And that's why I like uh, using kitchen scales. Or just because I'm lo a logical person and you should be using kitchen scales. If you don't have a kitchen scale, what are you doing? Leave the stream right now and buy a kitchen scale. Promotion doesn't apply. I don't have any commission from kitchen scale sales or anything but you should get a kitchen scale why don't we have a kitchen scale Asawa couldn't help but feel that the advice was painfully appropriate he went back to the forum and replied to pretty honey nice to hear from you again pretty honey i definitely know how you feel about ayakamiki being ours still i'm confident she's got what it takes to persevere and succeed in america here is a funny thing as far as i know aya kamiki at the time maybe she was successful this was 2007 2008 uh i think her career had a huge drop off before 2010 though i don't think she released any album after that even though i don't really follow pop music but i don't think she released anything after that And if she does fail, well, all of us in Japan will be here to welcome her back all the same. Yes, this voyage to America I've concocted just has me a little worked up. Asawa clicked post and leaned back in his chair. Mr. Asawa. Mr. Asawa, please tell me it's Kajiwara. It was Kajiwara shouting from outside the door. First, the toilet. Then, lunch. What is it now? There's been a development in the case. Please join us in the living room. We have important matters to discuss. Kajiwara had his detective face on. Damn it, I want the other face for Kajiwara. When Asawa entered the living room, I was already there, looking stern and sullen. Now that you both are here, Kajiwara said, allow me to share what we know. We've identified a location that appears to be the Syndicate's hideout. You have? What about Maria? Is she there? Osawa explained. We still haven't been able to ascertain whether your daughter's safe. Well then, what were these important matters you needed to discuss? Asawa felt a wave of anxiety rush through him. The hideout in question is a condominium in Hiru, and it's owned by... By whom? Mr. Asawa, please calm down. Yeah, if somebody is not calm, the best way to calm them down is to tell them, please calm down, it always works. 
having an argument with your significant other, just tell them, please calm down and then everything will be fine. Trust me, this method gets my seal of approval. Tell me, go on, out with it. Kazuara took a deep breath. The residence is owned by Mamoru Tanaka. Nani? Osawa was speechless. He couldn't process what he was hearing. Tanaka? Nice. This will be in kind. Then September pays the kidnapper. Where is your proof? I shrieked. Don't you respect, ma'am? Weren't you suspicious of Mr. Tanaka yourself? I still think she... She and Tanaka have a relationship. I think they had a relationship before she got married. They probably still have a relationship together. And uh, probably the... Maybe the reason why she was... Uh, she had a bug planted on him was to check if he was cheating. Not because of the kidnapping. But I, I'm pretty sure they had a relationship. I... Well... I suppose, but... We did go so far as to stick a listening device on him. Flustered, I withdrew into a vacant silent silence. The sudden ringing of the phone startled everyone in the room. Was that... Was that Tanaka? Why would he call? No, it couldn't be. There was no way, Jose. The phone was wired tapped. The detective wearing the headset nodded to Kajiwara. We in turn motioned for Osawa to pick up. Oh, I know who's calling. The person who's calling is uh, Minorikawa. Hello? He said cautiously. Is it me you're looking for? I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your smile. You're all I've ever wanted. And my legs are open wide. Ah, oh, hello. Is this the home of Maria Osawa? The voice was not Tanaka's. Asawa didn't recognize it, but the veil of despair that hung before him thinned slightly. Is this the home of Hitomi Osawa? That's not Adele, that's Lionel Richie. This time the man on the phone used Hitomi's name and said. Yes, that's right. The caller immediately hung up. As Osawa stood there, dumbstruck, Kajiwara gently took the receiver and hung up the phone. <laughs> One of the detectives addressed Kajiwara. We traced the source of the call to his cell phone. Also, we've pinpointed the base station used. Inform Director Kuze so he can prepare a team, just in case. Just in case. Osawa asked. What do you mean by that? Kajiwara frowned slightly. Just because this is a kidnapping's case doesn't mean that every phone call comes from the kidnapper. We'll look into it, of course, but... Oh, I see. Besides, right now, confirming Mr. Tanaka's whereabouts takes priority. Don't you agree? Osawa nodded. Someone should call him, the detective added. I'll do it. I got out her cell phone and dialed up Tanaka. Where was Mr. Tanaka headed? Kajiwara asked. 
He eyed the sour keenly. To work, I sent him to pick up some documents. I don't actually know. I'm gonna go with uh, B. I don't actually know. I don't actually know. Even leaving out the part about Hitomi, that was still the truth. If Tanaka was behind the kidnapping, Osawa knew he ought to tell the police about the blue minivan and the emails from his daughter. But part of him still trusted Tanaka deep down, and he couldn't bring himself to reveal it all. I've been saying Tanaka is fishy since day one, and this guy still trusts him. We have, an investiga we have investigators en route to Tanaka's condominium, Kajiwara said. Let's wait for them to report in. Wait, why did that repeat? That repeated. On the far side of the room, I was quacking in frustration. Quack, 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 quack. Despite several attempts, she hadn't been able to get through to Tanaka. Kajawara's phone rang and he pulled it from his pocket. And this is uh, Kano calling. Yep. Kano? What's going on? He headed into one corner as he spoke into the receiver. I suppose they'll be alright. What for though? After a few more quiet words, Kajiwara held his phone out to Asawa. One of the investigators on the scene would like to speak with you. Frowning in confusion, Osawa took hold of the phone. Osawa speaking. Can I help you? This is Detective Kano from the Shibuya Precinct. Time is critical, so I need to just cut to the chase here. There was a pause as the speaker took a deep breath before continuing. Did you give the antiviral drug to your daughter, Hitomi? And this was another thing I predicted. Well, deduced, I should say, not predicted. What? Osawa was so startled that his voice caught in his throat. Oh, uh, what are you talking about? What you talking about, Willis? The antiviral research was top secret. So how did some detective from the Shibuya precinct know about it? Well, I think if we... Currently, Kano is on a keep out. So we are going to jump over to Kano. And we can continue Kano's story. Let's do that. They're still on the phone. Did you give the antiviral drug to your daughter, Hitomi? Osawa let out a gasp. What the... Uh, what are you talking about? I'm the one asking the questions here, Mr. Osawa. Did you give the antiviral drug to your daughter, Hitomi? Um... I'm not sure I understand the question. Asawa's voice trembled as he spoke. Kano was sure he'd hit the nail right on the head. I know what the syndicate is really after, Mr. Osawa. It's the virus, it's you, it's Hitomi. It's... Hitomi. Osawa remained silent. Mr. Osawa? Is everything alright? The line went dead. Guess the, uh, that answers that well enough, Kano said as he put away his phone. Now it was clear why the criminals were after Hitomi. He saw an uneasy look on Stanley's face. Something on your mind? Kano asked. Stanley responded with a question of his own. If Hitomi was carrying the antiviral, how were the criminals planning on getting it from her? A blood sample? Kano thought for a moment. Well, taking her by force at the scramble posed too high a risk, he said. There were nearly a hundred detectives there, and they must have guessed there would be. That's why they devised the attaché case relay. They wanted to abduct Hitomi somewhere away from the dragnet's notice. 
This was a plan that all the signs seemed to suggest. But still, he added, I wonder how they managed to lead her away from police protection. A look of revelation crossed Stanley's face. All they would need to do was convince her to go of her own accord. But how? Kano asked. And then it came to him. He thought back to Hitomi's initial contact with Tariq al Karawan. Hey, Lydra. Just before he had taken the attache case from her, the two had a brief conversation. It was possible al Karawan had given Hitomi some form of instructions then. Or maybe he was just cocking in her ear. Guess we're back to tracking down al Karawan again, huh? Kano could tell from the look in Stanley's eyes that he was on the verge of saying something. Probably some remark about how Tateno had allowed El Caravan to run free. Right now, Kano wasn't going to argue the point. After this case was resolved, he would discover what Tateno's real motives were. And once he did, Stanley would eat his words. In the meantime, We can't just wander around looking without leads, he said. Until we get more intel, let's see what we can do with the security cameras back at the precinct. Numerous monitors shone down on the pair as they entered the Shibuya precinct's surveillance room. They just teleported there? Each showed an array of faces of individuals somewhere in Shibuya. Kano asked one of the operators to pull Al Karawan's data on screen. Let's see. Birthday... February 15th, 1976, he's Iranian, height 6'3", weight unknown, build medium, language Arabic, English, Japanese. He's Iranian, he's not going to be speaking Arabic, he's going to be speaking Farsi. Uh, some people. Hair dark brown, eyes black, sex male, complexion light, scars and marks non known. Past record, Tariq al Karawan has offenses of... Uh, drug possession, something else. Notice Tarko Kawan is leader of the crime syndicate, something. But yeah, it wouldn't be speaking Arabic, it would be speaking Farsi, but uh, to some people, all brown people are the same. <laughs> By selecting each of the faces on the monitors in turn, they could run comparisons to determine if anyone among them was Al Karawan. One by one, the operator made his way through the faces. Assuming their target was still in Shibuya, there was a high likelihood they'd find him. But the minutes ticked past, and there was still no sign of him. Kano's tone grew, grew more and more impatient as he directed the operator's search. Just calm down, Stanley said. He set a hand on Kano's shoulder. You keep wasting your energy when you don't need to. That's just how I do things, Kano replied. I'm energetic because I care. He pointed out another face to the operator. Well, you're setting yourself up for a short life. With a sigh, Stanley sank into a nearby chair. My brother was like you. Okay, let me guess. His brother was uh, also a cop and then uh, he got killed because of the criminal syndicate and now... This guy is trying to get revenge. The American spoke so quietly that his words were barely audible. The Russian American. Ten minutes later, a man clad in black appeared on one of the monitors. The operator lined up his cursor. The comparison check confirmed that it was Al Karawan. Yes, Kano hissed, pumping his fist. It appeared that their quarry was simply walking around town, calm and composed. Kano radioed, radioed in Al Karawan's location to Kuzei. All units intercept the suspect on the double. Kuzei ordered. Kano will provide the guidance using the surveillance monitors. They saw Al Karawan stop in front of a cigarette vending machine. Was he waiting for someone? Says I am a reporting. I've got eyes on the mat. Must perpetrator, hook to put someone in cuffs, dipper, pickpocket, once outstanding warrants, hang paper to write multiple citations, and other such, tra such traditional police jargon. 
Kano's partner had evidently been nearby. I'm making the arrest. He said he's gonna get stabbed or something. I mean, he did mention it was his uh, wife's birthday, so something is gonna happen to Sasayama. There was a note of courage in Sasayama's voice. He came into view on the monitor, walking casually. Let's see him get stabbed. Okay, so his disguise was nothing connected to Tama, I guess. At some point, he ditched his anime nerd costume for a street dancer's getup. It didn't appear that El Karawan had noticed him yet. Bit by bit, Sasayama closed the distance. Not much further now. Kano's hand balled into a fist as he watched. And then, something unexpected happened. Another man came running into view right in the middle of the monitor. Teruo Toyama, while searching for Hana at Shibuya Gigo, who was located by a duo of debt collectors and fled the scene. Hana left Gigo to find him and ran into him here in Ryamacho. The pair are headed, headed toward Koendori, trying to find a place to hide. There was no sound, but they could see that the newcomer was shouting something. As Halikawan turned to look at the man, Sasayama launched himself like a bullet from a gun. In an instant, Detective and Perp were locked in a violent scuffle right there on the street. Kano swallowed a lump in his throat as he watched the struggle unfold. Earlier in the day, Alkarawan had done a number on Sasayama, but this time, the detective had the upper hand. He got a grip on Alkarawan's neck and kneed him repeatedly. Alkarawan tried to desperately to bring Sasayama to the ground, but Sasayama braced himself and avoided the takedown. Then he shifted his stance and took Alkarawan to the pavement with a spectacular hip throw. Yes! Kano clapped his hands together in excitement. Catching the perp in his scarf hold, Sasama got out his handcuffs. A technique in judo involves wrapping an arm around the opponent's neck while performing an upper body pin. Stanley, we should head to the scene, Kano said. He looked away from the monitor for a mere moment and that was when he got shot or stabbed, I guess. When he looked back, Sasama had released his hold and crumbled to the ground. What? Panic, Kano stared at the image of his friend. Yep, he got stabbed. There was something jutting from Sasayama's abdomen. Zoom in, Kano cried frantically. The camera closed in on Sasayama. Now Kano could see exactly what he had feared. Sasayama had been stabbed in the gut, blood pooled on the pavement around him. Kano screamed, Sasayama! The camera showed several other detectives arriving at the scene, capturing Al Karawan before he could escape. But Sasayama lay motionless. The pool of blood around him spread further and further across the pavement. Unable to look any longer, Kano rushed from the surveillance room. To be continued. Alright, we finished Kano's uh, hour. Wait, what does it say keep out now? I thought it said to be continued. Sometime the game is glitching. Okay. I was startled, yeah. What are you talking about? End of our research was top secret. So how did some detective from the Shibuya precinct know about it? Well, Osama was bewildered. I'm the one asking the questions here, Mr. Osama. Did you give the interval drugs to your daughter? Not sure I understand the question. And what the syndicate is really after, Mr. Osawa. Osawa's mind went blank when he heard what Kano said next. He could give no reply. Mr. Osawa? Detective continued after a moment. Is everything all right? Without really thinking, Osawa hung up. They were after the virus. Did he mean the Uo virus kept in the lab? Wait, hold on. But I picked Hitomi. I didn't pick the virus as a choice. Was that the wrong thing? The detective. Hold, wait, hold on. The detective had to be wrong about that. The kidnappers must have the Uo virus already. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had to do what I did to Hitomi. Away. These are your crimes. 
At last, Osawa understood what those emails from A were all about. They were a preview of the tragedy that was yet to unfold. The kidnappers probably meant to start the main event soon. It might already be too late to stop them. Mr. Osawa? The Kaj Kajiwara asked. Are you alright? The detective gazed with concern into Osawa's ashen face. Bracing himself, Osawa spoke up, his voice hoarse and dry. He was not horsing around. The killer virus is about to be unleashed in Tokyo. And I know who's responsible. It's me. It's a me. The sudden confession caused the detectives on site to stir like a hornet nest. Please arrest me. Feeling the weight of his crimes crushing down on him, Osawa dropped his gaze to the floor. He held out both his wrists. I'll tell you everything down at the station. He said. Anything you need to know. Osawa imagined bodies dropping left and right. There were limits to what might be cured by the small stockpile of antiviral his lab currently contained. If they were unable to quarantine the infected in time, then Shibuya, no, all of Japan, might be engulfed in a pandemic that the drug could never stop. A massive outbreak of a particular infection on a regional or global scale. I, get, I love how this game needs to explain what a pandemic is, when nowadays everyone knows what a pandemic is. In 14th century Europe, a massive cholera outbreak is said to have killed two-thirds of the population. The Spanish flu outbreak in the early 20th century killed at least 25 million people worldwide. Given modern advances in transportation, some researchers are of the opinion that the global risk of epidemic is higher than before. Yeah. Funny how this got localized in 2018, just a year later. COVID. could only hope that his complying with authorities might help stop the spread of the infection before it was too late. Bad end. Guilty conscience. The thought of the Uwa virus devastating Japan filled Osawa with despair. Blaming himself, he asked to be arrested. This only happened because of what Kano said to him. A simple error in word choice led Osawa to a completely wrong conclusion. Kano ought to properly inform Osawa just what the kidnappers are after, but I didn't select that choice. I selected Hitomi, not... Okay, the game is definitely bugging. It's you. Osawa remained silent. Mr. Osawa, is everything alright? Line went dead. Kano, Stanley chided. I would have put it more like this. They're after Hitomi because she has the antiviral. That's what I've been saying. Yeah, I know that. But if they're after the antiviral, that makes the person who created it a potential target as well, right? Oh, indeed. Looks like you do have some brains after all. Stanley flashed Kano a thin smile.
what are you okay what are you talking about okay he didn't know did you give the antiviral drug to your daughter not sure I understand the question yep oh the syndicate is really after it went blank Asawa staggered out of the living room. He needed to be alone to his surprise Kajiwara didn't try to stop him. Okay, this is different then. Shutting his study door behind him, he dropped onto the, his sofa then got out a bottle of pills. Or well, now he's gonna kill himself. He stared at it, thinking back on what the detective had told him. It's you. Detective Kano had a point. From a financial perspective, Sao's discoveries, and indeed Osawa himself, were incredibly valuable. Immersed as he was in his research, he had never imagined he'd become a target. The kidnappers had used that artlessness to catch him completely. Uh, to be alert. Or, uh, alertnessness, isn't it? Not artless. To catch him completely off his guard. He thought back to the emails that A had sent him. But now they're just stringing him along, but before long the guilt bombs might turn into a more direct threat. He would extort his money, steal his research, and finally have him killed. It was so easy to see what their plan was now. The worst of it was, he wasn't their only target. Kidnapping Maria would only be A's first step. Sawa contemplated in horror how his family would all be victimized because of him. There was only one thing he could do. He poured a mound of sleeping pills out into his hands. Then without any hesitation, he gulped down the lot. The effect on his body was slow to start, but he felt a deep and irresistible drowsiness began to creep over him. As his consciousness was starting to fade, he heard the distant sound of the front door chime. Moments later, the study door opened and Kajiwara appeared inside to see Osawa lying on the floor. Mr. Osawa, are you okay? Mr. Osawa? The detective's voice was rapidly fading out. As Sasawa surrendered to the irresistible urge to drift into sleep, his mouth gaped open. A has come for me. Those were his last words. Bad end. The threat of A. When he heard that he was the kidnapper's target, the stricken Os uh, Osawa decided to commit suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills. This is all because of what Kano said to him, a simple error in word choice that Osawa took a completely wrong conclusion. Kano ought to properly inform Osawa just what the kidnappers are after. But when I selected Hitomi, They said it's the virus. It's the virus. Okay. So if I select the virus, are they gonna do the same thing again? Mine went dead. Incorrect. It's not the virus they're after, it's his daughter he told me he was carrying the antivirus. That's what I selected last time and it was wrong apparently. Okay, still a bad end. Did the game just glitch my choice? Do I have to jump? Who you knows when they're, they're really after? Can't give no reply. All right. Then he hung up, all right. So I staggered out of the living room. He needed to be alone. To surprise, Kajiwara didn't try to stop him. What? Shutting the study door behind him, he dropped onto his sofa, then grabbed three times his normal dosage of stomach pills. 
There was no water in the room, so he had to swallow them dry. Detective Connor's words echoed in his mind. It's Hitomi. Okay, that was the first thing I picked, but apparently the game registered it as me selecting the virus. There was only one reason they could be after Hitomi. He broke out in a cold sweat as he began to understand what this kidnapping was really about. It had all started six days earlier. It was April 22nd. Osawa had just returned from the United States the day before. He was in the midst of some routine work at the general research lab when his cell phone rang. The LCD display showed an unlisted caller. With some hesitation, Osawa picked up. Hello? Is this Kenji Osawa? The caller was using a voice modulator, a type of device or software used to make one's voice sound different. Changing a voice to the point of making a voice print or tone analysis impossible presents a major challenge. To be able to do so in real time requires major financial and technological resources. Osawa raised an eyebrow. Yes. Go and analyze it on his blood. Her blood. If you don't, she's going to die. With that, the caller hung up. There was an intensity behind this that made Osawa sure it wasn't just some prank call. He had Hitomi come into the lab ASAP. He told Hitomi he wanted a sample of her blood for an experiment. She agreed, suspecting nothing. He placed some of the blood he had drawn onto a glass slide, then added some fluorescein, a type of fluorescent dye. A yellow-green liquid, a type of fluorescent dye, chiefly used in preparing specimens for viewing under a fluorescent microscope. But it has other uses as well, such as a diagnostic reagent administered in eye exams. This highest volume is used is on St. Patrick's Day, when massive amounts of fluorescent are used to dye the Chicago River green. They dye it green? Why? A type of dye that causes the dyed substance to emit higher wavelength fluorescent light when illuminated with a certain other type of light. Such dyes can reveal fine details when used on specimens viewing through a, a fluorescent microscope. Okay, so here is what happened. He took the blood and... Um, Tanaka had access to it. Placing the slide under a fluorescent, fluorescence microscope, he took a look. He checked the look. It can't be. Asawa could hardly believe his eyes. Wriggling under the microscope was a grim reaper sickle itself. There was no mistaking it. Hitomi was infected with the Uwa virus. Trembling, Osawa hurried to his computer. He opened the Uwa virus folder on his monitor. Within were images showing the stages of the virus's propagation. He double clicked to magnify the first image. Reaper sickles were interlocked with one another. He clicked on the next image. After further propagation, the Uwa virus looked less like a sickle, more a sort of insectoid larva. The next was a final image. Interlocked into a single mass, the Uwa virus vaguely resembled a sinister, many-petaled sunflower. It took a mere 12 hours for the pathogen to develop to this point and begin his hideous destruction, its hideous destruction of the human body. Hitomi's infection sample was still in the state shown in the first image. There was still a chance to save her. Sawa so slumped back in his chair, huddling in on himself. He had no choice, there was only one way to save Hitomi. He would have to administer the nearly com completed antiviral. Using the antiviral without official approval was a grievous violation of company policy. Acting against company rules and regulations, Okoshi Pharmaceutical prohibits leaking work-related information to outsiders. In the case of a major violation, not only can the violator be fired, but the company may also seek indemnities. Still, Osawa didn't have time to get the higher-ups to approve a clinical trial. 
might be punished severely for it, but this was his only option, his daughter's life was at stake. But there was also another, even bigger hurdle in his way. The antiviral drug was stored in the deepest recesses of the biochemical research building. A high-intensity x-ray scanner was set up at the entrance to the storage area. This made it impossible for him to take research materials out. A type of radiation also referred to as Röntgen rays. With a shorter wavelength than ultraviolet light but a longer wavelength than gamma rays, because X-rays can penetrate many objects with little absorption or scattering, they can be used to create images of internal structure. Hospitals, for example, use X-ray technology to examine the insides of a patient's bodies. While security personnel use it to scan luggage at airports and to search for bombs. Well, if you couldn't get the antiviral out of there, he would just have to bring Hitomi in. A course of action quickly took shape in his mind. First, he would need to slip out of the general research building. He would then head to the biochemical research facility and show his ID card to the guard at the front gate. After passing through a lobby under the watchful gaze of several security cameras, he'd reach an elevator at the end of the hall that went directly to the storage section. This elevator required an ID card scan to operate. We It would take about 20 seconds to get down to the first basement level and arrive at the entrance to the storage area. Finding an excuse to get Hitomi that far ought to be doable. The security guard got suspicious, Osawa could say it was for a top secret hematology experiment, and the guard would probably believe him. The problem was what came after. That's the machine we saw earlier. Getting into the storage area itself required fingerprint authentication for both Asawa and Tanaka. This meant that he couldn't possibly get to the antiviral without Tanaka's cooperation. Desperate with uncertainty, Asawa called up Tanaka. He frantically explained the situation. Understood, Tanaka replied. We need to get this drug as soon as possible. If the company finds out about this, You'll be held accountable for a violation of corporate policy along with me. Are you sure you're okay with that? What are you talking about? Tommy's life is more important than company policy. Tanaka spoke without hesitation. That's how I felt an immense surge of gratitude for his assistance. What I have to say, I'm deeply moved by your determination, Tanaka added. Moved? Whatever for? You really are worried about Hitomi. Asawa's gratitude faded. What are you talking about? Of course I am. My apologies. It's just that putting your career on the line for something as personal, so personal as... It's what? It's not like me? No. Well, yes. I'm sorry. Now Tanaka's voice was colored with embarrassment. Just what sort of person do you think I am? Sawa resisted the urge to ask the question out loud. A short time later, Osawa and Tanaka stood before the door to the secure storage area. The security guard had let them in without the slightest suspicion. Osawa pressed his index finger to the fingerprint scanner first. Accepted. He realized he had been holding his breath as his authorization finally went through. Half a moment later, Tanaka touched his own finger to the scanner plate. Ooh, I like it when you use your finger. Use it more, daddy. Accepted. The lock released with an audible clang and the heavy door opened. Osawa hurried to retrieve the antiviral, as he picked up a small vial, he had a sudden realization. They were finally going to use the drug in a human test. 
His fatherly wish to cure Hitomi was overlaid by an intense rush of curiosity. Researchers drive to discover the, his results. Hurry. I need to hurry. I need to administrate the antiviral as soon as possible. Sawa could hardly fend off his excitement. Over the course of the next few hours, following the injection, the war virus would be eradicated from Hitomi's body. There had been some fever and cramping as temporary side effects. The DDS had done a spectacular job of stomping out the virus. Drug delivery system, also known as smart drug delivery, the ability to target a specific region of the body with a specific drug, has momentous implications for the future of medicine. DDS technology is currently being tested extensively around the world. In saving his daughter's life, Osawa had proven the value of his research. If he had been asked which made him happier, he would have been hard-pressed to give an answer. Afterwards, he asked Hitomi where she could have become infected, but she had no idea. He explained the need for secrecy and strictly forbade her telling anyone else what had happened. Now a week had passed since Osawa gave the drug to Hitomi. He had been conducting checks and had discovered that the DDS had not broken down but remained in Hitomi's bloodstream. Extracting the DDS was a simple matter, requiring just a small blood sample from around the nape of the neck. The DDS tends to linger in the nape of the neck because of the lymph nodes located there. These lymph nodes identify viruses that invade the body as foreign substances to be attacked, but they are not always able to overcome particularly powerful pathogens. In such cases, the virus propagates rapidly inside of them. Once the patient has been treated, the antiviral will seek out the virus and accumulate there as well. The DDS itself was simply the delivery system for the antiviral drug. Residual amounts of the antiviral itself stayed behind within the cells. The materials used to create the DDS must, as a matter of course, cause minimal or no harm to the human body. Ideally, rather than accumulate inside the body, DDS substances should be either digested or absorbed or excreted. Because the antiviral must remain in the body for as long as the virus is active, however, a very careful balance must be struck between persistence and dissipation. Using the DDS, it was possible to extract those minuscule amounts from cells in a blood sample. It might take considerable time, but sufficiently detailed analysis could allow for the antiviral drug itself to be reconstructed. So I felt a chill as he contemplated the situation. Okay, so they can analyze it, alright. The kidnappers had known how tough security was at the lab, and Tanaka was with them, obviously, because uh, then they could figure out, hey, we could just get the antiviral formula by uh, getting that and it works with Tanaka. So they had come up with the idea of using a human vessel to get what they needed from within. By infecting Hitomi with the Uro virus, they had ensured that she would received the antiviral, that she would have it in her blood. If Tanaka was working with the kidnappers, that explained why he had been so cooperative about the fingerprint scanner. Damn it. Osawa shouted. He clutched his head in his hands. Tanaka had been his partner and trusted confidant for years. Osawa refused to believe he had been betrayed like this. The front door chime sounded. Mr. Osawa, Kajiwara called out. It appears you have a visitor. Could you handle that? Who could it possibly be now of all times? You deal with it, Osawa was in no state of mind to receive a guest. Alright, with a sigh, Osawa dragged himself to his feet. Let's go with B. Alright. With a sigh, Osawa dragged himself to his feet. He stumbled wearily back to the living room where the investigators were staring at the intercom monitor with concern. The intercom's hidden camera showed a man with an unsettling grin pose intimidatingly outside the front gate. Osawa didn't recognize him. Yes, who is it? He asked through the intercom. It's Minori Kama. Where might I know you from, Mr. Minori Kama? Oh, you know, here and there, 
I mean, there's only one Minorikawa, really. Are you playing games with me? I don't have the time for that. Please, just open up. There's no way I'm letting you in. Osawa said. But the nonsensical badgering continued. Look, just hold your horses. I'm here for an interview. You got that? An interview? That's right. It's a piece for four-star general gossip. The name of the magazine brought up an unpleasant memory. That was a gossip brag that had run the article about his political marriage. Wait, this is for one of those kind of articles? What do you mean? Those kinds of articles? I'm just looking for an interview. The man's tone was both high-handed and belligerent. Like hell you are. I'm not talking to anyone from the gossip. You're not the one I'm here to talk to. I wanted to interview your twin daughters. My daughters? I understand they won a share prize for a beauty contest at Midoriyama Academy. If you wouldn't mind my interviewing them, I... Furious Asawa cut off the intercom. This was no time to be indulging someone else's nonsense. Hey, what gives? The man was shouting so loud his voice carried past the gate and through the front door. I'm begging out here, on my hands and knees. He wasn't actually on his hands and knees, so I could see that clearly through the intercom monitor. If your daughters aren't home, can you at least tell them I want to get in touch with them? Mr. Osawa? Kajiwara said, frowning. This isn't a good time to have someone drawing attention to your home. Alright, I'll get rid of him. Osawa hurried out of the house, confronting Minorikawa through the front gate. Journalists had that tenacious look that immediately marked him as a member of the media. Give me your business card, Osawa said. I'll have him get in touch with you later. He took Minorikawa's card, then went right back inside. That isn't really what happened when we just saw. Back in the study, Osawa tossed Minorikawa's business card into the trash. Unable to think of what else to do, he tried the internet fortune teller again. He got the same, you're a very work-minded person result the second time. You don't get over your indifference to the world. The world might start to harbor quite a grudge. My indifference to the world around me, huh? The truth was that even with his closest companions, even with Tanaka for instance, his relationship had always been strictly a matter of business. He'd never really taken it upon himself to get to know Tanaka as a person. And that was pretty much the case for everyone he knew. He harbored no interest in other people. He had no concern for his fellow man. That had made itself abundantly clear when he received the microscope as a birthday present way back in first grade. Even now he still remembered the shock he had felt when he looked through the death lens for the first time. He had discovered a new, almost infinite world hidden in the midst of one he had always thought was too small. By comparison, the real world seemed bland and ugly. Wherever he looked, wherever he went, he had to content with the, contend with the tedium. Yeah, I ha it hadn't taken long for him to become more charmed by the world under his microscope than the one around him. It was like a calm, quiet little seaside. A beach where he could just sit and stare out the waves. He went to stay immersed in that he wanted to stay immersed in that world forever and ever. Before he knew it, he was an adult, and then a husband, and then a father. The people around him thought him an odd fellow, but he hadn't let that change the way he lived his life. And this now was a result. He hadn't been betrayed by Tanaka. 
He didn't know Tanaka well enough for that. Find a way to connect more deeply with the people around you. Start living a better life before it's too late. Just do that and you're sure to have a wonderful future ahead. Sawa picked up his cell phone and dialed Tanaka's number. I had tried calling him repeatedly and hadn't gotten through. It was doubtful that he would pick up. Still, Osawa had to try. The phone rang several times. He listened grimly to the empty mechanical sound, preparing himself for disappointment. What is it? Tanaka's voice sounded coldly in Osawa's ear. The tension was electric. To be continued, right? Keep out. Wait a little bit, five more minutes. Man's voice came through the intercom, all right. Yes, who is it? Sounded rather guarded. Nurikawa, where might I know you from? Yeah. You're in there, I mean, there's only one Nurikawa, really, all right. We read this on the other side. This discussion was getting them nowhere, and Nurikawa decided he'd have to take the direct approach. We're here for an interview, you got that. It taken the bait, most folks could hardly resist the word interview. Peace for star gossip. One of those kinds of articles. The man sounded angry now. Just looking for an interview, or hell you are, right, we read this. No parent would deny their children the chance for word or their achievements to spread. Yeah, he has no idea what's happening. The intercom cut out before Minorikawa could finish. What gives? Begging out here on hands and knees. He wasn't actually on his hands and knees, but whoever was on the other end couldn't see that they could. There's a camera, clearly. <laughs> he wasn't even using the intercom now. He was just shouting over the gate. The man stepped out of the front door. Your business card, alright. The man had a somewhat stricken look on his face. This had to be Kenji Osawa then. Wait, hold on. Osawa. Now Minorikawa recognized him. This was Kenji Osawa, the preeminent virologist who worked for Okoshi Pharmaceutical. Four star journal gossip had run a scandalous article on him in the past. Minorikawa remembered reading it, held out his business card, and Osawa snatched it from him. The virologist started to head back into his house. Please see that they get back to me, Mr. Osawa, Minorikawa shouted after him, and then he noticed something odd. It was the middle of the afternoon, but every window in the house had its curtains down. That, combined with Osawa's demeanor, set off alarm bells in Minorikawa's head. He knew he was on to something, but he couldn't linger at the Osawa's residence any longer than he already had. He needed to get to that theater ASAP. He hurried back to the taxi and told Kimizuka to go. We gotta keep out here earlier. A few minutes later, right? Scheduled sharply. From Shoto took no time at all. Here we go, sir. Still, Minorikawa was at least five minutes behind schedule. Would he still be able to get the interview with oh, or I? We gotta keep out again. Who do we change? Hmm. 
Unless, how about we... Uh... What if I let Kazuwara open the door instead? You deal with it. Sao was in no state of mind to receive a guest. I can't do that, sir, Kazuwara said firmly. We can't let the kidnappers learn that there are detectives here. Then have I take care of it. Osawa told him. Kajiwara headed off. Right now Osawa just wanted some time to think by himself. Was Tanaka really one of the kidnappers? If he was after the antiviral, he'd had plenty of opportunity to get his hands on it when they gave it to Hitomi, hadn't he? Was that really what these people wanted, after all? The answers seemed to evade him at every turn. Able to think of what else to do, he tried the internet fortune teller again. Okay, that's saved. Well, hold on. Do we get... Um... Is there any difference? Okay, there is no difference. We're gonna get another keep out here. What if I uh, swap now? Yeah, it's a keep out. In Rikawa. Woman's voice came through the intercom. Who is it? It's been Rikawa. Who do I know you from? You know here and there. I mean, there's only one in Rikawa, really. Please be on your way. You're not going anywhere until I get an interview. Interview? Who are you with? The woman's tone had changed now. Maybe Nurikawa could simply talk his way through this. Peaceful for star general gossip. Ah, perfect. I've been wanting to talk to them. Was this one of the Miss Midoriyama winners? Or perhaps it was a girl's mother, eager to boast about her daughter's achievement? I assume you're familiar with defamation of character. The woman said. Hmm? What are you talking about? After 30 of the people come to Japan, it finds up its in-e-deck and its personal condition was a site of standing. It's a very serious crime. I know what it is, Minurikawa said. What's your point? He had a bad feeling about this. Why discuss libel laws right before an interview? Well, not that you get away with telling me you've forgotten. I won't believe you remember once I bring up charges. Her tone was calm and level, but laced with malice. You're talking nonsense, lady. Are you the mother? I got business with your daughters. I wanted them on the line. Nonsense. The woman's wrath radiated from the intercom. It's your four-star job gossip is specializes in nonsense. Her voice was so loud it was cracking. Detective, arrest this man. He's a criminal. Mm -hmm. Detective, huh? You don't really think I'd fall for that, do you, lady? Just who do you think I am? I'm Minoru Minurikawa. He crossed his arms and struck a defiant pose. Then the front door opened up and several men came tr trotting out. Sir, one of the men said, I'd like to ask you a few questions. The word sir, the man flashed his badge and Minurikawa turned to run on reflex. He hadn't thought she would actually send detectives after him. Just what the hell had Heaven Publishing done to her? Never mind, he needed to get out of here. He couldn't afford to get arrested right now. Bad end. Out with it. You kidnapped that girl. You abducted that girl, didn't you? 
Detective, you keep asking me the same question over and over. Now keep on asking until you tell me the truth. Look, ask all you want, but I can't tell you what I don't know. Then let's go back to the beginning, shall we? Oh, cut the crap. I don't have time for your games. As a matter of fact, you have plenty of time, I can assure you of that. The stubborn detective flashed him a grin. You can keep doing this for days, if that's what it takes to get you to confess. And so their interrogation went on for hours. In the end, once his innocence had been established, Minrakawa was finally released. He wrote a scathing indictment on his experience. The report shook up the system in a major way. But that's another story for another day. Bad end. Wrongly accused. When Rikawa was arrested for a crime he had nothing to do with, that woman he talked to must really, really hate for star general gossip. Clearly he had no hope of getting anywhere with her, but maybe there's someone more understanding who might answer the intercom instead. What if I um, choose not to stick around? Would she pick up then? Come back later. Started to head back towards the taxi and then she picks up. Okay, so yeah. We can't choose that. Sawa needs to go himself. swap here yeah that's the even though it happens afterwards and Rikawa got his wallet out of his jacket to be the driver no Kimizuka said, waving a hand. Don't worry about the fare. Huh? Why not? Still plenty left over from what you paid me earlier, sir. That's what I meant by special fare. That's right, he paid Kimizuka a whole 10,000 yen for taking him to Endo Electronics earlier. Well, I mean... I'm not the sort of person to keep the change, as it were, Kimizuka said. Murakawa felt a surge of pride at those words. Yeah, this is definitely not the United States. Whether well, they take that and they still complain that you're cheap. You're my kind of guy, Mr. Kimizuka. A man on the job can always count on Hachiro Kimizuka's taxi. Driver grinned. Now go on. Go. Thank you. I have a feeling we'll meet again. As Minurikawa entered the theater lobby, he saw a bunch of flower bouquets. Uh, patron's gifts of appreciation. Among the names of the senders were celebrities he rec recognized. The largest of the bouquets was sent by Koichi Nakamura of the secret society Chunsoft. The next largest came from Marutaro Ishihara from the government organization Joy Art. Following that were those from actress Barako Rose, popular scenario writer Ebisu Ipomatsu, uh, uh, Tohoku Busters Bus Tours Co. Limited. Bus guide Kimiku Amo, professional baseball player Masa Nariko, ventriloquist Shinshin, ukulele player Hawaii Matsuda, online TV critic, critic Genzu Akitsu, and so on. Evidently, he, the Wandering Angels were a pretty popular acting troupe. 
Episode 4, novice actor Takuya Amo, despite his nervousness, gave a credible, creditable performance as Shido as the production got underway. As the show continued, his inexperience became apparent. He went on stage for the big wire reaction scene, having forgotten to attach himself to the rigging. Tozuka was quick to react, rushing on stage in the improvised role of assassin with an Edo accent number one, and fixing a robe to Amo's back during the confusion. <clears throat> People were setting out pamphlets and flyers out at a nearby table. There was a palpable tension in the air. The crew seemed skittish as they went about their work. It's late, someone shouted all of a sudden. There was a man over in one corner of the lobby, railing angrily to nobody in particular. Why the hell hasn't that journalist shown up yet for the interview? Looked like he had been waiting on Minrakawa then. What's the deal pulling this while we're this busy? Guess that's Shinosuke or Rai. I've been busy myself, Minorikawa said, keeping his composure. Trust me, I know how it goes. Oh, who the hell are you? I'm the guy you've been waiting for. Mr. Or, or I. Or I, really. The man glared at him. It's or I, he said. Anyway, I'm Minorikawa. Sorry to keep you waiting. There really a short wait is a small price to pay for the chance to be interviewed by me. Well, I hope you're, you appreciate how valuable my time is. Now that you're talking it, take it. That or I. Oh, wow, someone sure has a high opinion of himself, Minrakawa replied. He does not, he's not self aware at all, is he? He marched up to our eye. You are right, I do. I'm Shinosuke Owari. The theater man got right up in Minrakawa's face. Like anyone even cares. A jolt of tension sparked between the two men. Around this time, there was a similar jolt of tension between two other people, Kenji Osawa and Mamoru Tanaka. Okay. Unlock the keep out. Okay. Tension was electric, as how I felt a surge of outrage, he wanted to scream. He took a deep breath and managed to maintain control. Tanaka, where are you? Is Marie alright? Tanaka did not reply. The police told me they said you were connected to the kidnapping. A soft chuckle came from the other end of the line. They sure do know how to do their jobs. Tanaka's tone was unapologetic. He sounded nothing like the man Osawa thought he knew so well. Why would you do this? Money? Are you having money troubles? <laughs> money. <laughs> Tanaka replied. I suppose that's part of it. Honestly, I doubt you would understand. Do you have any idea what it's been like for me doing our research together? You're always the one who takes center stage. The fruits of our success are all yours, even though you couldn't have done any of it without me. The more he said, the more vitriol seethed into his words. That's how his hand trembled as he clutched the phone. Taker can never understand how it feels to be taken from. You've hoarded so many things yourself, so I'm taking some of them back. And with that, he hung up. Hey, Tanaka. You can already hear the beep. 
So I dialed the number again, but Tanaka didn't pick up. Usawa racked his brain, thinking back on how Tanaka had been acting earlier that day. Had there been anything unusual, any clue at all, no matter how small? He could find some hint, maybe he would be able to find Maria and Hitoi. That was it. I had been suspicious of Tanaka all along. So much so that she had planted a bug on him hidden in a tie clip. Her suspicions must have been pretty strong. Wait. Sao recalled what Kajiwara had said. But still, if she is that worried, giving a neck necktie as a, a clip as a gift is a bit. The words had struck Osawa as odd when he first heard them. I had never given him a tie clip. His heart gave a heavy throb in his chest. It couldn't be. No. It was impossible. That article from Four Star General Gossip crept back into his mind. The article had talked about a man I had dated before she married Osawa. The man's identity was never revealed. Could it have been Tanaka? Oh my god, that's shocking, I never expected it. You've ordered so many things to yourself, so I'm taking some of them back. Tanaka's cold words took on a new depth of meaning. Osawa felt the foundations of his life begin to crumble. Were Tanaka and I accomplices in all this? No. Wait. Just calm down. He couldn't let himself jump to conclusions. He needed to be more level-headed. Everything depended on it. If the two really were accomplices, why would I have planted a bug on Tanaka? What purpose would that serve? What could it mean? It was no use. This how I couldn't think of how that made sense. First things first. He needed to establish what the relationship between I and Tanaka really was. Once he figured that out, he'd be able to get a better handle on the situation. Obviously, he couldn't just go and ask I directly. If she really were involved in all this, she certainly wouldn't tell him the truth. Sawa thought back to the business card he had tossed into the trash. He didn't relish the thought of getting help from that scavenging hyena, but now was no time to be picky. If he wasn't able to leave the house, he needed someone else to do some investigation for him. Investigating for him. The freelance writer Minoru Minurakawa. He was Osawa's only hope. To be continued. So slowly the characters are coming together. I mean, meeting. I don't mean ejaculating together. Just to be sure there's no misunderstanding. Um, begging your pardon, a woman interrupted, but Mr. Alright does have a schedule to keep. And who are you, miss? Sukazawa, I'm the producer. Well, listen, Sue, I'm in the middle of an interview here. Please don't interrupt. What? That's how you conduct an interview? That's right. This is our role. Look. Whatever. Or I growled. Let's just do this already. Fine by me. The two men sat down on op at opposite sides of a table in the lobby. She looks like a referee and they're about to have a match. But Sukazawa spoke up again. Mr. Orai, don't forget the meeting you had after this. Yeah, I know that, would you? Rikawa let out a derisive snort. <laughs> it's like you're holding court, he said. Do people actually hang around you with that kind of attitude? You have no right to judge any acting tool. Rikawa straightened up in his chair, a mocking smile on his lips. Oh, so it's you, acting troop, huh? He said. 
why not just play all the roles yourself? Heck, you could even be your own audience. Oi, how dare you! Urai rose to his feet and made to leave, but Sukazawa herded him back down in his chair. Urikawa continued as if he hadn't heard. Just what is it that you do anyway? he asked. Urai raised an incredulous eyebrow. You don't know. No, why should I? You came to an interview without knowing anything about who you were interviewing. Yep. Good sit. Get out. Where I rode and pointed angrily toward the exit. How dare an unmannered club like you come in here and waste my time. Hey, who's being unmannered now? I came all the way out here to hear your story, didn't I? Why don't you get out? And Rikawa pointed at the exit as well. Why the hell should I have to leave? Or I demanded. This is my house. I thought this big mama's house. Theater jargon for the theater itself, especially the main auditorium. Look, just get out. This time both yelled and pointed toward the exit in unison. Sukazawa so quickly interposed herself between them, forcing a smile. Gentlemen, please calm down, she said. Then she turned to Minorikawa. You should be aware that Mr. Oarai used to be a broadcast writer. Someone who writes for television or radio programs, a great show depends not only on the actor's performance, but on the skills of the broadcast writer. He's responsible for a lot of big hits. You don't need to mention that, Oarai grumbled. Nonetheless, Sukazawa rattled off the names of several shows. Murakawa did indeed recognize many of them. Mm-hmm, he murmured. So how come you're running a failing theater now? Failing? Murai went red in the face. I'm not wrong, am I? You are absolutely the worst person I have ever met. What would a rank amateur like yourself do about theater? Murai's face was dark with rage. When Rikawa did him back down. Listen, this has nothing to do with how well your theater is or isn't doing, he snapped. The television world wouldn't accept you. So in order to retain your pride as an entertainer, you started doing theater. Isn't that so? Don't act like you know anything. I've staked my entire life on this theater. It seemed as if Orai might throw a punch at any moment. Sure, a city theater might seem small time compared to TV, but you got a lot more of a response from it. Response? Oh, uh -huh. now that sounds interesting. Darn right, Ori exclaimed. You can see it from up on stage. Your audience, you can see their faces. It was a passion in Ori's voice now. You can really feel it when the audience is enjoying themselves. You can feel that energy. You can't get that from doing television. Thinking back on it now, my time spent working on TV. Let's see what's a good analogy. It's like being handed a towel that's already damp. No, that's not right. Okay, so a better analogy would be... And without further preamble, Orai began talking about his tribulations back in his broadcast writer days. Nurikawa smiled inwardly. The interview ended promptly after 15 minutes, the time that had been promised. Both men emerged from it as if from a daze. Nurikawa found himself st star staring Orai in the face, shaking him by the hand. So, what kind of story did I just get? He asked, speaking half to himself. Oh. So, what kind of story did I just get? He asked, speaking half to himself. You heard about one man in his life, and I have to admit it was a good interview. Thanks, you have my gratitude. With a satisfied smile, Minorikawa closed his notebook. Right, glad to hear that then. Or I inclined his head looking a bit bewildered. Oh 
um, lost it because I was interrupted. Well, um, Mr. Minorikama, wasn't this interview for a piece about the performance? Uh huh? Minorikama blinked. This time you were only asking about Mr. Onai and not about the performance itself, Tsukuzawa said. Oh, I see what you mean. Actually, I came here for a piece I'm going to be writing called Where Are They Now? Watched a Broadcast Writer Showcase. Oi, but you, I, washed up. Where I was red in the face all over again. You bastard, how dare you. I'll forget everything I just told you. I do not give you my permission to use it in your magazine. You're too late. What? I've already heard your whole story. You should be grateful that I'll be writing a piece on it. You bastard. With a wild look in his eyes, Orai snatched up a hammer at the stage crew had left nearby. Wait, go ahead, hit me. Go ahead, hit me. Ouch. Ouch. We haven't even hit you yet. Orai waved the hammer menacingly. But the attack came to a sudden halt as a ringtone startled him out of his fury. Hold on a moment, Minorikawa said brightly. I have to take this. He whipped out his cell phone. Hello, Minorikawa speaking. This is Osawa. Wow, he could call back a lot sooner than Minorikawa had expected. Have your daughters come home then? No. Actually, there is a favor I would like to ask you. A favor? Murakawa thought back to his visit to the Osawa residence. The drawn curtains, the stricken look on Osawa's face, Murakawa's instincts had sensed something significant going on. Apparently getting the full story wasn't going to come without some cost. A favor, huh? Is it something urgent? I'll pay whatever I have to. I just need you to look into something as quickly as possible. His voice had the telltale desperation of a man who had been backed into a corner. Alright, Minrikawa said. I can help you out for a little while. Sawa hurriedly explained what he was after. The request was a strange one. He wanted Minrikawa to look into a scandalous article that four-star general gossip had run about him in the past. What makes this so important? I, uh, uh, do I have to say? I mean, you're asking me to look into something without explaining anything. He eyed or I, lurking nearby with obvious irritation. And Rikawa would need to calm down the erstwhile broadcast writer, or else his interview really would be for naught. He decided to bluff both men at the same time. Let me just say one thing, he said into the phone. He made sure he spoke loud and clear so that or I would overhear. I want to tell the world the story. No, I need to tell it. If I don't feel that way about something, no amount of money in the world will get me to write an article on it. That's my pride as a writer at work. And Rikawa could see Orai's aura of rage fading as he listened. The theater man looked surprised. Ew. Meanwhile, Osawa had decided to open up a bit. Osawa doesn't want the world to know, does he? <laughs> Alright, I can't share all the details, but... Okay, he's in a talkative mode now. Mood now. Good job, Minrikawa. See, this is going fine. The power balance of the entire world might be at stake here. Sawa continued. And I mean that quite literally. I can tell you more after you're done investigating. Wait, was he serious? How could the world's balance of power hinge on looking into some alleged marital affair? It was so absurd that Minrikawa had to fight the urge to burst out laughing. A person would need to be out of his mind to believe a story like that. Minrikawa wasn't the average person. And sometimes, the truth was so ridiculous, it really was stranger than fiction. Osawa wasn't lying, and Rikawa's instincts told him that much. 
All right, he said. I'll check the editing department's notes from back then. Hirokawa felt his excitement building. Things were really getting interesting. For the moment, he nearly forgot Toyama and his troubles. When he ended the call, Uarai approached him and extended his hand again. Listen, your methods might be a little extreme, but I can tell you take pride in your work. Of course I do. I'm sorry for getting so worked up. I bet you'd write a fine article about me. So please, Mr. Minorakawa, let the world know about me and my half-lived life. Minorakawa took the offered hand and shook it. Leave it to me. Once I'm done with it, you won't just be some washed up nobody anymore. Mr. Orai. It's Orai. And Rikawa grinned. And this is the end of the hour. When Rikawa rushed out of the theater, he'd completed all the interviews that he could get done before 4 o'clock. Now he had an hour left to write it all up to convince the folks from the loan company that the gossip could stay afloat. Brrr. He let out a roar, sucking himself up for the final push. To be continued. We finish this chapter, I think. This person also killed my friend. Everyone in Shibuya is going to die. Is that? this an accident or an attack? Is after Hitomi Osawa. How many hours ago was she infected? Three o'clock. We started at ten. Looks like we're still controlling the same five characters. Great. Let's take a break, shall we? It's been two hours. I mean, 20 minutes of it was uh, me fixing audio. And yeah, the whole thing started at 10 o'clock. So we've been... I've only done five hours. Uh, I'm guessing it's going to end at night, so we st maybe we we're only halfway done with the game. <laughs> at this rate, I don't know if I'm even going to finish it before Zelda. But yeah, let's take a break, shall we? I'm going to leave you with some Obridden music, and I'm going to be back in a few minutes. So stick around. And I'm back. Did you miss me? Of course you did. Okay. So now we have a choice to make on who to start our three o'clock slot with. So we have Minorikawa Osawa, Maria Achi, Kano. That's uh. Well, Minorikawa it is. Forgot to mention. Yep, he forgot to mention the ice dry ice machine. I remembered it. Hmm, wait a second, I feel like there's something I'm forgetting. <sighs> when Rikawa stopped and let out a cry of frustration, Yasuke Endo had asked him for a favor after the interview was done. He promised to tell the wandering angels that the dry ice machine they purchased was defective. 
Episode 5. At last, the climax of the play drew near. There was a whole string of troubles, but the cast soldiered on, and it looked like things were going to end alright. Then, backstage, Bondo noticed that the dry ice machine was acting strangely, even after it had been turned off. The machine continued to churn out more dry eyes. The producer, Tsukazawa, demanded that the defective device be returned immediately, and so Tozuka, Bondo, and Amo loaded it into their vehicle and left the theater. Continued in episode 6. Well, damn. That had completely slipped his mind. If he recalled correctly, the issue was that once the machine started making dry eyes, it wouldn't stop. Just unplug it. He ran back to the theater now, he'd lose about 10 minutes. When Rikawa checked his wristwatch, the lone people would be coming by in the editing office before too long. He needed to prove to them that the next month's issue of 4 Star General Gossip was well underway, or else they would refuse to wait any longer for repayment. And to do that, he needed to fill a minimum of 6, or six of the 12 remaining blank pages. He couldn't afford to waste even a single second. This was an awkward position to be in. He needed to keep his promise to Endo, but he also needed to spend his time wisely. Uh, I guess I don't have a choice. There was nothing he could do about having forgotten, he hurried on to the cafe. He agreed to take on a responsibility, he had it back for the theater. Uh, let's uh, add it to the, to the theater. He agreed to take on responsibility, he added back to the theater. When he got there, he flagged down the first guy he saw was his other about the dry ice machine. Hey, make sure you remember what I'm about to tell you, okay? The dry ice machine is broken. The man stared back at him blankly, but Mirakawa just forged ahead. Got it? The dry ice machine is broken. It needs to go back to the electronics store. Make sure you let the folks make sure you let the folks in charge here know. His obligation met, he hurried back to the cafe to get back to work on his copy. Along the way he caught sight of a young couple running. They seemed like an odd pair, the girl looked prim and proper while the boy struck him as a bit thuggish. In fact, the boy's clothing was very much in the style worn by Shibuya street gangs. Maybe he'd know something about SOS. Hurrying across the path, Minurikawa called out to the pair. Hey, mind if I ask you something? Have you heard of SOS? The pair stopped, eyeing him warily. The young man spoke. Yeah, oh. Yeah, why do you ask? Do you happen to be a member yourself? No, not anymore. Well, if the kid had once been part of the group, he ought to be able to provide some background, anyhow. Nurikawa took a step closer to the couple, formulating his next question. But they didn't stick around to hear it. Let's go, the young man said, and a moment later he and the girl were running away. Oh, hey. But the pair paid him no heed. In a moment, they had vanished down an alley. The story about SOS would have to wait until later then. Minurikawa hurried into the cafe. Wasting no time, he sat right down and plugged his laptop into the nearest power outlet. He plunked himself down on the floor and hit the computer's power switch. The waitress gave him a disapproving look. Sir, I'm afraid you can't sit there. Well, it looks like your tables are full. I'll make do here. Um, well, being able to make do isn't really the issue. I'll have a coffee, please. Ah. Just do whatever you want. The waitress turned away and stared vacantly up at the ceiling. Okay, I know which voice to use, I just wasn't sure. You know, a person can only get away with being obnoxious for so long. Sooner or later, someone's likely to call the police. Minurikawa looked up from his work, startled to see the burning hammer salesman standing over him. What's stopping you from getting a phone? What phone are you looking into? I mean, I, I need to probably look at a phone. My phone is uh, several years old, but it's running okay for the most part, so I haven't been replacing it. But 
this channel is like an addiction. You disappear for months, but then realize, hey, I'm back. I need to be here every day. Laziness, I can empathize with that. I can relate. I'm a lazy guy. A lazy guy with a very sore throat, who thankfully got a bottle of water filled up during the break. And now just remember to take a sip. I have no idea how I'm going to finish this game with this throat, but I'm going to do it. Are you not working today? You, you Mr. Yanagishita. Thank you so much for stopping by earlier. Are you going to write the article here? Yanagishita eyed me Rikawa's computer. Ooh. That's the latest model, isn't it? I would really give him a goofy voice if I felt like putting more effort. I think Goofy's voice suits him. Look, I got no time to talk right now. Rikawa opened the file with his half-written copy. Ooh, what's this? Chaos Bogus Weight Loss Ring Sales Demo. Nagishita read the copy aloud. The organizer Junichi Yanagishita didn't merely have a whiff of deceit about him. His breath also stunk. Sounds good, Minorikawa asked. Really? You're asking him if you're, if you're saying his breath stinks sounds good? I wanted to make sure I gave an accurate impression. Ooh, I love what you've done with it. This is a great copy. Fantastic. And I guess it's a turn to look at him with a man manic grin. Yeah, isn't it? In a flash, Yanagishita's face went from grinning to livid. I never do vocal exercises. I don't really know vocal exercises. I know humming is a good uh, one to do to soothe your throat. But um, I. A few years back, I considered doing uh, classes for voice training, just to help with streaming and stand-up comedy, but I never did. And I feel like uh, over time, I kind of forget some voices and I come up with new ones. So if you watch my older streams, the voices I do are very different as well. Oh no, are we dropping frames again? Maybe I'll jiggle the router a little bit. Okay, jiggling it a bit worked. That also makes a world of difference. Like hell it is. You think I'm gonna just let you write something like that? Snatching up the computer, Yanagishita bolted out the cafe. Hey, get back here. And Rikawa leapt to his feet and rushed off in pursuit. As he sprinted madly along, Yanagishita turned down a narrow alley. And Rikawa stayed close behind him, desperate not to lose sight of him. His quarry began to weave his way through the back alleys of Shibuya. This guy really clearly knew his way around town. By Miyashita Park, they zipped up onto a pedestrian bridge. Just where the heck was this idiot going? Is he going to throw the laptop? Halfway across the overpass, Yanagishita suddenly stopped. Confused, Minorikawa stopped as well. Give them back, he called. The next moment, Yanagishita flashed a mocking grin and dangled the laptop over the railing. Or oh, I sounded more lively in what way? As in, uh, more excited in general, or a voice was more upbeat or louder, or what was it? I know I, apparently I sounded very much, much younger, but uh, I don't know. My voice changes randomly over time. 
I've had people uh, question if it was really me when I speak sometimes on Discord with other people. The next moment, Yanagishita flashed a mocking grin and dangled the laptop over the railing. Uh-oh. Minorikawa lunged toward him, but it was already too late. The laptop left Yanagishita's hand and went spinning down through the air. Then, as the two men struggled, Yanagishita himself toppled over the railing. Without hesitating, Minorikawa j jumped down as well. Whoa! Oh, yeah. Gosh! <laughs> Rikawa landed hard. As he struggled to regain his breath, he uh, looked around and saw Yanagishita beside him. Incredibly, the laptop was safe in the charlatan's grasp. Apparently, he somehow managed to catch it in midair. Before Minurikawa could be too relieved, however, Yanagishita got to his feet and took off running again. When does he get the energy? Get back here, you little weasel. I don't think so. This Yanagishitaka was infuriating. That, and he was really fast. Murakawa considered himself a decent runner, but he couldn't manage to gain on Yanagishita. Of course, the guy's been running from debt collectors for a while now. If running away was a competitive sport, this guy would be a world-class superstar. I love how that leaf in his hair is definitely not a real leaf. It's edited. What are you saying? I don't sound young anymore, Fred. I am disappointed. I feel so offended. Yeah, I got older, I think. I'm not sure, maybe I got younger and then older, or maybe I older and then stayed that way. One of the two. As he ran along, a peculiar thought occurred to him. Hold on a minute. If he hates him but I copy that much, shouldn't he have wanted my computer to break? Why did he go out of his way to catch it like that? It made no sense at all, but it's Yanagishita, of course it wouldn't make sense. Hey, Minurikawa shouted between gossiping breaths. What are, what are you planning to do with my laptop? Yanagishita glanced back at him. Gonna sell it. Sorry about this. What? Minurikawa was taken aback. Consider it compensation for defamation of character. In the civil sense, the act of unlawfully damaging another person's character or reputation in the public eye, like saying they sound older. In the criminal sense, the act of disseminating damaging facts about an individual to an unspecified large number of people. Come on, get real. It can't be defamation if the article hasn't run yet. Then consider it an advance on the compensation. This was a nonsensical. Uh, this was so nonsensical it made Mirakawa's head hurt. But now at least he knew why Anagishita had dived after the computer. The thief continued to weave his way through the side streets. His speed didn't diminish in the slightest. Damn nah, it! This guy has too much experience running away. Murakawa's stamina began to fade, and finally he lost sight of the quarry. But that didn't mean he was ready to give up the search. There were articles on that computer that were right on the verge of a completion. Whatever it took, he had to get it back. Yanagishida had said he was going to sell it. Where could he be headed then? Probably he was headed to the sales demo venue. Probably he was headed to the knickknack shop. Probably he was headed to Endo Electronics. He's definitely not going to the sales demo venue. Knickknack shop? Does he know about the knickknack shop? Endo electronics? Possibly not? Hmm. Let's pick the wrong choice. Sales demo. Maybe he was planning to find some more customers and auction the laptop off to them. 
Nope. Damn. The guy had led him on a wild goose chase. Norikawa ran along center guy toward the Nokani building, where the sales demo had been held. Before he got there, however, a glance to one side stopped him in his tracks. Uh huh, he chirped. He had spotted the knickknack shop where he had run into Miku about two hours earlier. Yeah, that's the obvious one. Out in front of it was a poster that read, We buy computers at top prices. Now he was certain. Yanagishita must be in there. There you are, Yanagishita. Nurikawa burst into the shop on center guy, an accusing finger pointing squarely at the thief. Listen. There's no way I'm buying a computer that doesn't have a power cable. Details, details. All you sell here is junk, anyway. Yanagishita and the shopkeeper had gotten into an argument. Nurikawa recognized the shopkeeper. It was the guy he had run into on the roadside earlier. That computer belongs to me, Minurikawa shouted as he marched up to them. Give it back. Yanagishita clutched the laptop to his chest. No, -uh. I need the money. Knock it off, you're acting like a child. Minurikawa tried to slap him out of his tantrum, but Yanagishita ducked to avoid the blow. And then, bizarrely, Yanagishita froze. A fierce gleam came to his eyes. <laughs> he broke into an incomprehensible stammer. That's it. Yanagishita snatched up a flyer that his gaze had fixed on. Iron stomach. Huh? This right here is my little bluebird of happiness, he cried. You know what? You can have this. Yanagishita shoved the laptop into Minurikawa's arms. <laughs> and welcome to it, you idiot. I don't need no worthless computer. You're the idiot, Buster. Minurikawa smacked Yanagishita right across the face. That's more like the head. Not the face. Ouch. Hitting him felt good. He decided to do it again. Nurikawa shoved Yanagishita toward the shopkeeper. Hand this guy over to the police, he said. Eh, no, not the police. Oh. No, not the police, Yanagishita pleaded. Can it, you thief? You tried to rip me off, and you have no idea how much is riding on my work. You deserve 10,000 deaths. Honestly, you'd think that dying once would be sufficient. You would think. But depends, I mean, some people deserve more than that. 10,000? Isn't that taking things just a little too far? I'm sorry already, I give up. Finally, the guy was ready to surrender. Nurikawa let his guard down for just a moment, and he ran. Like hell I am. Switching gears in an instant, Yanagishita took off running at full speed. This again. Get back here, you bastard. Norikawa was already in pursuit. Why? Why would you chase after him at this point? Just go and write up the th stuff you need to write up. He stuck with Yanagishita as far as Koendori before losing track of him. The guy sure knew how to make a getaway. Breathing hard, Minurikawa stopped and took a look around the area. As he did, he heard a cell phone ringtone from somewhere nearby. It was a new single from the pop singer Aya Kamiki. I hope it's... Rumi's father. Could that be Yanagishita's phone? Huh. Could it be... Somehow he struck Minurikawa... Somehow he struck Minurikawa as the type of guy who'd have a ringtone like that. It seemed worth looking into anyhow. He had nothing else to go on. Minurikawa shifted his gaze around, trying to locate the source of the sound. And then what? What happened there? Suddenly a massive fiery blast knocked him from his feet. By the time he realized it was an explosion, his senses were already shattered. The explosion in the opening scene of the game. What just happened? He couldn't see. He couldn't hear. He couldn't move his body. 
Where am I? For a while, all he could feel was an intense pain. Yeah, we heard that ringtone in the very beginning of the game. But soon, even that faded away. And then, there was only darkness. Darkness. Death by explosion. Cool. An unexpected explosion. Chasing Yanagishita led Minorikawa to the wrong place at exactly the wrong time. This wouldn't have happened if Yanagishita hadn't run when he did. If the MMA fighter Miku Morita comes into the knickknack shop, she will interrupt their argument and things might turn out differently. And how would I do that? Probably somebody else's story. Okay, who are we picking now? Okay, Fred. Who am I picking? Kano, Achi, Maria, Asawa. You pick this one. Let me show you their faces. Kano, Achi, Maria, Asawa. Kano, all right. Last thing we had was uh, Sasama got stabbed, called it, and um, it's his wife's birthday, so he was obviously getting flags planted in him before the knife. But we'll see if he dies. I don't think he's gonna die. He's not uh, too critical to die. They didn't develop him all that much for him to die. Kano practically died from the car when it arrived on the scene in uh, Mariyamacho. The place was teeming with officers and onlookers alike. Out of the way, please, move aside. Kano forced his way through the throng. Sasayama was lying in a massive pool of blood. Sasayama! He's gonna give him the present for his wife's uh, birthday. Don't shake him, the knife is still there. Kano rushed to his partner's side. The knife was still embedded deep in Sasayama's belly. His handle shuddered each time he drew a labored breath. I remember hearing a story about a medic who... Uh, they got to the scene and a guy was stabbed. The knife was still there and the new medic decided the best thing to do would be to pull the knife out. But when they panicked and he, after he did it, like no you shouldn't have done that he tried to stick it back in apparently the person died and uh, that medic was uh, in trouble yes I messed up Sasama could only manage a raspy murmur please don't try to talk I hate your voice I don't want to hear it anymore, Kano urged. Looks like I won't be celebrating the missus' birthday. Sasama drew a small package from his pocket. Of course he has a small package, he's a cop. It had been neatly wrapped and fitted with pretty little ribbon. Here. Give this to me, Chan. For me. Kano shook his head. No way. You can give it to her yourself. Classic. What did I tell you about the present? You've never met me, Chan, huh? She's real pretty. Probably surprised how pretty she. I know. You've told me all about her, and I'm tired of it, so just die already so I don't have to hear about it anymore. Kano, please give this to my wife, for me. 
mustering up the last of his strength, Sasayama pressed the gift into Kana's hand. Sasayama. Sasayama's hand dropped back into the puddle of blood. Paramedic team finally arrived at the scene. Took them that long, huh? As Sasayama was loaded into the ambulance, Kano felt a surge of rage rolling inside him. Clenching his fist so hard his nails dug into his palm, he marched over to the captive Al Karawan. You son of a bitch. He wound up for a punch to Al Karawan's face, only to have his arm caught forcibly by the elbow. Stanley. Yeah, hairy hand, Stanley. It's like, hey, uh, how would you tell them apart? One guy is very hairy, and he is white. Oh, okay. So he's not one of the criminals who are always foreigners. No, he's not. Okay, thank you. Spinning his head around, he found Stanley standing there. Let go, st me, Stanley. But the American had a grip of steel, and Kano's arm wouldn't budge. They allow you to assault suspects here in Japan, do they? Dude, you're American. You're the last type of cop who should be allowed to speak. Literally. <laughs> the last person. If they lined up all the cops in the world, the American ones would be at the very back. Assaulting, not even suspects, just assaulting random people. Kano bit his lip and then lowered his shaking fist. No, of course not, he growled. But I guess if uh, Kano hit Al Karawan, since this is Japan, it would be all cops or baka. Let me take a sip of water. Al Karawan let out a nasal chuckle as he watched the pair. With a cold glare, Stanley strolled over to him. I like it when you smile, keep smiling, it looks really good on you. I hope you keep doing it. He leaned in close to whisper something and all at once the blood drained from Al Karawan's face. Hail Hydra. Visibly shaken, Al Karawan said something back to Stanley. Stanley gave a slight nod, then left the captive with a police escort. Connor went over to him. Hey, what was that all about? You never whisper sweet nothings in my ear. You should do that sometime. Apparently, Al Karawan gave Hitomi some instructions. Told her to get into a blue minivan that was parked along Dogenzaka. So Stanley's hunch had been correct. But why had El Karawan confessed so quickly? How do you get him to talk? You don't need to know. Turning on his heel, Stanley went to report the news about the blue van to the task force. And of course New, of course New Zealand cops would be chill. They only have to manage like 12 people, right? Or was it 13? Because your, your niece is included now. Kuzi immediately directed the detectives nearest Dogenzaka to look into it, but they found no blue minivan in the area. The order then came down for all personnel to search for the vehicle. Kano thought back to another item in the Dick Diary. Dick Dictum number 14. Use the dead as a stepping stone, but be sure to die a stepping stone yourself. I really wish they called it Dick Tips. In the abstract, Kano could appreciate the nobility of self-sacrifice. But when he thought of Sasayama's blood-stained figure, it wasn't so easy to keep his emotions in check. 
first time you've ever seen a fellow officer get hurt. Sandy had come back over to him. We don't have time to relax. If you can't keep your anger in, then do something about it, here and now. Sandy pointed to his own jaw. Hit me. American style. Oh, how do you hit American style? I, I, I could understand shoot me American style, but hit me American style is kind of more vague. What the hell does that mean? Connor smiled wryly at the unexpected proposal. No thanks, I'll be fine. Hitting this man wasn't going to make Connor feel any better. I'm the one who deserves to get hit. Thinking about Sasama, Connor couldn't help but feel guilty. Without a word, Connor threw a punch. Okay, what do you think? You guys choose. Which one should I pick? Punch? Ask to get punched? Or... Say no. Throw hands, all right. That's, uh, without a word, Kano threw a punch. Stanley soaked up the rage-fueled blow, his face a mask of calm. Oh, hit me harder, daddy. I like it when you hit me in the face. Kano felt all the more miserable in the face of such unflinching resolve. If I weren't such a bumbling clod, Sasayama would never have. Hey, don't blame yourself, Stanley said. You guys have been doing better than ex I expected. More sarcasm, huh? Sandy's mouth curled up sheepishly and he held his hands wide. Chris's voice suddenly cut in over the wireless. We've located the blue minivan. It's in Jinan. It's Hitomi on Koendori. Hitomi might be there. And maybe the kidnapper's ringleader would turn up too. On pure reflex, Kano broke into a run. Sandy followed close behind. They sped through the back streets, making their way toward Koendori. Kano was a pretty fast runner, but Stanley kept up with him without apparent difficulty. Were you in the army or something? Oh, were you in the army or something? No, the Marines. United States Marine Corps, a rapid deployment force specializing in amphibious landing operations, an independent branch of the armed forces along with the Army, Navy and Air Force. The Marines' motto is Semper Fidelis, Latin for always faithful. Uh, always war criminals. And no one gives a fuck. When they say army, just say yes. It, it, they're all shit anyway. It wasn't much further to Coindori. Oh no, if you find that van, don't get too close, Stanley warned. It could be a trap. These people will do any. Oh. Wait a minute. Um. They forgot uh, quotation marks. It could be a trap. These people will do anything to carry out their goals. Anything, huh? Anything? Kano could sense the truth of Stanley's words. He reminded himself that his life could depend on remembering them. He raised his eyes. They were coming up on Koendori. He's gonna end up in the van, hand like uh, tied up, with his face covered, like we saw in the opening scene. Suddenly, a boom as loud as cannon fire shook the area. Something's wrong, Connor thought. That's no ordinary city noise. A column of black smoke rose up from between two nearby buildings. Passers-by stopped and stared, gasping in alarm. Wow. An actual video. Then Kano saw flames. This hadn't been an accident. 
someone had set off an explosion. The Shibuya precinct wasn't too far from here. Kano recalled the attempted bioterrorism attack on Kasumi Gasuke. Two years ago, the Tokyo Metropolitan Public Safety Commission obtained intel of imminent bioterrorist attack within the city. Immediately afterwards, an unoccupied minivan exploded outside the Metropolitan Police Department. An advice for dispersing the bacterial contagion was discovered at the subway platform at Kasumi Gasuke Station. Having de de determined that the city bureaucracy was the target, the Japanese government contacted the terrorist organization responsible in secret, making a deal to put an end to the threat. That incident had begun with a van exploding outside of the Tokyo MPE station. Already a large crowd of onlookers was gathering. Shouts rose up as they took in the scene. What's going on? What happened? That car is on fire! Kano called in to HQ, then quickly slipped around to the back of the burning vehicle. It was a minivan. Peering at the flaming chassis, yeah, he could see that there was someone inside. Oh no, could that be Hitomi? Once they had their hands on the antiviral, the criminals would have no further use for Hitomi Osawa. Already the body had been charred to ashes. At this point, it was hardly recognizable as human anymore. Keep out. My only choice really was punching or getting punched. Alright, we have three choices now. Again, Fred, you pick. Archie, Maria, or Osawa. Two are blocked off. Not much we can do. He's kind of in his own little world, but who knows. Maria was uh, being held at gunpoint, and Archie was uh, being Archie, running around with Hitomi. Osawa? Okay. Osawa it is. I've never trusted anyone, not on a fundamental level. Human beings are a type of organism that I can't get a true handle on through mere surface interactions. And the very fact that I have never trusted anyone else means that, inevitably, no one else has ever trusted me. In the end, maybe the root of all of my problems can be traced back to my heart. As he waited for Minorikawa to contact him, Osawa thought about his current crisis. Assuming Tanaka was behind the kidnapping, then he must have accomplices. And these criminals had mistakenly abducted Maria in their attempt to get the antiviral drug that was in Hitomi's blood. Maria and Hitomi were fraternal twins, but they looked similar enough to be mistaken for identical twins. Still, Tanaka would never confuse the two. The mix-up must have been made by some criminal who didn't know Maria or Hitomi personally. Insisting that Hitomi bring the ransom to the train station was obviously their solution. It had set her up for a second abduction. I, st I keep thinking the professor at their academy is involved, but he would know which one is which, right? That's kind of a point against that theory, but I still think he's involved somehow. They're not going to bring him a few times without uh, without making it relevant. But piecing together this much of the kidnapper's plan only raised a different question. Why had Tanaka shown him those emails from Hitomi? Wouldn't the criminals want to keep information like that hidden? The more Osawa thought about things, the less they made sense. Just who are my allies and who are my foes? Hmm. 
Mr. Osawa, a delivery has arrived for you. It was Kajiwara, the study door. Come in. Wow, they got so close, he actually lets him into the room now. Kajiwara stepped into the room and handed Osawa a letter-sized envelope. Osawa checked the label. Coming, the official Ayakamiki fan club membership application enclosed. <laughs> Requires a thousand yen initiation fee and yearly dues of three thousand yen. Membership grants several perks, including the opportunity to reserve concert tickets in advance of the general public. Osawa is fond of the members' only website content, which includes Aya Kamiki's blog and exclusive videos. I would never pay any for anything like that. I'm, I'm not really a f fan of anything, to be honest, but I just wouldn't pay for this. Right, he had requested the application the day he had gotten back from overseas. Would you mind opening that? Kajiwara asked apologetically. What for? I'd just like to check the contents of any packages you received today, sir. I'd like to check your package. It's possible the kidnapper may try to make contact with you by email. Osawa opened the envelope. Inside, he found the expected application, along with several postcards featuring pictures of the singer. Kajiwara peered pointedly at the postcard images. It's an application for a fan club for this singer. It's actually, she's actually a real-life singer, Aya Kamiki. And um, she is referenced a lot in this game. I think she also sings the main theme of the game, probably. But yeah, they, they're talking about how successful she is. And I guess she was at the time, 2007. But I don't think she remained successful for long. <laughs> He's a, f a member of her fan club. After trying to buy uh, CDs for his daughters, uh, one of them didn't like the CD and gave it back. And then he started listening to it, and he got so involved into it. And even the horoscope he was checking was on her website. So yeah, he's a bit of a fanboy. You must really like her, the detective said. And just what sort of music do you listen to then? Osawa asked, staring at one of the postcards. It was a striking photo that showed off Kamika's expressive eyes. Let me think. Mostly classical, I suppose. Osawa raised a quizzical eyebrow. You know, Kajiwara continued, like Mozart and Chopin and the like. I'm not really a huge fan of Mozart, but uh, Chopin, I have fun playing his pieces on piano. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 1756 to 1791, Austrian born music prodigy and classical composer. Famous works include The Marriage of Figaro, The Magic Flute, and Symphony No. 41, known as Jupiter's Symphony. And Chopin is Frédéric Francois Chopin, 1810 to 1849, composer and pianist of the early Romantic era, famed as a national musician of Poland. Left behind numerous solo piano works. Famous works include his Nocturne, Opus 9, number 2, and his Piano Sonata, number 2. He hummed a few bars. Which bars? Yeah, I haven't played piano in a while, but uh, I used to play quite a lot. I got a piano diploma uh, at some point. That was years and years ago, though. I don't really play all that much music anymore, and I should. I'm probably really out of practice for piano. I don't think I've touched a piano in maybe 10 years or more. Probably more. Can't say I've ever heard them. Are you serious? Kajiwara looked shocked. His daughter has, though. I'm familiar with the names, of course. I just never had much of an interest in music. 
Oh, that's a shame. Would you care to listen to a piece now? I suppose I may as well, now that he brought it up. Osawa was curious to know what sort of music Kajiwara enjoyed. No thank you, right now Osawa preferred silence to unfamiliar music. Let's go with A. I suppose I may as well. Now that he brought it up, Osawa was curious to know what sort of music Kajiwara enjoyed. I'm mostly a string instrument guy more than other stuff. I don't actually know how to play a single brass instrument. One woodwind instrument, um, I guess a couple of string instruments I know how to play. But um, I guess piano is the only percussion instrument I can play. I guess I consider piano a percussion instrument like many others do. Okay, what are we hearing? It's why when I um, played uh, Isomnium um, Nirvana Initiative, I could uh, I could recognize the pieces easily. That was a very easy puzzle to solve for me. Detective pulled a digital music player out of his pocket. Here you go. Osawa slipped the attached earbuds into his ears. I hear nothing. He heard a flow of quiet strings that was soon joined by bold dramatic horns. As the piece continued, it grew more profound and complex, and Asawa could feel his spirit calming. He took a deep breath, then expelled it through his nostrils. And then, he felt something wet in his pants. It felt as if the toxic gloom that had filled him was departing with the air. Before he knew it, nearly ten minutes had passed. What do you think? It's quite nice. The theme of this piece is, uh... Kajuara paused for a moment and thought, well, it's about how your addition can be boorishness. Accumulated knowledge, the term often connotes an advanced and or esoteric understanding. Displaying a moderate amount can impress others, but pompously flaunting it is bound to put them off. Thank you. If I hadn't met you, I'd never have discovered this piece. He spoke the words unthinkingly, with unaccustomed frankness. I didn't mention they're gonna end up being very friendly with each other in the end, although I loved their interaction from earlier. Kajiwara is, uh, is awesome. Was this the power of music then? It's the power of friendship. I'm very happy to hear that, sir. Now give him a banana, please give him a banana. Sawa gazed at one of the postcards as he let himself be drawn back into the music. Man, you really missed out on some very interesting scenes with this guy, Fred. But hey, all the playthroughs on YouTube, if you're bored. Aya was scooping up handfuls of mystical blue sand. And the best thing about this is you can just treat it like a podcast and you don't have to watch it. Because I'm reading everything. The greens dripped down from her fingertips. I feel like I could be in this photo here. Osawa muttered, the heck? Like I've lived my life letting so many things slip through my fingers. Kajiwara thought for a moment before responding. I think probably Kajiwara relates to him. He might be a, a person who overworked and then end up, ended up uh, losing the relationship with his family. I think anyone who's worked hard to accomplish something and focused for a long time on that one thing is susceptible to those kinds of feelings. Accomplishing something means getting results. That's not where my problem is. Osawa removed the headphones and gave back the music player. told me not to hide things from you, right? 
Kajiwara nodded silently. Then allow me to speak frankly. Leaning back heavily in his chair, Osawa took another deep, slow breath. I'm anxious. So anxious that it's almost crushing me. Given the circumstances, sir, that's completely understand. No. Osawa spoke up before Kajiwara could finish. It's not that. It's not that. At all. He shook his head vigorously. I actually thought of starting a podcast, but what am I even going to talk about? I need it. So it was sort of a type of podcast. It's a lot easier when you have somebody else to do a podcast with, but even then, who? I mean, I wouldn't replace Twitch with podcasts. I still want to play games, so... If the worst should happen to my daughter, how am I going to feel, I wonder? I'm not a man with a wide range of emotions. My heart is always cold, somehow. And the truth is, I've wanted it to be that way. Which is why, if I do lose my daughter, my heart might remain unmoved. I may not even be able to feel a father's sorrow. That's what I'm anxious about. He felt his emotions twist inside him in a way that was utterly confusing. For perhaps the first time in his life, he realized how fickle a thing the human heart could be. It's alright, sir. Kajiwara flashed him a carefree smile. What's all right? People who really have cold hearts don't worry about that sort of thing. The detective held out his music player again. Here, I would like you to have this. Please give it another listen if you like. I think it might help you calm your nerves. It's better than the shitty music you've been listening to. I have to say, sir, you have such awful taste in music. Sawa took the offered device. He had dared to open up to Kajiwara just a little, and to his own surprise, he felt grateful for it. And how about one of these as well? Please be a banana. Please. Yes. Yes. It's a banana. Hey. I think I would need to figure out a topic for the podcast. I would also need to do editing. I mean, audio editing to an extent could be easier than video editing. Something I've been avoiding for a while. And I really do need to edit the Neo playthrough. And I need to finish that Neo playthrough. And that requires a lot of effort. And I'm lazy. The detective produced a banana from his pocket. Is that a banana in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? I'm fine, thanks. Are you sure? I'm sure or oh, alright, I guess I'll take it. I'll take the banana. And then he is gonna go, yeah. psych, I was joking, you're not having one. Oh, all right. I guess I'll take it. Asawa spoke irritably, then his expression softened a little. You know, you've been getting on my nerves all day. Really? Here I thought I'd been doing what I could to soothe your spirits, Mr. Asawa. It's actually been a real long time since I've yelled at anyone quite so much. As the words left his lips, Osawa found himself thinking back to one particular rainy day. A 
Maria had been in fifth grade at the time. Osawa was standing in his daughter's room. In his hands he held the letter she had left behind. He happened to glance out the window and saw Maria walking along, soaked from head to toe. In an instant, Osawa was consumed with rage. Struck by an impulse he didn't quite understand, he ran from the room heading for the front door. Damn, I didn't read the letter before it went away. Maria had just gotten back inside. Osawa met her silently in the entryway. Wet strands of hair clung to the girl's forehead as she looked up at her father with a bitter glare. You don't care what happens to me, do you? How can he slap? How can he slap? Impulsively, he slapped her face. Maria's cheek turned red and tears welled up in her eyes. The tears of the kingdom. Coming soon. Osawa's anger transformed abruptly into guilt. He gazed down at the palm of his hand and saw a tiny spot of blood. He was shocked by the recognition of what he had just done. And then he was afraid. At first he was afraid, then petrified. Afraid that his daughter could bring such raw emotion out of him and make him do something so thoughtless. Something wrong, Mr. Osawa? Kajawara was leaning in, looking concerned. Osawa came back into the moment with a start and realized he had buried his face in his hands. No. He muttered, looking up. Just getting angry, yelling at people. We're not good with that sort of thing. I don't like it. He picked up the music player and fidgeted with the earbuds as he spoke. Well, getting angry and yelling at people. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's just human. It's human? To do those kinds of things? I often say that he would... They, they're they making mistakes here. I often say that he was cold and mechanical. No, it's not a mistake. It's just me misreading it. Never mind. Her sarcasm only underlined the fact he had always lived with, that he didn't know how to conduct himself like a human being. If you get angry, you show it. If you get sad, you show it. If you get horny, you should also show it. It's human nature to let other people know how we're feeling after all. But what if doing that hurts the other person? That's when you apologize, sir. Have you not been sleeping well, Fred? Why are you copying me? That's my thing, not sleeping well. It occurred to Osawa that he had never tried to tell anyone how he felt before. He'd never felt the need to. And yet, right now, he suddenly felt that if his daughters were to appear before him, he might blurt out everything he had ever left and said. It was a terrifying thought. Stunning. I opened the door and stepped into the room. The pictures are asking for you. Since it's been in the down. Depression? But the world is so amazing. How can anyone be depressed? I'm being sarcastic, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I can relate. 
I can really relate. And yeah, that does really affect your sleep pattern. We'll be right there. Osawa and Kajiwara hurried out of the room. I just remembered uh, back when I was in school in Malaysia, um, and they had a principal. Uh, she was, uh, I mean, she was okay, but for some reason her husband would come into school at, and he didn't really have a role. He was just there. We kept wondering what he was in charge of. But anyway, eventually they, they made a post position for him and Put him there even though he didn't really do anything apart from walk around telling kids to talk in their shirts and so on but the funniest thing was uh, there was an event at school and we, all, we always noticed that they don't even come into the place at the same time and we were wondering like are they really together or are they not and then there was an event in school and they had a couch there and she was sitting down and then he came over and sat next to her. She immediately got up and used another seat. And that was in front of the whole school. Uh, yeah, this scene reminded me of that. Before the news was shared with the Osawas, the members of the investigation team quietly briefed Detective Kajiwara. Osawa and I sat on the sofa on the far side of the room, watching. It just feels ironic that they call her I because she's not really full of love, is she? They could see Kajiwara go pale. He wiped the sweat from his forehead with a handkerchief several times. Bad news, Osawa thought. Mr. Osawa, ma'am. Yeah, the, the guy was her husband, but... I don't know why they had a very weird relationship. Also, I've never seen anyone pull his trousers so high before. They went up to his uh, armpits. And I don't know why. He always liked wearing them that way. They're really zooming in on Kajiwara's ass. Colonel, I'm trying to sneak around, but I'm dummy thick, and the clap of my ass cheeks keeps alerting the guards. Kajwara shuffled his way over to them at last. We just got in word from headquarters. He hesitated ominously. Osawa braced himself. Please, let's hear it. First, about your daughter, Hitomi. Kajiwara's expression was grim. The body of a young man named Achiendo was discovered near Shibuya Station. The name meant nothing to Asawa. Achi is dead, next to Shibuya Station. In a building not too far from the scene, we... The detective swallowed. Your daughter, Hitomi, was found dead. Nani. The world began to shake. Osawa staggered, reeling with sudden nauseating vertigo. No. No. It's not possible. After that, your daughter Maria. The words blurred together, he could no longer comprehend what he was hearing. Everything was wobbling, shuddering, distorting. Hitomi was dead. Hitomi. With those words, Osawa's whole world went dark, 
as if someone had just yanked the curtains closed. Bad end. See, they, they went on for a while, and you think, oh, the story is progressing, and then suddenly you're hit with a bad end. Learning of Hitomi's death plunged Osawa into a pit of despair. This was the dark end of a chain of events that began with a simple, small decision. Someone else merely decided to abide by a little promise. Because of that, not only did Achi and Hitomi meet with disaster, but Osawa lost his mind as well. Keeping a promise is a noble thing, for sure, but right now, saving Achi, Hitomi and Osawa is more important. I know who they're talking about. I think, Fred, you really would have enjoyed the uh, Zero Escape series had I streamed it. Too bad I didn't stream it. The Zero Escape series is the same thing. You play and you play, uh, continue and suddenly you're hit with a bad ending after uh, several hours. Just like, well, you're dead. It's a trilogy. The third game is the weakest. But the first two were pretty alright. But I think the choice I need to make is here. This one. But I'm not actually going to do it because I want to swap to Archie and see how I die. It's not really unforgiving because you actually have to get the bad endings in order to get the true ending, strangely enough. Saying anymore is polar territory, but yeah, you need to see the bad endings in order to get to, well not all of them, at least one of them, in order to get the true ending. And there is fast forward, so thankfully you can get back to where you are pretty quickly. Maybe one day I'll stream it again, but I remember it very well, so streaming it is not going to be the same thing. Like a first playthrough. Let's play with Hachi, the mastermind. Last thing we saw, we, uh, we met with Kanan. I'm still doubting it's really her. Uh, but, um, yep, Zero, Zero Escape Trilogy. The first game is called 999, the second game is Virtue's Lost Reward, and the third game is Zero Time Dilemma. And the third game is the weakest. I played the third game in 2016 when it came out. That was before I started streaming. And, um, yeah. The first two I played when they came out. But I do remember the game pretty well, I would say. Kenan led them into a narrow back alley. The moment she stopped, Hitomi spoke up. Members of SOS don't come by here very much. Word has it that in this place, around 10 years ago, one man beat the crap out of seven street toughs in a blink of an eye, all by himself. Over time, people have offered various theories, that he was an assassin, that he was some foreign soldier, even that he might have been a ghost, and to this day, the urban legend lives on. I think um, the first game was released on iOS at some point, but it's a very bad port because the game is a mixture of puzzle games and uh, visual novel. And the iOS version completely removed the puzzle element. So it's just a visual novel, and this uh, it's kind of silly to do that. Why was my sister kidnapped? Before I answer that, there's something I need to tell you, Kenan said. I think I watched one or two people stream some of the games as well, so I still really remember them. Though there are some games that I played in the past but don't really remember all that much, like the Metal Gear games. I don't really remember 4 all that much, and that's the one I'm gonna play next in the series. So, it's almost a first playthrough. 
when I do that. Her tone was cold and sharp. I've come to Japan because I'm on a mission. I'm not at liberty to discuss all the details. Alright. Hitomi gave her a slight nod. I still don't think she is really the person she's claiming to be. To answer your question, Maria was kidnapped by mistake. What? Hitomi gasped. And why? Because this kidnapper is enough to Maria. They're after you. Who's after me? The mastermind behind this whole thing, Ken answered. Her tone was matter of fact. Oh, hold on, Archie interrupted. What do they want Hitomi for? That I cannot say. She does not look even 18, this girl. Well, then who is this person? I can't tell you that either. You see, their sex, nationality, age, appearance. Just about everything about them is shrouded in mystery. So there's honestly not much I can tell you. It's her. She, she is the person who is after her. He told me and she's pretending not to be. I'm not at the extent I'm gonna bet on it, but this is my gut instinct. Archie and Hitomi stood dumbfounded. What gives? Archie said. So you're saying that all you know is that this person has some lame name like Mastermind? Hitomi turned to whisper in his ear. Mastermind isn't actually her name. Archie is such an idiot. Originally used solely to refer to someone of remarkable intellect, the term first took on its criminal connotations in the 19th century. I'm here because I'm looking for revenge, Kenan spat. Revenge? Itomi asked. What for? This person also killed my friend. Kenan's inscrutable eyes flashed with a threatening gleam. Earlier you said it was your fault my sister got kidnapped, Hitomi said. Kenan cast her eyes down. Four days ago, I managed to learn this criminal's plan. So I got in touch with Maria and told her that you were going to be attacked at her party. So that's why she told me not to go. Hitomi's voice trembled as she spoke. I gave Maria a small GPS tracker to give to you, but I guess you never got it. GPS, Global Positioning System, a network of man-made satellites at ground-based control stations for providing geolocation data. Alternatively, or alternately, a device that makes use of said system. Modern cell phones and vehicle navigation systems use GPS. Again, this is 2008, so back then, not everyone knew what GPS was. And that's how they work. Amazing. Hitomi shook her head. I see. She must still have it then. Wait. So then, my sister... The color drained from Hitomi's face as she understood. Yes, Kenan replied. Maria acted as a decoy and let herself get kidnapped in your stead. Hitomi swayed on her feet, shocked to the verge of fainting. But she hurriedly reached out and caught her in his arms. And then he gave Kenan a thumbs up, for she was the winged woman he needed. Wait, he said to Kanan as he held Hitomi up. I don't get that either. Why did neither of them go? Then nobody would have been kidnapped, right? I mean, why did her sister need to go and act as a decoy? Kanan let out a tiny sigh. If she hadn't gone to the party, the kidnappers would have just found some other opportunity to come after her. 
Oh, okay. What's he nodded? That sort of makes sense. I'm betting that Maria's plan was to use the GPS to lead me to this guy's hideout. She wanted to keep her sister safe and also figured she could help me with my mission. It's the sort of scheme she'd think of. So then, can't you use the GPS to locate Hitomi's sister? Hachi asked. Kenan shook her head. The GPS hasn't been powered on since she was kidnapped. It's possible the kidnappers took it from her. Wait, what? So after all that, even you can't find Maria? But she slumped his shoulders in disappointment. I didn't say that. What do you mean? I got some intel from those syndicate members we met earlier. Apparently some of the time this morning, they put Maria into a Bilu minivan and since then they've been moving on her on the round ship here. Archie and Hitomi exchanged glances at the mention of the blue minivan. Unfortunately, Kanan continued, these operatives didn't know what the current situation was exactly. So we're back to the blue van then. Archie hurriedly explained what they had been th through so far. He mentioned how they'd first seen the blue van where the kidnappers had to told Hitomi to find it. They also described how first the man with a cane and then a host of others had come after them. He got a little sidetracked here and there, but Kanan quietly listened to the end. I see, she muttered. So then what do you think? Achi asked. Seems like we messed up their schemes a little, huh? Whatever the case, this man with a cane concerns me, Kanan said. I don't know, I doubt he's working with others, I don't know what that means. Maybe that's it, some guy who isn't involved butts in and it throws off their whole plan. Kanan nodded in agreement. Because, because you and that man with the cane showed up, she said. He couldn't leave the minivan where it was. They took a sensible precaution. But then, if you think about it, isn't this an opportunity for us to turn the tables on Mr. Mastermind? Or Miss Mastermind? Kanan flashed him a faint spe speculative smile. I wonder about that. Oh, come on. Archie grumbled. You're such a buzzkill. Any well-made plan has a good solid outline, which means that even after it has come to fruition, it's easy to trace things back to the planner. Hmm, is that how it works? By contrast, if you achieve your goals using accidental means, the outline becomes blurred and it makes it harder for anyone outside, looking in, to grasp what that actual plan is. Archie swallowed hard as he took in the gravity of the situation. Well, I mean, like, if there is an accident, people are gonna for sure panic, plan or not. The concerns of Kanan's lip, or the corners of Kanan's lips curled up. Typically, I suppose, she said. But the people who are after Hitomi, not only have they put together a perfect plan, they purposely left certain tiny holes in it. And so we can't even figure out who they are. The outline of the plan is always too blurry. Archie had no response to that. It was like he was hearing about some completely different world beyond the one he knew. Yeah, the more she talks, the more I think she's actually the mastermind. If what Kanan had said was true, he'd have uh, he'd be dealing with op opponents that were on a level way above his own. In any event, since these people are after you, it'd be my best. It'd be best if you didn't wander around town anymore. Kanan told him. By now, Hitomi had recovered. She stood up straight and shook her head. No, I'm going to find that blue minivan. My sister is in danger because of me. I can't abandon her just to save myself. 
Yeah, that's right. Archie patted it on me on the back. A little lower, lower Archie. And if that's, if that's what you're gonna do, then I don't care who we're up against. I'm with you in this until the end. Heck, it's too late for me to back out now. That ship has already failed. Now she's gonna laugh and say sailed. You told me giggled, despite yourself. It's already sailed, Archie. Yeah. Can I let out another little sigh? All right. Just make sure you're extra careful, she said. You can't count on getting bailed out of trouble like you had before. I understand. Her eyes showed no trace of doubt or fear. Kenan gave her a slight nod, then quickly disappeared down the alleyway. Right then, Archie said. Want to get back to looking for that minivan? Then he stopped, remembering their previous efforts. If they just heedlessly wandered around town, they'd probably end up in the same trouble they'd encountered before. They would get chased by the man with the cane, or by the kidnappers, and their search would be interrupted yet again. What should they do then? There had to be a better way. Archie happened to glance upward, and caught sight of a surveillance camera installed on one of the streetlights, and now he's gonna go back to his father, he's gonna remember the surveillance camera his father installed, the one he forgot about for the past five hours. That's it. Hmm? Well, I can't believe I didn't think of it before. Itomi peered at him, startled by his sudden shouting. We just need to use my old man's surveillance cameras and this will be a breeze. Ashi took Itomi by the hand and started running. His destination, the security camera monitoring room in Dogenzaka. What did I say? Ashi didn't slow his pace until they were nearing their destination. Then he turned to look back at Hitomi. He was about to ask if she was doing alright when someone close at hand called out to him. Norikawa. Hey, mind if I ask you something? Have you heard of SOS? Ashi stopped in his tracks as a stranger stepped in front of him. The guy looked too old to be picking a fight with SOS. Ashi regarded him with suspicion. Yeah, why do you ask? Do you happen to be a member yourself? No, not anymore. The man's eyes flashed with a gleam of recognition. Did this guy know who he was? With a broad grin, the stranger took a step closer. Archie's heart sank. He couldn't afford to get caught up in some new hassle right now. Hitomi flashed him a worried look. Let's go. It's a goal. Archie and Hitomi dodged past the man and hurried onward. Even if the guy was harmless, they needed to be on the guard. There was no telling just how many thugs and assassins were looking for Hitomi. And they will die because they were interrupted by that guy. Rather than head directly for the surveillance building, Archie decided he better make sure the stranger wasn't up to something. Hitomi followed as he slipped quickly into a back alley. There was no indication that the man was following them. What was that guy's deal? Hitomi asked. No idea. But he sure seemed kind of fishy. Doesn't look like he's coming after us though. They took a quick detour through another seedy back alley. Then, as they were starting to head toward their original destination, Archie felt a sudden searing pain in his back. He got stabbed. Ugh. Glancing over his shoulder, he discovered that one of the foreign syndicate members had crept up and struck him from behind. Oh no, I've been stabbed. Ah. Hitomi screamed. Ah, Another man had suddenly appeared, grabbing her by the arms. <laughs> to me. And then the foreigner misinterprets that as him saying, hit me. 
Achi tried to reach out to her, but his arm was le a leaden. His body refused to obey his commands. As the attacker wrenched the knife from his back, Archie felt the blood gushing out from his wound. The two men started to drag Hitomi away. Damn it. He tried to pursue them, but his legs faltered and couldn't find the footing. He was losing blood so fast he was starting to fade from consciousness. His legs were weak, his arms were heavy, and he had to catch up on his back already. Archie could only watch impotently as Hitomi was dragged further and further away. Good ending. Yeah, so the thing is, I, I pay attention to the little details, and that's why my predictions are usually correct. Stabbed by a kidnapper. Achi got stabbed, caught in a surprise attack by one of the kidnappers. He could only watch helplessly as Hitomi was taken away. If that weird guy hadn't tried to talk to him, Achi would never have taken the risk of wandering through the alleys. But how can you keep that guy from wanting to interview Achi? I can keep him easily by not keeping my promise to tell the theater troupe about the dry ice machine. That's Minorikawa. So we are going to Minorikawa's side, and here we pick the other choice. No, not this one. Um, this bit. Should I tell them? No. Nothing you can do about having forgotten he hurried on to the cafe. Sorry, Endo. Sorry, Aurai. You're just gonna have to let this one slide. I've got Toyama's life on the line here. Open the door to cafe with the with the practice of a regular. Okay, it's a different scene now. Welcome. The waitress only got that far before her face fell. You again? Hey, uh, hurry up and get me a seat. She grimaced wickedly. I'm terribly sorry, sir. But we're all full at the moment. He looked around. All of the seats were indeed filled. As you can see, sir. Really now? The waitress's grin widened with triumph. Yes, sir. Fine, I'll just right here. Let me get some power. Jamming his power cable into a nearby outlet, Minorikawa plunked himself right down on the floor and booted up his laptop. The waitress watched in dismay, then turned to stare vacantly up at the ceiling. Okay, this is the same now. Just do what you want. She muttered vaguely. And then... Okay. Now it's the same. So we can swap. It still takes us to the bad ending, but Archie's path is different now. He doesn't get stabbed. I'm probably streaming for another three hours. Probably. I'm trying to finish this game before Zelda, but it's looking less and less likely. Because Wednesday is going to be indie day. I don't want to change that. Although maybe I will have to. And um, Thursday is when I'm going to be starting. Well, it's going to be your Friday, I suppose. But Thursday I'm going to be um, starting Zelda. So I need to kind of push through this game. Even though my throat is tired, very tired. It's 
spoilers you mean in this game? You wanna catch up with the VODs? I uploaded almost all the VODs to YouTube. I think uh, not yesterday's session, uh, the day before. That's the only session I haven't uploaded and I'm gonna upload it along with today's session later on. Okay, a little bit further, do you want to walk? Oh, Ashi didn't show his stoic pace until they were nearing their destination. He turned to look back at Hitomi. It's only a little bit further now. Do you want to walk? Be alright. Ah, uh, uh, Ashi, look out. Oh, the Zelda spoilers. Oh, well, uh, it's pretty easy to access the, the leaked games. I totally didn't get access to the late game. And I totally am not waiting for the official release date to play it. But basically, if a game has a physical edition, it's very likely that somebody is going to get their hands on it and leak it online. Especially for such a big release like this one. Looking ahead again, Archie saw that they were bearing down on a young grade school girl, her head hung in dismay, Hana. Archie hurriedly caught the girl up in his arms, took a quick leap to one side. I am gonna leap to one side. He managed to avoid crashing into her by taking a tumble himself. But the girl was still definitely a bit shocked. Sorry about that, Archie said. Are you alright? But the girl didn't answer or even meet Archie's eye, she just looked around as if in a daze. Was she waiting on someone maybe? Odd kid, Archie thought. I hope she's okay. Once more, Archie and Hitomi set off running. Archie led Hitomi to an old, multi-tenant building. They hurried inside and headed up the stairs. Behind the reception window on the second floor sat the custodian, sleeping on the job. Yukinori Kitajima. His main job is overseeing the monitoring room for the local surveillance cameras. But on the side, he also works on novelist and game scenario writer. He often sleeps on the job during free time, and sometimes while he's asleep, he gets his writing done. Okay, Fred, take your time. <laughs> Just recently, a certain game was released, set in Shibuya, but since he wrote the scenario and emailed it to the game company while he was asleep, he didn't know about it until just the other day. Was he... Is, is he one of the people working on the game? Let me Google him. Okay, he is actually the principal writer for the game, yeah. Also wrote the script for Okami Den. Interesting. Hey, wake up, man. Archie gave the window a tap. The man woke with a start. Huh? Archie don't scare me like that. There's one in a cheat too many. And wow, you sure seem to have a lot of free time on your hands. Yeah, no one's been to check today. But that's not too bad, right? I mean, I guess it is a surveillance room, but still. The man let out a big yawn. My dad asked me to come down here and check on the security monitors, actually, Archie said. Sorry to bother you when you're... Sorry to bother with you when you're busy, Hitomi added with a polite bow. Huh? Who are, who are you? You with Achichi? Hitomi Osawa, it's nice to meet you. Uh-huh, what? You are Chichi's girlfriend? 
I had too many cheese there, and that's none of your business. Just let me have the key. Hoping his blush wasn't too obvious, Archie mimed unlocking a door. I won't answer a simple question. You want me to hand over the key? Yes, I'm his girlfriend, Hitomi said. You just started dating. So I'm sure I'll be seeing more of you, sir. She flashed a winning smile. Oh, well, what a surprise. Never thought how Chi Chi could land a fine lady like yourself. The surprised custodian held out the key. What for you, Archie? Still do one Archie too many there. But yeah, dating. Archie gazed into Tommy's face, even more surprised than the custodian. The key dangled, swaying to and fro like a pendulum between Archie and the man behind the counter. Archie, she said, nudging him in the side with her elbow. Come on. All right. Snapping out of it, Archie took the key and headed up to the next floor. Look at his grin. I'm sorry. I hit him say as they entered the monitoring room. I was just saying we were dating like that, I mean. It was a pretty clumsy lie. No, no, it was just kind of sudden is all. I was just a bit jittery, I guess. Archie felt his cheeks color again. I mean, I figured I had to say something or he wasn't going to cooperate, he told me said. She looked a little embarrassed herself. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make things awkward. No, 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 Archie said. No, it wasn't weird at all. Actually, it was kind of... He stopped himself there. No, now wasn't the time for that sort of conversation. They needed to find that blue minivan. The surveillance camera monitoring room was really just a big office with a single computer. Archie knew it well. So this is oh, so this is a monitoring system, he explained. He switched on the computer. You can see all of downtown Shibuya from this one computer. Itomi gazed impatiently at the monitor, even though it wasn't showing anything yet. The look of sheer determination on her face held Archie enthralled. You talk about how attractive your sister is, Archie murmured. But as far as I'm concerned, right now you're the lovely one, Hitomi. Hitomi looked at him, uncertain. I mean, look at the lengths you're going to and the risks you're taking to save your sister, Archie said. I can't bear the thought that something might happen to her. And the last time we were together, I said such horrible things. Plenty of people do bad things without even realizing they're bad. Never mind trying to fix it. I'm just doing what I think is right. Yeah, but these days most people don't do the right thing. Heck, if they did, Shibuya wouldn't be covered in trash like it is. Me, I appreciate it when someone really cares about the things that are important. Doing the right thing is a matter of course, that's very attractive. Archie blushed as he said it and he told me Charlie looked away. She's not looking away though, she's staring right at him. Uh, I think the system is ready. Turning to the computer, Archie hastily changed the subject. This thing's too simple, even I know how to use it. Clicking on the mouse, he brought up a row of four windows on the monitor. I imagine he's the kind of guy who would use both hands to use the mouse. Out of incompetence, not out of any physical disability. Each window showed a different view of the Shibuya cityscape. The image quality is not great, but that's because it's being updated on a two second delay, I guess. Archie tapped on the keyboard, bringing up shots of different locations. He clicked on one of them in order to enlarge the image. Maybe we really can't find a minivan with this. Uh, maybe we can really find a minivan with this. He told me it was practically glued to the screen. My dad's the one who designed this security system. Your dad must be pretty amazing. Well, he graduated top of his class at Tokyo Danko University. 
a prestigious national university founded over a century ago, applicants who place highly on the entrance exam can receive a full scholarship. Archie's father was one such attendee. The school has supported extensive research into artificial intelligence and recently announced an AI program called the known as Body. While the computer is asleep, different personalities emerge which have an impact on various normal thought processes, forming a network, uh, a network of more human-like thought patterns as a result. You always said you could never had a career in computer engineering, but he took over the electronics shop so that he could marry my mother instead. That's such a sweet story. Did they run the store together then? No, his mother is dead. Archie shook his head. No, my mother died when I was four. There you go. I'm thinking she died be because of Tateno and he's trying to help Archie's sister because of uh, to atone for that or something. And I did say that yesterday. Oh, I'm sorry. He told me it sounded even sadder than Archie. Well, anyway, never mind that. Here, look. The seedy looking weirdo they'd run into at Giga was on the screen. Uh, that guy again. Said weirdo was running all out, a laptop computer under one arm. He was being chased by a man in a long coat. That guy sure gets chased around a lot, huh? Archie said. When the weirdo slipped out of view, Archie switched to another camera. I mean, he's saying somebody is getting chased around a lot when they've been getting chased around for five hours now. The new view showed the weirdo running again. By hopping from camera to camera, they could track him wherever he went. So long as we have these cameras, this guy has nowhere to run. Hmm. Nowhere to run, huh? The moment he said those words, they struck an odd chord in his mind. He remembered the repeated run-ins with the man with the cane, how the assassin had seemed all to always to know where to find them. As I said before, the assassin, Tateno, is working with his father, and that's how he knows where to find them. Actually, please, Hitomi urged. Stop messing around and let's look for the minivan. Oh, let's go with A. Sorry, there's just something I'm curious about. Archie continued to track the seedy looking man. The weirdo rushed into a knick-knack shop on Center Guy. Soon after, the man with the coat appeared and followed him into the shop. Oh, looks like he snatched that guy's computer. Still, they remain glued to the monitor. Well, that's me. He told me to. Oh, that's me. He told me to count her cell phone. It's an email from Mr. Tanaka. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was about time for my mood to take a dip, Archie thought. What? He told me, I blurted. She looked up from her phone. Archie, Mr. Tanaka found the minivan. He what? What does he say? Read it to me. Okay. I ran after uh, after it, but wound up losing sight of it. He was heading toward Jinnan. That's what he says. What about your sister? Well, we can't swap because we haven't actually started Maria's uh, bit. Was she inside? He doesn't say. Archie switched over to an array of surveillance cameras near Jinnan. A few seconds the transition took felt agonizingly slow. Finally, four new images popped up. Archie quickly enlarged one of them. Oh. Tommy let out a tiny gasp. There on the monitor was a blue minivan. There was no doubt about it. Archie and Hitomi rushed from the building, speeding toward Jinnan in an all-out run. Run, Archie, run, Hitomi, run, other guy who's looking for Miku. Minorikawa. That's the alternative choice, of course. We haven't uh, unlocked that yet. Neither spoke. They simply dashed along in silence. 
but she felt as if they had been running a marathon and the finish line had finally come into view. Finish line for their lives, maybe. They looked to the left at the station and darted past the Sabo department store. Ah, Archie pointed as he came to a stop. The blue minivan was still there, parked by the curb alongside along the slight hilly incline. Leaving Archie behind, Hitomi started rushing up the hill. Alarm bells started going off in Archie's mind. Someone from the kidnapping crew was in that van. It was dangerous to approach carelessly. Stay back, don't get too close. Stay back, don't get too close. Archie shouted. But she didn't appear to hear his cries. The hope of rescuing her sister had driven all else from her mind. Archie started to run after her. How did she even get ahead of him? She's always so slow compared to him. Hitomi had reached the vehicle already. She brought her, brought her face close to one of the its windows, but the synthetic glass obscured the view inside. Hitomi circled around to the minivan's other side. Archie saw her grasping at the door. She slipped out of his view for just a moment. Go plow! There is Levi's store. There was a thunderous explosion and a gout of flames tore the roof of the minivan like it was made of aluminium foil. It didn't, it just flipped it. We saw the roof intact. Hey, Hitomi. Horrified Archie charged through the rolling smoke, searching for Hitomi. He saw two figures sprawled on the street, several meters from the van. Hitomi and Kenan. Hitomi, wake up. Archie cradled her in his arms, and her eyes drifted open faintly. Are you okay? Are you hurt? Hitomi didn't appear to understand him. Her only response was a blank, dazed look. There was a small patch of red on her face. Needle mark. Okay. Kanan is definitely one of the criminals. She took her blood right there. From the neck. She took the... Um, Drug delivery uh, thing, the GDS. They say it's the neck, right? And there it is. They say face is the neck. Archie wiped it gently away with a finger. He saw no further signs of bleeding. It's a needle mark. She must have been splattered by someone else's blood then. No, it's a needle. As far as he could tell, she hadn't been gravely injured. Archie let out a sigh of relief. You tell me, is she alright? Oh. Hey to me, is she alright? Kanan stirred on the ground. Her clothes were scorched in places and she was bleeding from her head. Kanan, did you save her? Is she alright? Yeah, what about her sister? Kanan didn't respond. No, it can't be. But she went to look inside the van. Amidst the smoke and the flames, he could make out the outline of her body. What happened here? Archie had to look away. Get Hitomi out of here. Hurry. If those guys show back up. Kanan's face twisted with pain. Alright. Archie settled Hitomi carefully in his arm. Wait, I need to tell you something. Oh. Wait, I need to tell you something. Kenan's pained gasp called him back. Alfred. Huh? Alfred. That's the name of the mastermind. I'm sure it will come back again if you keep pursuing this. She is Alfred. But if you value your life, don't get involved with Alfred any further. Now go. She is Alfred. I'm calling it right now. She's Alfred. Okay, and thanks.
With Hitomi in his arms, Archie hurried from the scene. He wasn't sure where he was heading. He just wanted to get away, wherever that went. He carried her past the crowd of onlookers that had swiftly begun to assemble, and holy shit, air conditioning after it got fixed, it got so much colder. Hold on, I'm gonna adjust the temperature or maybe shut it off completely for a sec. Yeah, it felt pretty cold. Maybe the fan was strong, but I turned it off for a bit. The flames of the burning band rose ever higher, roaring up towards the heaven. To be continued, wow, okay. I thought we were getting a bad ending, but no. is done we can probably swap to Osawa and see what happens something wrong Mr. Osawa yeah to saw I never tried to tell anyone how I felt before, never tried the need to. Yet right now it's only felt that if his daughters were up here, yeah, blurted everything and everything said left unsaid was a terrifying thought. Then a knock on the door. I opened the door and stepped into the room. Okay, asking for you, it seems there's been a development. We were right there, they left, they sit on the couch. And we get zoomed in on... Oh, it's a keep out now. Okay, that changed. I think this keep out will be unlocked if we... Wait, the to be continued is at 3.30 and not even 4 o'clock? Okay, Maria would determine that keep out. I don't know how we can unlock this one. This guy needs to be running after Miku, but how would we find Miku? Well, I guess we'll just go with Maria for now. Maria. The man with the cane. I'm still saying he's a detective, Tateno. Wait, hold on. Is my name Hitomi Osawa? My shout, the man with the cane hesitates, his finger on the trigger. What do you mean by that? The barrel of the gun is still aimed squarely at my head. Oh, I forgot that she, um, she narrates in first person. The barrel of the gun is still aimed squarely at my head. I mean exactly what I said. Is my name Hitomi Osawa? I don't know who I am. You're trying to play games with me. I'm not playing with anyone, I swear. I'm utterly desperate right now. Getting killed is one thing, but who wants to die without even knowing who they are? Tell me, am I Hitomi Osawa or not? The man gives me a good hard look. Damn it, I wonder. He continues to study me along the barrel of the gun. Tell me what you know. It's an order, not a request. But I know about what? 
Look, I have amnesia. I quickly summarize what's happened to me since I woke up in that storehouse. The man listens intently, never taking his eyes off me. Oh, I see. So that's what's going on then. So I'm done with my story, the man with a cane sits down on an empty soda grate. Seems he believes me at any rate. That's a relief if nothing else. So then... Oh. So then, am I Hitomi Osawa? No. Then who is Hitomi Osawa? Is she someone who looks like me? Shut your mouth. Your, uh, the man... Man spits. Just be quiet. His expression is vacant. What am I going to do? He mutters to himself. Um, if I'm not Hitomi Osawa, does that mean you don't have any business with me? Seems so. In that case, can I go? He says and does an answer. He lets his pistol hang limp in his hand. The muzzle dro dropping to point at the ground. It doesn't look like he wants to kill me anymore. It doesn't look like he'll just let me go quietly either. Right, two choices. Remain motionless, waiting for an opportunity to run away. I need to do something about that gun he has and then make a run for it. Do something about the gun or run away. I need to do something about the gun he has and then make a run for it. Pick up one of the crates that are lying around in the alley and hurl the, at the man with the cane. Then I book it right out of here there. I run for a long time without looking back. When I finally do take a peek over my shoulder, there's no sign of the guy following me. Slowing my run to a walk, I notice Miku, uh, Miku, the girl I fought for those cases of burning hammer, sitting on a nearby staircase. Thanks for earlier, I call out. She gives me a puzzled look. Um, um, you let me have this dry drinks from the knick-knack shops. Revelation dawns on her face. Oh, right. I didn't recognize you since you're not a cat anymore. What are you doing here? I ask. Mm, just like, you know. She, she gave me a half-hearted smile. Say, where do you, where do you learn Aikijutsu? Jujutsu? Huh? Which catches me off guard. I don't know what to say. Your Aiki Jujutsu, where did you learn it? My Aiki Jujutsu? Now that she mentions it, that's a great question. I mean, I must have learned somewhere, or my body wouldn't have moved the way it did back then. I wonder who taught me. Try as I might though, I can't remember. Miku interprets my silence as a refusal to answer. She lets out an annoyed snort. Hmm, what? Is it a trade secret? Fine. And how long did you train? Um, um, not, not that long, I guess, probably. I, I'm just trying to avoid telling her I have amnesia. She obviously thinks I'm being secretive. You know? She says angrily. After losing to you, I've completely fallen apart. I've lost everything. Do you know how that feels? Do you feel like you've lost hold of the thing that makes you you? I nod with conviction. I do know. I've lost things too. Like my memory. You do, but just can't take this anymore. I'm having a complete breakdown of identity. Development psychologist, uh, psychologist uh, Eric Homberger Erickson was a key proponent of the concept of self-identity, the ability of individuals to continually and reliably know who they are and what they should do. I mean, I'm saying this having lost to you and all, but a long time ago. Or do you mind if I tell you some stuff from a long time ago? Anyway, so a long time ago. And so Miku launches into her story. Think maybe it is for the best if I quit? She asks lasts. 
And now 15 minutes or more have gone by. I've listened to Miko go on and on about her teenage years because I feel bad about getting her so depressed, but yikes. She's asked me all these questions I don't even understand, but although I'm starting to get sort of fed up with her angst, I keep my patience and respond as best as I can. If you're not doing it, then I don't think you should quit, I tell her. Chances are, if you try to do something else, you're just going to come back to martial arts anyway. Besides, you probably owe it to the person who sent you down this path in the first place. You think so? Maybe you're right. Yeah, I think you are. Miku's face re regained a measure of cheerfulness. Thanks, I'm gonna keep on practicing more and more so I get stronger. I'm not gonna lose to you next time. Uh -huh. I'll keep that in mind. I've got no interest in fighting her again, but for now I'll keep that to myself. Alright then, see you around. With a parting wave, Miku hops to her feet and heads off. As I watch her leave, a feeling of jealousy wells up within me. Did I once have something I was this passionate about? I don't even know because I can't remember. I just can't remember. That gunman, the one with the cane, he might know something about me. And at this point I'm even willing to risk a run-in with a killer to find out more about myself. I decide to head back to where he was before. When I arrive at the alley though, there's nobody there. Paradoxically, I'm both relieved and severely disappointed. Then I happen to notice something lying on the ground. What is it? Look at this photograph. I pick it up. It's a notebook. Slipped into the back cover is a photo showing two boys and a girl. It's either his family or him as a kid. Well, what do I do now? Do I go to the police? How would I even explain the situation? I can see it now. There is a skinner out there and he's after this person named Hitomi Osawa. And then the police would be like, Who is this or that? And who exactly is after her? And then what would I say? Heck, they might not even give me the time of day in the first place. Not only do I not have any idea who Hitomi Osawa is, I know nothing about the guy who is after her except that he walks with a cane. I mean, I can't even tell them who I am. They'll probably shoo me away without a second thought. What am I supposed to do? I hang my head at a total loss. The necklace around my neck sways oddly to and fro. Yeah, the necklace is the key. Out. Okay, I wonder what would have happened if I selected the other option. If I choose not to run for it. I know, if I choose not to hit him. I remain motionless, waiting for an opportunity to run away. I might not make it in time. The man murmurs to himself under his breath. I make it in time for what? I'm curious now, but this is hardly the time or place to try to find out more. I've learned for certain that I'm not Hitomi Otawa, Osawa. It just basically tells me nothing. I'm right back at square one, figuring out who I am. The assassin has gone quiet, sitting on a pile of crates. He seems lost in thought. Still, I don't dare to try to get away. All I can do is stand and wait, and mull over my own situation. That's who I am I? John Voljohn? I ask myself again and again. I am. I am. I am. No, I have business with you. 
man finally says, Go. Don't worry. I won't follow you. I wonder if I can believe him. Maybe he's just trying to get me off my guard so he can shoot me in the back. Do not go to the police or go back home. He continues. Lay low by yourself somewhere for a while. How long is a while? Until around sundown. This should all be over by then. Will all be over? I have no idea what is is. But I decide not to pay Brian in case he decides to change his mind. Okay, I'm going to run away now. Sure. I take a slow step backward. I'm starting to turn away when he speaks up again. Before you go, I need to tell you one more thing. What's that? When you get your memories back, I'm sure you're going to hate me. And so I apologize in advance. Of course, I have no idea what he's talking about, but it makes me even more uneasy. I truly am sorry. I got no response for that, so I'll just give the man one last lick before I turn and run. I decided to look for some place to hide out for a while, as the comment suggested. And since I don't really know my left from my right in this town, it's easier said than done. Before I realize it, I've made my way back to the knickknack shop where I brought the necklace. Maybe I could hide out in here. As I contemplate that possibility, I hear an all too familiar voice. Tama, 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 Tama. There's been Sayanagishi on the floor of the shop. He's been tied up with some rope. What happened, boss? Look, this is all just. I was framed. Hey, Blues, how are you? How have you been? How was your Sunday? How was your Monday? So far, well, yeah. We are starting with the uh, Bonder session, I guess. Busy day. It's good to be busy sometimes. Yeah, he tried to steal a laptop and he got caught. We've had a lot of uh, deaths today. Stabbing, explosion, um, among other things. Well, stabbing, explosion, um, sleeping pill overdose, uh, mental breakdown, and a few other things. All fun. Now, whatever happened, I'm pretty sure it was all his fault. Let's call it a hunch. He says I'm a thief. Well, I say he is a thief for selling stuff he finds around town. Hey, the sales clerk steps into view is calling. It's what are you implying? What in the world is going on here? Yeah, it's basically just another day of me streaming this. A lot of deaths. And some of my predictions have been right so far, so it's all good. Well, most of my predictions. Actually, all of my predictions so far. I haven't the foggiest. Tama, help me. Please. And I guess that kicks and squirms like a hyperactive child. Do you know this man? The sales clerk asks. No, well, I mean, sorta. He's a real pain. He's been making a scene like this for as long as he's been here. I always play weird games. I don't know if I will even be able to finish it in the next few days. I'm guessing it's... The ending is at night, maybe 7, 8 p.m. And I'm still at 3 p.m. We start at 10 o'clock, so 10 o'clock was the shortest as well. It's almost really starting at 11. So I don't know if we have already had well over 20 hours in this. I find it hard to imagine a worse way to interfere with someone's business. I hate to ask. The clerk continues. But could you take him to the police for me? The police? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, the police. The gunman specifically warned me not to go to them. 
I feel no loyalty to that killer, but I am reluctant to do antagonize him. And for reasons I can't explain, I have a strong sense that going to the police right now is a bad move. But basically, Yanagishita is privy to my thoughts, and he looks up at me with a hopeful gleam in his eye. Yeah, that will work. Tama can take me to the police. And then we can put this all behind us. All is well that ends well, right? Um, well, sure. Feeling like I have no choice, I leave the shop with him. Okay. Mr. Yanagishita says excitedly as soon as we are out of earshot. Now let's go find Chiri. Huh? Aren't we going to the pool? What? No. We're not really gonna go. Oh man, I'm so so glad you showed up, Tama. Now come on, let's go find Chiri. From the big grin on his face, I have an inkling of what's coming next. You thought of another get rich quick scheme, haven't you? Goodness, Tama, you can see right through me. Uh, it's not that difficult. Practically written all over your face, boss. Mr. Yanagishita isn't really listening. He's too full of enthusiasm. This time, I got a line on 10 million yen. Come on, let's go make ourselves stinking rich. He punctuates his grand announcement by pointing fervently at some non-existent listener. He's looking at me. Okay, that's a bad ending then. Several weeks later. Iron Stomach, a celebration of truly astonishing appetites, when the mighty stomach triumphs over the... Over the endless cavalcade of icebergs, the hero shall be blessed with fame and fortune. I stand with Chiri on the winner's podium. The cheers and applause are deafening when the master of ceremonies makes the announcement. Chiri is the champion. She laughs with delight as she holds up the trophy that signifies her 10 million yen win. And me, I got runner-up. I wasn't too into the idea at first, but after giving it a shot, I found that professional gluttony kind of grows on you. Well, you grow on it, not the other way around. Even I was surprised by how much I could eat, and I had to admit it felt kind of good. My memory still hasn't come back, but that doesn't matter anymore. I found myself a new purpose. Eating. The sealed cherry spot on the throne. That right there is now my greatest goal in life. Hey, that's a happy ending. Throne of Gluttony. Tama never got her memories back, she ended up starting a new life on the competitive eating circuit. Which may not be a horrible fate, but wouldn't it be better if she recovered her old life as Maria? When she was cornered in the alley by the man with the cane, there was someone who could have turned up and helped her out. Anagishita. But he can't do that if he ends up getting tied up in the knickknack shop. Really? But... The other choice I did was... Well, let's try the other choice back again. We, we chose to attack him the first time. Okay, let's attack him. That took me to a keep out. Yeah, keep out here. Um, where is Yanagishita headed?
when I pick this, I ran to the area and then went to the knickknack shop. What if I go to the Endo Electronics? Probably was headed to Endo Electronics. Was the only local place he could think of that might buy a second-hand computer. Damn. The guy had led him on a wild goose chase. Okay, still the same direction, no? Rikawa started running toward Dogenzaka. Hmm? As he approached the scramble outside the station, he caught sight of a skinny figure spearing into the throng alongside, along center guy. A suit with deep bluish stripes. There was only one man he knew who dressed like that. Or why was he heading down center guy and not toward Dogenzaka? Oh, and now he remembered. It was a second-hand knick-knack shop near where the Burning Hammer demo had been held. He recalled seeing a poster out front that read, We buy computers at top prices. That one. It looks slightly different, this, this choice. That had to be it. That's where Yanagishita was planning on selling his laptop. Changing directions, Minrakawa darted down center guy. Okay, but this is... This doesn't change anything though. Doesn't change a thing. Still a bad ending. Um, what if here I choose to change the scene? Alright, my bad. I'll just switch over to a different camera. He continued switching views, scanning the streets of Shibuya, but there was no sign of a blue minivan anywhere. Okay, it doesn't really matter. Still the remain glued to the monitor. And then her phone rings, yeah. Okay, so this doesn't matter. Um... We punched him. Would not punching him make a difference? I'm the one who deserves to get hit. Thinking about Sasama, Kano couldn't help but feel guilty. If I weren't such a bumbling clod, Sasama would never have. Don't blame yourself. You guys have been doing better than I expected. More sarcasm yet. Okay, so this also doesn't matter. Okay, the, the choice here, we need to make that. This one doesn't seem to matter at all. Unless picking... The knickknack shop. Only well, headed to a knickknack shop when you recall seeing one near the burning hammer demo site. Also recall seeing a poster outside, yeah, we buy computers at top prices, yeah. I had led him on a wild goose chase, and he runs left. That shop was surely where he was going to sell the laptop. Gulping a deep breath, he headed in that direction. It's, it's still the same thing. Hmm. We need Miku, but how do I even get Miku to... Okay, we need Miku, but to get Miku, I think we need Yanagishita here. To get Yanagishita here, he needs to be not involved with him at all.
Okay, if I pick this again, I know this is a bad ending. This doesn't change that either. No, wait a minute, what? Back to the alley. Do I still get... A keep out? Probably still the keep out. Yep. All right. So here we'll pick the other choice so we don't run into Archie and Hitomi. And then I think there was a choice for Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember. I know where to, where to go now. Um, what's here? Sister, yes. This is how to unlock a keep out. It's gonna ask what about her sister. There we go. Now we can jump over. Eventually, I muster up the energy to start walking around town, heading nowhere in particular. The billboard outside of a department store displays a poster of some female musician. She must be pretty popular because lots of passers-by stop to take a good look. Oh, that's her. I can't hide if a little, a little Hannah in front of the billboard. She's showing something to a woman. Uh, the woman there, some colorful sheets of paper. Mm hmm? The woman looks a lot like the musician in the poster. So they had her show up in-game. Yeah, advertising. Moreover, I have the feeling I've seen her someplace before. Where could I have seen her? And having amnesia is really a pain in the ass. I have no way of knowing whether I've gotten, forgotten something or had no memory of it in the first place. The woman looks through the paper Hannah held out to her, nodding approvingly at each one, and I can hear her murmur with admiration. Hannah. I wave as I scamper on over to her. As I do, the woman abruptly hurries off. Well, is she selling... Is that poetry? Seems to be. Just drinking some water. Hey, we meet again. Hannah just gives me a bored look. Who was that just now? I asked. I don't know. Hannah quickly gathers up her belongings and starts walking briskly away. Oh, hey, wait up. Yeah, I always have water. Especially when you're streaming a game like this, where you're reading constantly for several hours. The girl ignores me. She's moving at a jog now, heading from Spanish Hill towards Comendori. Ah. As she steps out into Comendori, she trips and falls down hard. The contents of her bag spills out on the road. Oh, whoops. Catching up to her, I gather up some of the fallen pages. What's this? There are poems written on the colored paper. I did say poetry. Copies of prose poem titled The Falls Monsoon. The poem del delicately details the wavering emotions of an adolescent girl. Also in a clever twist, if the text is read horizontally instead of vertically, it tells about a father's worries over his only daughter who is now of marriageable age. 
Anna's genius will soon be discovered by Aya Kameki, and she will go on to become a popular songwriter. But a look of embarrassment crosses Hannah's face, and she snatches the pages out of my hands. Don't touch those. Those are for sale. For sale? For selling poems that I wrote. Oh wow, that's incredible. She looks surprised by the compliment. Incredible? My friends at school say they were dumb. Well, if your friends think they themselves are dumb, then who are you to argue with them? That's not true. I only saw a little just now, but I thought it was a really good point. You're just saying that. I've been out here in Shibuya for weeks trying to sell these, but the only person who's bought one was that lady just now. Okay, yeah, I'm just saying that. Bye. And walk away, please. Hannah lets out a mournful sigh. Well, what are you out here deciding points for anyway? For money? What else? I thought maybe it would help pay back our debts. Huh? Okay, that's not something I'd expect to hear from a little kid. My dad's in real deep. She continues, the topic makes me think of Mr. Yanagishita. Yesterday is my, yesterday is my uh, day for meeting people mired in that. Well, you're rich, you wouldn't know what that is. Not that you even remember what that is. And I'm only in elementary school, so I can't get a part-time job. Japan's Labor Standards Act prohibits the hiring of children under the age of 15. For certain jobs within the entertainment industry, however, employers can obtain permission from the Labor Standards Inspection Office for younger children to work. And then they ship them off to the mines. And then they get a few miners. I'm impressed. She's so brave. She's maybe a little hard to approach, but she is just a kid after all. She's so brave, I just want to give her a hug. Oh, Hannah. I hear a strange waning call from behind me. Startled, I turn around to see Mr. Toyama standing there, tears streaming from his eyes. Oh, Hannah. I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were trying so hard to. Toyama rushes up to the girl. It's quite the emotional father daughter reunion. Or at least that's how it looks until Hannah slaps her father across the face with her bundle of papers. Ooh, ooh, what was that for? Don't you give me that. I'm sick of all this running around. Look at that smile. She delivers several more well-placed smacks with her little craft project. Okay, okay. Tayama says at last. I know you're upset, but I have to ask you for just one thing. And then we can see about getting through the day, yeah? Okay, but just one. Can't help but find this ornery interaction kind of charming. You two get along really well, don't you, I say? Yep. Nope. The two would give simultaneous contradictory replies. And Hannah suddenly starts to walk off with Toyama tottering after her. It's such a weird little sight that I can't help but laugh. Well, later then... Oh. Well. <laughs> And she ends up in hell. Basement floor number one. Oh, it fell on her. Nice. She's dead, Jim. Or oh, not. She's still alive. Further along Koendori, I come across a car on the roadside that's spectacularly aflame. A group of onlookers surrounds it in a confused uproar. 
It seems almost unreal, like I'm looking at a set for TV show or something. I stand there staring into the flames. Huh? What's that? I can see something. Oh, she's remembering something. Raging heat makes the air shimmer. The scent of dry sand fills my nose. A gust of soaring wind tugs at my hair. Where? Where am I? I wonder where she is. We're gonna find out after taking a break. Last break of the day. My throat is sore. And I think it's about time to take that break. Oh, my back. I'm gonna stretch and I'm gonna play some music and run some ads. I'll be back in like three to five minutes, so stick around.
Alright, I'm back. So, this is probably a memory of her when she met Kenan. So, let's see. Decaying roads, decaying houses, a decaying city. And the people who live there, people who live, people who live, people who live. You got some cookies? What kind of cookies? Raisins? Chocolate chips? Hey Neko, you mentioned cookies, Neko shows up. How are you today? Having a good Sunday? How traditional are traditional cookies? Everybody love cookies. Cookie, 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 cookie. I haven't baked cookies in a while. I used to bake them more regularly. I used to sell cookies at... Uh, events and stuff when uh, I have the chance whether it's in school or university made quite a bit of money that way overpriced oh you let yourself uh, let it all out in the gym Yeah, I haven't been to a gym in a while. I really should, but I tend to just do all my exercise elsewhere when I do it. I think the last gym I had a membership with was maybe Gold's Gym back in Malaysia in 20... no, 2003 maybe. And I stopped going because I found out that most of the people training there were apparently uh, the people mugging in the area. That wasn't really fun. I didn't get mugged, but my friend did. I once took him there to show him around the place in case he wanted a membership. And suddenly his face went pale and said, uh, oh, just let's just leave. I said, why? He just said, no, let's just leave. We left and then he said, you saw those guys sitting around there? I said, yes. He's like, with the trainer, and I say yes. Said, oh, those were the guys who mugged me right outside my house last week. So I never went back there. And they kept uh, chasing me up to pay for subsequent months that I never signed up for. And that was fun. I never paid. Because I didn't go, I mean, I never re renewed my membership. And apparently they were notorious for doing that. But yeah, that's my gym story. By the way, Neko, what, have, you, have you stopped streaming completely? Because I haven't seen you stream in quite some time. Or you just haven't had the time for it. <laughs> Let me take a sip of water. Because we're going to be reading for another hour or two. There is someone by my side. Someone is with me watching all of this. Yeah, they keep hiding the face. I am certain that the one claiming to be Kenan is actually Alfred and that's not really her. It's it's a girl. It's a healthy baby girl.
tight schedule, yeah. Just throw caution to the wing and wind and become a full-time streamer. That's the only solution. Don't do it. Not until you're really sure that's the thing you want to do. I know some people who just gave it up and decided, hey, I'm going to stream without even really starting streaming before making that decision and it, not, it did not go well. The person with me is a girl slightly younger than me. She says something to me. Anna, it's me. Dance Cradle. That's my voice now. Dance Cradle. Whose voice was that? What's going on? Where am I talking to? Yeah, Cat's Cradle. I'm showing someone how to do a Cat's Cradle with streams. But who? Where am I showing how to do a Cat's Cradle? It's Kenan. There you go. Yeah, the classic treadmill. Get to work, you don't enjoy, come back. Pay pills, yeah, bills you have to pay for and rinse and repeat. I just don't know if it, I think it's just an issue with the system, and I always come back to that point. It's uh, the system needs to change. People not really earning enough for the amount of work they do. Not ending up paying, uh, well, living comfortably enough. Livable wage is different from minimum wage. But a lot of companies don't care for that. Or governments don't care for that either. The word Kenyan echoes in my head. Kenan, I uttered the name aloud. The images floating through my mind are beginning to break up and vanish, but I feel like, for a brief moment at least, I'd caught hold of the edges of some of my lost memories. Uh, what? Why is what is that lady looking at on the right? She's definitely not looking forward. I got that Neko. And it's kind of difficult if to even sometimes uh, earn new skills or learn new skills, I should say, or try and change the line of work you work in or something like that because if you barely have the money then you don't really and the time then you don't really get to do much in terms of uh, self-improvement either and not to mention um, the person just, would just feel too drained to do any of that I've been there That's right, Kenan. As soon as I say it, I'm filled with a powerful sense of duty. It's something I'm responsible for, something that I needed to do. And if I don't, this Kenan person is going to be in grave danger. Calm down. Just calm down. I'm pleading with myself now, fighting the impulse to take off running. If I did, where would I go? I have no idea what my destination or my goal even is. 
Please, please remember something. Please, please. I gaze out at the flames, practically praying now. And then I sacrifice the passers-by in the flames. Don't move. My voice hisses in my ear, and I feel something hard presses against my back. Is that a gun, or is he just happy to see me? I don't need to turn around to recognize whose voice it is. I thought you said you didn't have any business with... I did a little thinking. Says the man with a cane slowly. About how I might lure out Hitomi Osawa, see? I'm going to use you as bait. It's not like he's going to shoot you out in the open. Okay. It seems like the scenes are ending earlier than you expected. Okay, how am I going to continue these... Uh... I think what we definitely need to do is unlock this. But where? How? Nothing we do here can really change anything, I think. The saw is stuck here. Maybe... Maybe if I refuse to listen to the music, something will be different. As silly as that sounds. Thank you. Right now, Osawa preferred silence to unfamiliar music. I see. How about something like this then? The detective pulled a digital music player out of his pocket. Here you go. Dubiously, Osawa slipped the attached earbuds into his ears. But. Isn't this the same? You heard the gentle sound of surf. Oh, okay, it's not the same. The simple rhythm of waves crashing and receding drew him in. He listened with unexpected pleasure. Time went by, comfortably, as if he were standing alone on some remote beach. He took a deep breath, then expelled it through his nostrils. It felt as if the toxic gloom that had filled him was departing with the air. Before he knew it, nearly ten minutes had passed. What do you think? It's quite nice. Alright, listen to this. Listen to this a lot when I can't sleep. Even Kajiwara's voice sounded somewhat soothing to Asawa now. Thank you, detective. I'd forgotten what it was like to feel this way. He spoke the, uh, the words unthinkingly, with unaccustomed frankness. Shall be happy to hear that, sir. Osawa gazed at one of the postcards as he gave his body over to the sound of the soaring sea, and he's gonna talk about the sand yet. Yeah. It's the same thing, then. Oh, but somehow it isn't. Lived all my life, learning so many things, slipped through my fingers, yeah. We know that. This is the same thing that was said before. Anyone who's worked hard, yeah. Accomplishing something means getting results, that's not what my problem is.
Okay, not hide anything from you. Okay. It's still the keep out. Hmm. How am I going to solve this? What happens if I don't hit him? Or ask if it. No thanks, I'll be fine. Hitting this man wasn't going to make Kano feel any better. Stanley's expression remained unchanged. It's not like I don't understand why you wanted to punch the guy, he said quietly. If I don't have to question him, I wouldn't have stopped you. Kano wasn't sure what to make of that. Are you encouraging me? Stanley held his arms wide. I don't know, maybe. Okay, it's the same thing then. That did not change anything. What if we bump? What if we carry the girl? Then what then? I'm kind of just doing trial and error at this point. Caught the girl up in his arms. Archie hurriedly caught the girl up in his arms. Maneuver kept her out of harm's way, but the momentum swung her high onto the air. She dropped a sheet of paper she was carrying. Uh, as luck would have it, the papers fell amidst the trash scattered alongside the road. I'm sorry. Archie stopped together of the sheets of paper, noting that each was adorned with some sort of writing. Yeah, looks like they got kinda messed up though. Pages had landed on some kind of spilled liquid. Most of them had gotten stained. It's alright. The girl said gloomily. We should just throw them away. It's not like I can sell them now anyway. You going to sell them? I'm sorry. You think you'll be able to redo them? Actually, is there a stationary store near here? Yeah, up at the top of Dogenzaka. Um, here. He took a 5,000 yen note from his wallet and offered it to the girl. To buy new paper. I know I can't replace the stuff you wrote, but... The girl eyed the money doubtfully. But... It's fine, go ahead, take it. Thank you very much. The little girl spoke with surprising formality. Then she turned and ha headed up Dogenzaka. Archie gathered up the trash and tossed it into a garbage bin before he and Hitomi continued on the way. So this means Ayakamiki wouldn't see the... wouldn't see her. And Maria's story would be slightly different. Is this a good thing? I don't know. Alright, she muscles the energy, sees the poster, billboard I should say. Billboard outside department store displays a poster of some female musician. Am I just imagining things? I feel like I saw the same poster somewhere very recently. Standing underneath the sign is a woman talking on her cell phone. It sounds like she's having an argument with whoever's on the line. I don't want to be nosy, so I just pass on by. As I come out of, uh, co onto Koindori, I gradually come to a halt. I'm a little tired from all this aimless wandering around. I let my gaze stay stray along the street as I consider my next move. Then I catch sight of a blue minivan parked across the street. Oh, suddenly my heart starts pounding. I know this. I know this minivan, or oh, I'm gonna die then. If I head over to it, I'm sure I remember something. Yep, she's gonna die now. As I pull by some huge magnet, I make my way toward the vehicle. Fucking magnets, how do they work? Hey, 
As the sudden thunderous boom, I'm knocked flat by a blast of energy, and the world goes all topsy-turvy. As I lie in shock, a wave of unfamiliar images fills my mind. Cloud of whirling dust in some place that is, is in Japan. A simple room with unfamiliar architecture. A girl. And I know the girl's name. Her name is John Cena. On the verge of their revelation, my consciousness fades away, and it's a bad end. A sudden blast. Marie arrived on Coindori just in time to get caught in the minivan explosion. If she's going to avoid this fate, she needs to stay away from that vehicle. Someone else's actions can ensure that Hana Toyama crosses paths with her again. Maria will take a talk to her and avoid the minivan. Alright, so that just gave us an, another bad end. How am I going to do that though? Leap to one side, yes. So this will take me back to Maria, to be continued. We just need somebody all the way down there. The problem is this is a dead end. Chasing Yanagishita led me to Rakawa to the wrong place at the exactly wrong time. This wouldn't have happened if Yanagishita hadn't run when he did. The MMA fighter Miku Morita comes into the knickknack shop to interrupt their argument and things might turn out differently. But how would we make her come in here? How the hell am I going to get Miku in here is what I want to know. Because Maria met her, but at the same time, there's no choice. him okay taking the banana or not taking the banana it doesn't matter um this jump is locked out uh How the heck am I going to solve this? this jump. 
There's a jump here that we can't do. Okay, maybe... Let's try something else. How about... Here. Don't make a run for it. Stay around so we don't actually talk to Miku. Then try jumping. Miku is not caught up now. I mean, yeah, that that's the thing that made it. Okay, head to the knickknack shop. We're hitting him now, and I'm guessing Miku. But then someone else came into the shop. Yanagishita's eyes lit up as they saw who he was. Oh my angel. Whatever is my darling Miku doing here? Miku stood at the doorway, on the verge of tears. M Mr. Minrikawa? She began, then her voice choked up. Miku, what's the matter? Is something wrong? I... I... Miku drew in close to Minurikawa's side. Oh? Oh! Managishita's gaze darted back and forth between Minurikawa and Miku. You two know each other? Sort of, more to the point. Is she the girl you said you were in love with? That's right. The one and only Miku. Isn't she, like, a teenager? I have her entrance music set as my ringtone. Paying no heed to Yanagishita's excitement, Miku kept her eyes fixed on Minorikawa. I am lost to a girl who knows Aki Jujutsu. I lost. She buried her face in Minorikawa's chest. Meanwhile, I'm guessing, uh... He's crying. Why not? Ugh. And I guess she just let out a gasp. What's this about? What is... What in the world? What in the what is this all about? He seemed on the verge of panic. M Mr. Minorikawa, I need to learn Aiki Jujutsu. I feel so ashamed. She buried her face even deeper into Minurikawa's chest. That's... Oh, that's... That's... That's so unfair. With tears in his eyes, Yanagishita darted out the door. Minurikawa glared after the pathetic fellow as he scampered off. The guy sure knows how to take advantage of a bad situation. I'll give him that. Murmured. Can't let him get away. I'm gonna catch him and hand him over to police. No, if I do that, I'm still gonna die, right? Anyway, I'm just glad I got my partner back. Ordinarily, he'd be inclined to pursue Yanagishita and subject him to a tirade. At the very least, at the very least, but there was no time for that now. 
He explained the situation to the shopkeeper, who flashed a sympathetic smile. Ah, is that so? Lucky for you, he screwed up then. Much as I am happy to do business, I just can't buy a computer that doesn't come with this accessory. So you would have bought it from him if he had the accessories? Of course. Stolen or not, it's all the same once I've sold it. The shopkeeper chuckled unapologetically. Really? He has no sense of, you know, ethics at all. Oh, I suppose that's true. I mean, Rikawa laughed along with him. Yeah, all the same. Like hell it is, he roared. The shopkeeper froze like a startled rabbit. I bet everything you have here for sale has been stolen, hasn't it? Don't, don't be ridiculous. I warn you up front, there's no use hiding things from me. I've interviewed you after all. I know you. The shopkeeper was getting more and more flustered. Oh, well, I mean... Look, this is just between you and me, okay? Sometimes I go around gathering stuff that people have lost and I sell it here. When it's not stolen, it's repurposed. There's nothing wrong with that, right? The shopkeeper smiled ingratiatingly. You moron. Minrakawa stuck his finger in the man's face. Selling lost property is a serious crime too. Potential violation of Article 254 of the Penal Code of Japan regarding embezzlement of lost property, which states a person who embezzles lost property, drift property, or any other property which belongs to another person and is in no one's possession, shall be punished by imprisonment with work for not more than one year, a fine of not more than 100,000 yen, or a petty fine. Give me a second, I am gonna adjust the air conditioning, it's really cold now. Since it got fixed, it's uh, a lot colder. It, it is? Well, I mean, I guess I sort of figured it might be sometimes. Well, I'm not the police. I'm more into curiosity than legality. In fact, I find this all pretty fascinating. I mean, what sort of things have you gathered up for sale? Well, let me see. Like this, and that, and that, and that. The man pointed at various items on his shelves. And also this, and that, 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 I guess. Yurikawa's eyes was directed all over the shop. Everything the shopkeeper had pointed out had a hefty price tag. And you were actually able to sell things like this? Yurikawa asked. Sure, I can sell stuff. Earlier today, someone bought a big necklace. I'd listed it for 40,000 yen, but I discounted it down to 30,000. And you can still make a profit even offering discounts. I mean, he didn't pay for it. Of course, it's a profit. 100% profit. Sure, I mean, it was just something I found lying on the ground, after all. <laughs> Rikawa looked back at him, and for a moment, he laughed as well. Then his face turned hard. This is no laughing matter, he bellowed. You need to stop what you're doing here right now. Miku is just standing there. Otherwise, you're going to find out what it's like to get punished by my pen of justice. Pen of justice, is that his name for his penis? I'm, I'm sorry, so sorry. The shopkeeper, shopkeeper bowed repeatedly. When Urakawa glared, the truth was that right now he was so busy he'd have to let this guy slide. Still, this whole S9 affair had eaten up a big chunk of time he didn't have to waste. He was going to have to finish up his copy back at the editing office. Left up in hand, he left the shop, only to stop short when a slight figure stepped out in front of him. Mr. Minurikawa. Miku stood there, barring his bow. Please introduce me to a dojo where I can learn Aiki Jiu Jitsu. I'm sorry. I really don't have the time for this right now. And Rikawa tried to hurry onward, but she stubbornly refused to let him pass. I think I, I know somebody who had this uh, shirt. 
I think I'm pretty sure I do know somebody. You introduced me to that other doja before, remember? I suppose so, now that you mention it. He tried to slip by her on her right hand side, but she was quick to block him. I love how all the tears in this game are all fake. Graphical effects. You're the one who introduced me to the world of martial arts, Mr. Minrikawa. Well, yes, you know you're putting me in a bit of a bind here. Right to slip by on her left was a no-go too. She could anticipate his every move. Please, just hear me out, Miku said. She was speaking through quiet sobs now. I can't stand to leave things like this. She looked Minurikawa right in the eye. Sorry, I'll just have to persevere until you're able to win again. This is a good opportunity for you. You can find something to do with your life that is in martial arts. Well, I'm sorry, but I really don't have the time to have this discussion right now. Hmm, what should I pick? Let's go with B. This is a good opportunity for you. You can find something to do with yourself that is in martial arts. What? You were the champion at that one pub, right? Maybe now that you're done with that, you should find a more girlish line of work instead. Wow. Wow, Minrikawa. Just wow. Miku began to tremble. Y you jerk. Miku delivered a blindingly fast slap to Minurikawa's cheek. Why do you have to bid it like that? You're so mean. Bursting into tears, Miku ran off. Hey, Miku. She gave no sign she had heard him and didn't turn around. Minurikawa rubbed his cheek. It stunk. For once, he actually regretted what he had said. Maybe he shouldn't have assumed she'd be willing to just give up her hobby. He did in fact know several Aiki Jujutsu dojos. If only he had the time, he could have introduced her easily enough. Checking his watch, he saw that he only had 30 minutes and changed until 4 o'clock. There was no more wiggle room at this point. These articles needed to get written and fast. He needed to get back to the editing department. And yet... Oh damn it, all to hell, I can't get work done like this. And Rikawa broke into a run. But he didn't run for Heaven Publishing, instead he went after Miku. And that's the keep out, yep. And we already know about the keep out from the other one. And now we can continue this. Something else I was kind of far in the area, something's wrong, kind of thought. That's no ordinary city noise. And it's an explosion. Yes, yes. A column of black smoke rose up from between two nearby buildings, passes by stopped, right? Stared. And they ran. Then Kano saw flames, this hadn't been an accident. Someone had set off an explosion. Several people were on the ground nearby, evidently injured by the detonation. Mr. Minurikawa, Mr. Minurikawa. A high school aged girl was crying, clinging tightly to a man who had been caught in the blast. Kano recognized her as the girl he had talked to earlier during the traffic jam. The man looked like he might still be alive. Kano hurried over to them. Police, he announced. Blood was streaming from the man's mouth. They clearly suffered some internal damage. Hang in there, buddy, Kano told him. Stay with us. The man's face twisted up in pain, but somehow he managed to croak out a few words. Kano let out a gasp. The man's voice was almost too weak to hear. What he said still shook Kano to the core. 
This man knew something important. Something. Something crucial to the investigation. It's a bad end, obviously. Rescue vehicles arrived at the scene, and the wounded man was promptly loaded onto a stretcher. When he was placed inside the ambulance, Kano flashed his bed to the paramedics and got in alongside him. The man had already fallen unconscious. Kano didn't know when he'd wake up back up, but he knew he needed to hear what the guy had to say. He sensed that the stranger was the key to unlocking the entire case. But though Kano kept a lonely vigil, the man never woke again. The antiviral that had been given to Hitomi, the blue minivan El Karawan told Hitomi to look for, and now the minivan exploding. Kano was sure this man had known all, how all of these tied together, but now the key to solving the case was gone for good. Bad end. Blown lead. Kano tried to get information from a man who was caught in the explosion, Minurikawa, but he arrived too late. Minurikawa hadn't been caught in the blast, things would have gone differently for Kano. At 3.30, somebody shouts something, and depending on what they shout, both Kano's and Minurikawa's fates may change. 3.30 Oh, Maria's story is also different. Okay, she doesn't know who she is. So who am I? John Cena. And then he shakes her. Tama! Tama! Oh! That is a rescue. Um, do I want that though? Um... I'm wondering if this... Wait, if he's tracking the man, then maybe he will find... Uh... We'll see the sister. Yep, yeah. continue. Weedoo rushed into a knick-knack shop on center guy soon after the man with the coat appeared and followed him into the shop. Yep, yeah, snatched the guy's laptop. Moments later, the weirdo came rushing back out of the shop and sprinted away again. He wove through the narrow alleyways with a cat-like alacrity. Ashi did his best to keep tabs on him, but the man managed to give him the slip. Damn it. Ow, Hitomi said she too had been watching closely. Kind of impressed. Why if I keep at it? Ashi asked. Sure. He continued scanning camera images, trying to locate the guy again. At this point, even Hitomi was invested in the quest to find the fugitive. And they forgot all about the van and it's a bad ending, is it? But minutes passed and they didn't spot him, Archie was on the verge of giving up. Oh, that's me. Hitomi took out her cell phone. Is an email for Mr. Tana? Found him. Archie's shot cut Hitomi off. The guy was in a back alley, off of center guy, exactly was talking with someone. Huh, is that? Archie blinked a few times as he leaned in closer to the screen. You told me you have to come look at this. Huh? That's... that's my sister. Tommy brinned with excitement. For real? I think so. What's she doing in a place like... Oh, what's she doing in a place like that? And why is she talking to that guy? I'm not sure. I wanted to show it a cheerful little scene. Looks like they're having fun. Their sister twins are both into older guys. Achi felt his mood start to sour. Really? I have to ask, are you sure she was kidnapped? 
Yes, at least I sure thought that so, and so did the police. Then what this is all about? Should we go and see for ourselves? Guess so. Oh, what about that email? Archie pointed at Hitomi's cell phone. Shouldn't you take a look at that? My sister comes first. That place where she is, is it far from here? No, not particularly. Alright, are they gonna get shot by... Archie and Hitomi rushed from the building, heading for the alley where Maria was talking to the, compu the computer thief. It wasn't long before they were closing in on their destination. As they headed down a narrow side street, the familiar figure suddenly appeared to bother way. Yep. Uh oh, it's him. Gun in hand, the man with the cane slowly ambled towards him. Archie and Hitomi bolted down a nearby alley. Taking another turn, they reached the alley they had seen on the cameras. Maria! Hitomi rushed over to her sister. But Maria just stood staring at Hitomi in silence, as if she couldn't process what was going on. Meanwhile, the assassin was still in pursuit, yet turned the corner behind them and was steadily drawing nearer. He pointed the gun at Hitomi's head. Come on, hurry, Archie urged. He tried to lead the two girls away, hoping to escape further down the alley. But instead, Maria charged boldly at the man with a cane. This is me controlling Archie. But I'm guessing this is a bad end. The assassin was caught off guard by the unexpected counterattack, but he reacted quickly, clubbing the girl in the head with the grip of his pistol. And is that blood? Maria, Hitomi shrieked. She stared in horror as her sister collapsed in a heap on the ground. Then Hitomi's eyes rolled back in her head, and she fainted into Archie's arms. Welcome back, Fred. Hitomi, hey. But the shock had overwhelmed her, she was out cold. Slowly, the assassin lifted his gun again, aiming for Archie and Hitomi. If he had only had Hitomi to protect, Archie might have been able to pick her up and get away. But he couldn't just leave her sister here. He knew, with the chilling certainty of despair, that he could never save them both. That's a bad end. Yep. Sisters in the alley. Finding Maria had seemed like such a stroke of luck, but it led to Archie and Hitomi running right across the killer's path. This never would have happened if Archie hadn't gotten distracted with tracking that weirdo on the cameras. If he had focused on looking for the minivan instead. All he had to do was follow the damn minivan, Archie. But let's see what Maria has to do. Tama! Tama! I am Tama Hitomi, Tama Hitomi, none of the above. Should I call her Tama Hitomi? I am Tama. Tama? I turn in the sound of the exuberant voice and see Mr. Yanagishita running my way, flinging his arm in a friendly greeting. I swear this guy could wind up banished with the pits of hell and he'd still give it his all day in day out. Oh, thank goodness. It is you, Tama. I knew it. The man with the cane grumbles something incoherent, then holsters his gun and flees the scene. Oh, now you're with some middle-aged guy. Oh, it means man. <laughs> it's just a reference to Tamago because she saw the eggs that uh, uh, Chikiri was eating. And, uh, well, no, Chiri was eating. And uh, she just came up with the name Tama from that. 
No, you were some middle-aged guy. You look so sweet and innocent. But I guess you kinda get around, huh? <laughs> oh, it's nice timing. I do a little fist bump. Whatever he's doing here, I'm glad he drove off that guy with a gun. Hmm, what are you so happy about? And I guess that gives me a puzzled look. But he's probably distracted by his own excitement. Well, anyway. Never mind that, Tama. He shifts down to a conspirational, conspiratorial whisper. You know, I am such an idiot. I can't believe I was in such a tizzy over some silly scratch card from a magazine. I can tell he has news he's itching to tell me. Did something happen? Well, <laughs> he brings a hand to his mouth and giggles unsettlingly. I had a great little idea. A great way to strike it rich. I I feel like I've heard this from you before. It's a Yanagishi that shakes his head fervently. This time is different. We're talking way more digits than before. Now try not to be too surprised, okay? Spinner flies from his mouth as he rattles on. Ooh, ah, it's okay to be surprised actually. In fact, I'm guessing you're definitely gonna be amazed this time, Tama. I can practically see the banknotes dancing in his eyes. Cut to the chase already, what is it you want to tell me? This time, get this, I got a line on 10 million yen. He thrusts his index finger skywards, grinning ear to ear. Surprised now? Yeah, you are. And it doesn't require any capital. It's no risk, I return. In the world of equity investment, a wise investor weighs risks against potential for return. Many heavily risky projects, however, yield little in the way of actual returns. Such cases are called high risk, low return. The inverse low risk, high return is quite rare. The idea of no risk, high return is simply absurd. There's a crazy gleam in his eye. One eye, not both eyes. Oh man, I'm finally gonna get to be part of the billionaire's club. That is so ridiculous, I don't even have a snappy retort for it. Never mind that 10 million obviously wouldn't make him a billionaire. By the way, you haven't seen Chiri, have you? We're gonna need her help to wrap up this 10 million yen. Chiri? No, I haven't run into her since the sales demo. Oh darn. Well, if you do happen to see her, tell her to get in touch with me. I'm um, sure, alright. I still don't know what he is going on about, but there's probably no harm in being helpful. Thank you, Tama. Yes, I may as well give you a little hint. Uh, a hint? Yeah, yeah. A hint. Wanna hear it? Oh, um, sure. Thank you. Or no, not particularly. What do you guys think? Sure, thank you. I, uh, it's the ice cream eating, thousand scoops. Well then, I guess I've got no choice. When you put it that way, I just have to tell you. So Jan Kishida clears his throat and proceeds to declaim in an affected tone. When the mighty stomach triumphs over the endless cavalcade of icebergs, the hero shall be blessed with fame and fortune. Huh? What the heck is that supposed to mean? He looks inordinately amused at my confusion. It's part of a legend. You only need to remember that one verse for now. You're going to bear witness to history. I feel like this guy's right out of some kind of story himself.
Anyway, thanks for helping me out with that cheery thing. Adios. Spanish for goodbye. The true meaning is closer to the English, farewell. In day-to-day -day interactions, most Spanish speakers use the word ciao. Adios can carry the connotation that you do not expect to see the addressee again. And then, like a whirlwind, Mr. Yanagishita zooms away, leaving me alone in the alley. Yeah. Suddenly I feel totally exhausted. I let out a sigh and drop my eyes, and that's when I notice a notebook on the ground at my feet. Dick Diary. Did the assassin drop this? I pick it up and look inside. If it's a dick diary, then we know who it is. No, it's not the dick diary. Well, it could be the dick diary, actually. But it just has a picture. Is that a photograph? Look at this photograph! There's a photograph tucked inside the back cover. It shows three young people, two boys and a girl. Well, what do I do now? Do I go to the police? How would I even explain the situation? Okay, we already know this. What am I supposed to do? I hang my head at the total loss. Necklace around my neck sways oddly but at to and fro. Is it a keep out? It is a keep out. You know the funny thing is Twitch and YouTube don't flag me for copyright for using that sound clip. Okay, we have a lot of keep outs now. I wonder if hitting him would actually change something. I don't know if there is a limit, an upper limit or something. I've had some, um, I've had a lot of copyright claims on YouTube actually. But, um, but most of them don't have any impact because um, apparently the person who owns their copyrights doesn't actually make a fuss about it. But uh, the opening for Metal Gear Solid 3 is flagged. Uh, things like um, the music this guy listens to because it's by a real singer it gets flagged but none of it got uh, muted and I didn't get a warning on YouTube on Twitch on the other hand none of these triggered anything but some soundtracks that I play during the break does the good thing about YouTube though is let's say you have 25 seconds of um, copyrighted music Twitch would not do 25 seconds, it would do longer than 25. It takes extra time from the beginning and extra time from the end. So you might end up getting longer parts if you stream muted. YouTube on the other hand, it just allows you to mute that bit or even just chop it up from the middle and take it away. Yeah, you did say you wanted to stream Fred. What happened to that? You said next year, last year. And now it's this year. All right, if we do here, um, hold on. There is a keep out. What if I jump over? Yep, jump over to Maria. These are all bad ends. Suddenly, I hear someone call out. Maria. Huh? I spin around to see a young girl running toward me. She, she kind of looks like me. Wait, it's the same actress. Behind her are two men. One of them is the man with the cane. 
He raises his gun and aims it at her. Oh no, he's coming to shoot her. The instant I realize what he's doing, I'm lunging toward him. He shifts his grip on the gun and clumps me in the head, like a baby seal. I stagger against the wall, trying to keep my feet, but my legs buckle under me, and I crumble on the spot. I don't even know why I try to protect this girl. She's ugly, even though she looks like me. My body just moved on its own. Maybe it was just a reflexive impulse to help someone in danger. But... Am I the sort of person who'd risk her life to protect someone completely stranger? Complete stranger? Bad end. Protecting the girl. Maria's impulse to protect the stranger is selfless, but ill-fated. Of course, the stranger girl is actually her sister Hitomi. If you know what causes Hitomi to show up here, you can probably avoid this un untimely end. Is it untimely though? Alright, now we can make the right choice here. Surveillance camera. Swap over to the other choice. Don't follow the footage. See my dad. Maybe by the time you ask me again, Fred, Twitch will be no more. Okay, back to the to be continued. Back to the BT to be continued as well. And still the keep out here. That guy, yeah. Let's jump over from here. All out run. Other guy. This will unlock the keep out. We can continue his story. Running along Koindori in pursuit of Miku, Minurikawa heard a cell phone ringtone coming from somewhere nearby. And it was a van. Suddenly, a massive fiery blast knocked him from his feet. A deafening roar set his head thro throbbing. What was that? What's going on? He lay in a daze on the ground, trying to wrap his mind around what he had just happened. And Miku is there. So this is his death, but from his perspective. He smelled the foul scent of burning rubber. What kind of rubber are we talking about? Actual rubber or condoms? Then came a sound of quick footsteps rushing up to him. Mr. Minrikawa! A voice called out to him as if across an impossible distance. Mr. Minrikawa? Was that Miku? It was Hatsune Miku. Man, imagine just you about to die and the last thing you hear is Hatsune Miku. Last thing you see, that would be a shit to death. He forced his eyes open and saw Miku looking anxiously down at him. Simin Rikawa. Miku. Those things I said earlier. I'm sorry. I went too far. What are you talking about? That's not important right now. Miku choked back a gasp, and Minorikawa realized he had blood leaking from his mouth. That is definitely not blood. His body wouldn't move, and his mind was reeling. What? What happened? Tell me. Miku, Miku's voice was dry and hoarse. There, there was a minivan. It, it, it exploded. At least his teeth are intact. Exploded? A minivan exploded on a city street? That sounded like a terrorist act. 
His reading of mind drifted back to the attempted body terrorist attack on Kasumika Sike two years ago earlier. An unoccupied minivan had exploded outside an MPD station, and afterward a device meant to scatter a dangerous biological agent had been discovered near the subway. With sudden clarity, Minurikawa recalled what Osawa had said earlier. The power balance of the entire world might be at stake here. Could there be some sort of connection between Misawa's warning and this explosion? There was. There had to be. And Rikawa's journalistic intuition told him it must be true. Something terrible was underway here in Shibuya. Police, a man in a suit announced. He crouched beside Bin Rikawa and gently lifted his head and torso. Hang in there, buddy. Stay with us. The change of position allowed Bin Rikawa to clear his airway and he sucked in a deep breath. But as he did, an intense pain shot through his lungs. I... I think I might be done for. Whatever his intuition might be telling him, it didn't look like he'd ever be able to write about it. But if he couldn't get his words onto the page, the least he could do was tell someone else. With his lost act, maybe he could still accomplish something. He strained to get a few words out. Osawa, Kenji, Osawa, the power balance of the entire world. As his voice filled, he heard the sound of ambulance sirens approaching. Paramedics began frantically unloading stretchers. Turning his head, he saw a number of other people who had been injured in the explosion laid out on the roadside. Amongst them were a woman and a child. Emergency workers bearing a stretcher came over to Minrikawa. Forget about me. I'm beyond helping. See to the others instead. Minrikawa shouted inwardly, but no one heard. Bad end. Premonition of disaster. Rikawa chased Miku as far as Korindori, only to be caught in the blast when a minivan suddenly exploded. A few simple words can change his fate. Someone who shouts something at 13.30 needs to change what it is they shout. When Rikawa hears something that grabs his attention, he may not get too close to the explosion. 15.30 Someone shouting. It has to be uh, Archie. Stay back, don't get too close. No, he told me wait. He told me wait. Archie shouted. But she didn't appear to hear his cries. This one see, looks inconsequential, but apparently it's not. Archie started to run after her. Reach the vehicle. Yes, yes. And it's gonna explode. See, the roof is intact, but then they mentioned the roof was blown off. Okay. And Minrikawa is safe because he heard Hitomi's name, even though that is strange. It's not like she's the only one. He told me wait. As he ran along Kawindori after Miku, Mirakawa heard someone shout out a familiar name. He told me. It was a pretty common name. Ordinarily, he wouldn't have given it a second thought, but he remembered that one of the Miss Midoriyama winners was named Hitomi Osawa. That made him curious. A moment later, he heard a cell phone ri ringtone. He immediately recognized it as an Aya Kamiki song. His reporter's instincts tingled. He stopped to take a look around, and one young woman caught his eye almost immediately. He couldn't assume that any pretty girl he saw was Miss Doriyama. After all, it would be a little too convenient if he just so happened to run into her now. Still, it didn't cost him anything to ask. 
When you hit Tomiyosawa, you might as well at least check. But to his own surprise, he hesitated in embarrassment. He'd never been too embarrassed to ask a question before. He didn't get a chance to contemplate that realization. Massive fiery blast knocked him from his feet. A deafening roar set his head throbbing. Who was that? What's going on? He lay in a daze on the ground, trying to wrap his mind around what had just happened. Behind him, there was a minivan, fiercely ablaze. A minivan? An explosion? The first thing to pop into his mind was the attempted by terrorist attack on Kasumi Gasuke two years earlier. An occupied minivan exploded outside afterwards while it spent to his kind of dangerous yeah, pilot. In the subway in the end no one had been harmed, but there were new rumors that the government had paid a terrorist organization a hefty sum to keep it that way. Right now Minorikawa was a stone's throw from the Shibuya precinct. Could this be a repeat of the Kasumagasuke attack? The entire area was in an uproar. People were running around in panic. Minorikawa could see several injured people lying on the ground, unmoving. And yet, despite the gravity of the situation, numerous onlookers were casually taking photos with the cell phones. How is that new? I mean, maybe it was new back then. Rikawa got to his feet, then went to try to get everyone away from the scene of the explosion. Hey, you guys, get back. There could be another bomb. Rikawa looked around as he pushed back the crowd. He was getting the strong whiff of a scoop. He needed to write his copy ASAP, but he couldn't just turn his back on the situation now. Two young men were strolling toward the burning vehicle. They had the look of juvenile delinquents. Wow, what the heck? Is this for real? Is this dangerous? Like, for serious? The pair tried to find an optimal vantage point. Hey, Minorikawa snapped. Don't get any closer. He spread his arms wide to hold him back. The young man came to a halt, but otherwise paid him no heed. Oh, this is bad. This is for real bad. This is a terrorist thing? Yeah, get out your phone. Come on. But like, you think this is a terrorist thing? Dude, shut up. Just hurry up and call Susumu. The of the two, dressed in red, was ordering around his blue-clad companion. Huh? The boy in the blue huffed. Burn, do it yourself. Say what now? Rich, ain't that no time to get yourself all worked up? Rikawa stood there, arms still held wide, getting more and more annoyed at their back and forth. Yeah, just make the call, man. The young fellow in red scowled as he wasn't going to back down. Yeah? Yeah, what's the difference does it make if I do it or you do it? Doesn't make any difference, so it don't matter if you do it. Yeah, right, it don't matter. So in that case, you do it. Look, I'm just telling you to make the damn call. And I'm telling you to just make it to your damn self. Oh, enough of this already. Rikawa opened his mouth to tell them off. But then the young man in red spoke again. Dude, the kids from over at Endo Electronics are gone. You gotta let Susumi know. The name Endo Electronics caught Minorikawa's attention. Ah, oh, yeah, but that all... Ain't that all, all that Ashi's dude's fault for getting all healthy at us? I mean, it was Kiryu who told us to go find the Endo storehouse. Yeah, but Susumi don't like dealing with stolen goods. Says it dirty is the SOS name. Well, what a coincidence. Looked like these two were SOS members. Hey, Minrikawa called out, you too. He finally succeeded in getting their attention. Where is this Susumu fellow? I'd like to talk to him. He had no idea who Susumu was, having only heard the name just now. Still, from the way these two were talking, it seemed clear he held some position of leadership. You think I'd tell you if I knew? The fellow in red snarled. Minrikawa kept his composure. Listen, you guys know the Terry Yugumi. Tenryu Gumi was a Yakuza syndicate that operated in Shibuya. The two that collectors are from them. 
an up-and-coming Yakuza syndicate that turned up on the scene 10 years ago with a seemingly legitimate Takarada financing as its business front. The group offers monetary solutions for people of financial trouble, but those who accept their offers soon find their troubles only grow and grow. Embroiled in co a conflict with the Kanto Shiramine Gumi, who have been long established in Shibuya. These street kids were sure to be familiar with the name, if nothing else. I may not look it, but I'm pretty tight with the term Yagumi. And maybe you two don't know it, but Susumu's been showing up at their office a lot lately. Since Susumu's been dealing with the Yakuza? Well, for real? Sweet! The two punks bought it completely. What's SOS, SOS doing? Um, what's SOS using as their hangout these days? I've got a little something to discuss with Susumu. Huh? Right now it's that bar called Inferno. Rakawa made a mental note of the name. Right, and Inferno, Inferno is where exactly? The two young men suddenly looked distinctly uncomfortable. Um, uh, uh, later. Yeah, I got a thing I gotta do too. Okay, Fred. Yeah, I'm probably gonna be on tomorrow. I think I'm gonna stream for another 30 minutes and then call it today. And then I'm gonna start uploading the uh, today's stream as well as uh, the stream from two days ago, the day before yesterday. If you're bored, you can always watch it at work. The first stream for this. I think the first session was only like less than an hour. Backing away, they took off through the crowd. Hey, wait up. I need to know where Inferno is. Google it. Oh, wait. But the pair had already vanished. Also, behind them is Archie and Hitomi. Oh, you're picking up your uncle from the airport today? Did your uncle teleport out of New Zealand again and then come back? Ambulances began arriving at the scene, and paramedics rushed out to tend to the wounded. Excuse me, would you mind answering a few questions? Yeah, I think the first session was like an hour-ish. I was trying to get it running, it took some time. And then, um, second session was longer. But the past few days have been pretty long. Rikawa turned to see a man in a suit approach him, flashing his badge. Okay, that's the keep out, salt. Or not, because... Apparently we haven't reached that point yet. Because of the choices we made. Or whatever, let's continue it. So a detective with questions for him, huh? How about you answer a few questions for me? Was this an accident or an attack? We still don't know any details. Let me rephrase that for you. This is a major incident, when Rikawa exclaimed. Huh? The detective looked pretty flamoxed. I've been around the block a few times, and I know all your police PR lingo. Alright, see you, Fred. I'll probably see you around another day, tomorrow or something. Unless you disappear for six months or so. Like last time. And when you start talking about the details, that is 100% indicative of a major incident. Rushing aside in Rikawa's remark, the detective tried another question. Did you happen to notice anything unusual prior to the explosion? Unusual? And Rikawa thought back to the moments before the minivan blew up. Ringtone. Now that you mention it, I think I heard a cell phone ringtone. The detective tilted his head. A ringtone? No, never mind, forget that. There's no way the ringtone on someone's phone would be audible through all of that. Rikawa struck the thought from his own mind as he said it. Now it's a detonation thing. Linked to a ringtone. No likelihood it associated the ringtone and the explosion simply because one had happened right before the other. Kono. Large statured Caucasian man called out to the detective. He's not Caucasian. Evidently, the detective name was Kano. Thank you for your cooperation, he said with a bow. Then he ran over to the foreigner.
Mr. Minrikawa. Minrikawa turned in a female voice behind him. He found Miku standing there. She looked like she'd been crying. And then he told her, big girls don't cry. Miku, about earlier, I, uh... He trailed off searching for an apology. It's okay, that doesn't matter right now. Miku looked around the scene, and Rikawa followed her gaze. Something big went down here, he said. I know, she exclaimed. Explosion. I saw it happen with my own eyes. You what? Miku looked around nervously. Are you alright? He asked her. You're not hurt, are you? I'm okay. My ears are still ringing a bit, is all. Good. I like it when people's ears ring. So what did you see at the time of the explosion? Miku assumed a thoughtful expression. There was this girl who was running towards the minivan. And then I think I saw this other Middle Eastern girl suddenly make a dive for her. And then the van just exploded. Wait, hold on, Enrikawa said. So if I'm getting this right, it sounds like the Middle Eastern girl saved the girl who was running up to the van. Miku nodded. Except she didn't. She just took her blood. Just then Enrikawa's phone chimed. He received an email. It was from Chiaki. Mr. Mino, are you still working on your copy? Well, he checked his watch. At this point, the 4 o'clock deadline was barely 20 minutes away. Nonetheless, he decided to stay at the bomb scene. He could definitely smell a scoop here, and he was sure of it. Even if he couldn't get his six pages done by four, landing a major scoop should be enough to persuade the loan company. Hirikawa jotted his phone and number down and handed it to Miku. I'll make things up with you, he said. Give me a call later. Miku took the scrap of paper, puzzled. If you're looking for Naki Jujutsu Dojo, I know a few. At that, her face lit up. When Rikawa decided to process the scene for clues, as he wandered around, he caught sight of Detective Kano and his Caucasian colleague heading down an alley. Hmm, what's that I smell? Something pretty damn fishy. If they were slipping away for a private conversation, maybe there was some way he could listen in. Rikawa hurried into one of the buildings that bordered the alley. He looked around and found a public bathroom upstairs on the alley side of the building. Hoping beyond hope, he slipped up to the bathroom window voices outside. He held his breath and listened. Those international criminals you mentioned? Kano's words were faint, but he could make them out. Rikawa did a little fist bump. Correct. Roughly eight hours ago, they infected Maria Osawa with the Owa virus. Then they let her loose somewhere in Shibuya. Hold on. By Uwe, you mean? The discussion involved some terms Minrikawa wasn't familiar with. He focused all of his mental energy on what the two were saying. This is a killer virus with a 100% mortality rate once it takes hold. 100%? Minrikawa muttered to himself. The shock caused him to unclench the fist he didn't realize he had made. This wasn't just an interesting conversation, it was monumental. It has an incubation period of 12 hours. In another 4 hours, Maria Osawa will go symptomatic. After that, she will begin spreading the virus through the city. Is capable of airborne transmission? If we don't administer Kenji Osawa's antiviral before de she develops symptoms. Yes? Everyone in Shibuya is going to die. Murakawa felt goosebumps rise all over his body. They were talking about a virus and a Kenji Osawa. They could only mean that Kenji Osawa. He recalled what Osawa had said earlier about the power balance of the world being at stake. Okay, so they injected Maria and she is a carrier at the moment. There was no doubt about it. This was a tremendous scoop. Well then, we need to find Maria Osawa and get the antiviral to her as soon as possible. Just calm down, there is more to the story there. Ah, oh, it's starting to leak out. The door swung open wildly and someone came barging into the bathroom. Okay, I knew it was him. Oh, 
who was Yanagishita. Why him again? And why here of all places? Ooh, I'm leaking here. Yanagishita was on the verge of hysterics. His voice must have been audible outside. Kanu and his companion went to take their discussion elsewhere. They've just been getting to the good part. You son of a bitch. Enraged Minurikawa grabbed y Yanagishita and tossed him to the floor. And then there is a Yakuza Zero fight in the toilets. I'm leaking. And he's grabbing his crotch. Shut your mouth. He put all of his strength into an ankle hold and gave it a good twist. A professional wrestling technique that involves grabbing the opponent by the ankle. Being caught up like this can be extremely painful. It also puts a lot of pressure on the lower body and if you're already fighting the urge to urinate, well... Oh, you're not used to wield. Nurikawa left the idiot blubbering in the bathroom and hurried down to the building. He hadn't heard the whole discussion, but he had a scoop on his hands anyway. This would be a tremendous call for Heaven Publishing, enough to let the company rebuild. He was certain of it. And if I'm the one saying it, it's gotta be true. As he ran along, Minurikawa tried to plan his next steps. First, he had to get back to the editing office. He'd explain the situation to the people from the loan company. Then he'd go find that paperwork for Osawa and have Chiaki check the copy. And then after that... Okay, he still had a lot of things he needed to do. He swatted himself on both cheeks to get himself psyched up. His phone rang, His phone rang not ranged. It was Chiaki. Chiaki's voice was a broken yelp. Wow, well, calm down. Uh, over, Quintori. This minivan exploded. Oh yeah, I'm well aware. Thanks to that, I got a big scoop then. Chiaki cut him off. Just now, we got a call from Mr. Toyama's daughter, Hannah. This time, when Rikawa waited for her to finish, he had a sinking feeling. She said that Mr. Toyama was in there. It was a suicide. And Rikawa's knees buckled. Tell me you're joking. No, I mean, the van explosion is all over the news. And Hannah was in tears on the phone and... Mr. Mino? Mr. Mino, are you still there? Toyama had killed himself? Rikawa felt the energy drain from his body. Well, that put a break on it. Or not. Maybe. To be continued. Okay, there's a boom. They followed it. Stanley's actor is really trying to sell the facial expression. Look at it now. But it looks like he's holding back his knees more than anything. Then Kano saw flames. This hadn't been an accident. Someone had set off an explosion. The Shibuya precinct wasn't too far from here. Kano recalled the attempted bioterrorism on Katsumigasuke. That incident had begun with a van, alright, we know. Already a large crowd of onlookers was gathering. Shots rose up as there was in scene. What's going on? Yes, yes, we, do, we know this already. Peering at the flaming chassis, he could see that there was someone inside. 
Oh no, could that be hit to me? No. Once they had their hands on the antiviral, the criminals would have no further use for her. Yes, yes. Hardly recognizable as human anymore. Keep out. Okay, we know how to solve the keep out though. We just go back to Minurikawa and uh, do the jump. I wonder if I can finish this chapter today. Possibly. Several people were on the ground, nearby evidently injured by the explosion. A girl in a hoodie was crouched among them, doing her best to tend to their injuries. Miku Morita, while walking along, upset Minurikawa for not introducing her to an Aiki Jujutsu dojo, she happened across the aftermath of the minivan explosion. Unable to stand oddly by when faced with such a horrific scene, she pitched in as best as she could to help the wounded. We don't need to jump there because it's not. We're already done with uh, Minurikawa. Khan recognized her as the girl he had talked to earlier during the traffic jam. Police, he announced. Get back, let me handle this. The girl was visibly relieved. Help her, she said. She pointed to a figure lying on the sidewalk, a short distance from the burning minivan. It was a Middle Eastern girl. She appeared to be unconscious. I think she got hurt rescuing another girl about college age. The girl in the hoodie said, College aged girl. That might be Hitomi. And no, it could be anyone. I mean, it is her, but it could be anyone. What happened to the girl she saved? Kano asked. The good Samaritan looked around. Huh? When did she go? The rescued head, rescuee had disappeared. This girl here. The girl in the hoodie gestured toward the fallen girl. I, I can't believe how fast she was. She spoke with a hint of awe. The way she moved to get to the other girl. She was on a level way beyond mine. Kano took another look at the injured girl. Her figure looked rather delicate. It was hard to believe she was capable of great feats of athleticism. He started toward, toward her, but Stanley stepped ahead of him. Leave this one to me, he said. His expression was unusually stern, even for him. Do you know her? Connell asked. American didn't answer as he checked the girl's pulse and then her pupils. Hey, Stanley. Don't you have other things you should be doing? Stanley snapped. Fine then, Connell decided to collect some eyewitness accounts. Patrol cars and ambulances arrived at the scene in a steady stream. Once the vehicle fire was under control, things gradually began to calm down. Several officers worked, officers worked to cover the area around the burned minivan with a blue tarp. Connell got his questioning underway, starting by flashing his badge at a man near the front of the crowd. Excuse me, would you mind answering a few questions? The man puffed himself up. How about you answer a few questions for me? Was this an accident or an attack? We still don't know many details, Kano admitted. The man shot his finger in Kano's face. This is a major incident. Let me present for you. Yeah, major incident. Yes. Ran the block a few times. Knows the PR lingo. Yep. Well, I should pick the wrong guy to try and talk to. Softening his frustration, Kano continued his questioning. Did you happen to notice anything unusual prior to the explosion? Unusual, now that you mention it, yes, cell phone ringtone, ringtone. Never mind, forget that, there's no way the ringtone, it, right. The man was probably right, but somehow the idea nagged at Kano. He jotted down a note in his pad. Kano. It was Stanley, perfect timing. Thank you for your cooperation, Kano told the man. Then he hurried in on his way. Stanley stepped in close enough to whisper. Who was that guy? An eyewitness to the explosion, apparently. Did he have any info? He said he heard his cell phone ringtone at the time of the explosion. Not sure if that's significant, though. Stanley stood silently for a moment, thinking. What about the girl? Kano asked. Has she woken up? No. I'm going to drive her to the hospital. Huh? Why do that yourself? 
Let's look around, Stanley said. He cast his eyes out over the scene. There were still many injured people lying on the roadside. It seemed that the authorities hadn't sent enough ambulances. But isn't your car back in Moraya Machu? Kano asked. Under the circumstances, I think it makes sense for me to go back for it. Sandy replied coldly. Besides, I have a few things I'd like to ask her. Kano was curious. You do? He asked. I mean, he recognized that he had a tattoo and that's probably why he's trying to talk to her. Stanley's cell rang. Yes, Stanley answered the phone in English. As he listened, his demeanor changed. The blood drained from his face and his hand began to tremble slightly as he gripped the phone. Kano had never seen him this shaken up. You got it, Stanley said at last. He hung up the phone and let out a sigh. What is it? Kano asked. Sandy headed into an alley without responding. Kano hurried after him. Once they were out of earshot of the crowd, Stanley finally spoke. That call right now was from Gordon, my superior. Gordon, really? They just went, uh, you know, what was the guy's name in Batman? Uh, Gordon, yes, Gordon. Let, let's just use that name. He's a police guy. He broke off there, and for a long while it was silent. He appeared to be struggling with some strong emotion. Connor was getting impatient. What is it? If you're going to tell me something, then tell me. Not to press. If it's that difficult to talk about, you don't have to. I don't think it really matters. It's that difficult, yeah, I don't have to. No, Stanley said. I should tell you this. He braced himself before continuing. We were contacted on our end by the mastermind of this plot. Those international cameras you mentioned? Correct. Roughly eight hours ago, they infected Maria Osawa with the Owa virus. Then they let her loose somewhere in Shibuya. Hold on. By Owa you mean? Kano thought back to his earlier conversation with Stanley. These criminals were trying to get their hands on a new drug. An antiviral drug developed by Kenji Osawa that had been shown to be effective against the O virus. Stanley hesitated before continuing. This is a killer virus with a 100% mortality rate once it takes hold. Kenji Osawa's antiviral is our only means of combating it. Mortality rate of 100%? It has an incubation period of 12 hours. In another 4 hours, Maria Osawa will, be, will go symptomatic. After that, she will begin spreading the virus throughout the city. Is capable of airborne transmission? Following the onset of symptoms, individuals infected with the Uwa virus bleed from the lungs, and the virus is readily released into the air via coughing. The Uwa virus is highly resilient in the open air, and can survive even after saliva or other fluids have evaporated. Simply getting within 2 meters of a symptomatic patient is said to carry a high risk of infection. But the fluids from deceased patients carry an especially high concentration of the virus, and anything contaminated with such fluids must be thoroughly sterilized before it is safe. Stanley nodded. If we don't administer Kenji Osawa's antiviral before she develops symptoms. Yes? Kano's voice was trembling now. Stanley spoke with complete certainty. Everyone in Shibuya is going to die. Well then, we need to find Maria Osawa and get the antiviral to her as soon as possible, Kano said, panicking. Sandy remained cool. Just calm down, there is more to the story though. Sandy was interrupted by a strange sound from the upper floors of a nearby building. Unsure of what it was, the two men hurriedly relocated. They paused when they came to the vacant lot. The empty lot from Yakuza Zero. The place was deserted, no need to worry about being overheard here. You said there was more to the story? Kano prompted. The antiviral in question is stored in Kenji Osawa's laboratory. The lab is protected by a sophisticated security system, and apparently the storage area where the drug is kept requires fingerprint authentication from both Osawa and Tanaka. What? But Tanaka's... Kano couldn't help but gasp. Tanaka was currently a fugitive, the prime suspect in the kidnapping case. There was no chance of getting any fingerprint authorization from him at this stage. 
Is there any way to get in? Kano asked. The door can also be unlocked with password in place of the fingerprint scanner. But we'd still need to know what Tanaka chose for his password. No. In any event, Stanley said, it was essential that we track down and secure Maria. But, he went on his voice grave. Even if we get Maria to safety, the mastermind is now in possession of the Oa virus. If they want to, they can unleash a bioterrorist attack on Shibuya at any time. To put it bluntly, the lives of every man, woman and child in the city are in their hands. In other words, the lives of you, me and the entire human race rest in the balance. <laughs> Kano felt a pulse of fear deep enough to give him vertigo. He slowly tilted his back. I tilted ba his back. What? Ah. He slowly tilted back his head. There is an extra his there. Threw me away. Threw me off. And gazed at the sky, vast and blue as always. There had to be ton tens of thousands of people in Shibuya right now. Rumi and Shizuo were among them. And they might all be dead within a day. It felt so unreal, Kano's mind almost couldn't process it. With an effort of will, he shook himself out of his daze. Now was no time to waver. We have to try. In the next four hours, we need to find Maria Osawa and figure out a way to stop this mastermind and the Uwa virus. The words were as much for himself as they were for his companion. Let's do this, Stanley. We might not always see eye to eye, but together I feel like you and I can find a way. But Stanley averted his gaze. My job here is simply to apprehend the mastermind. Kano felt the resurgence of his earlier anger at Stanley. Once again, he was putting his duties above human life. I'm sorry. Stanley's voice was a quiet mutter. We should get away from Shibuya as soon as possible, Kano. Kano hadn't imagined that the American would ever be worried for him. I appreciate the warning, he said, but I'm seeing this through to the end. This isn't the sort of thing you can solve with just an effort of willpower. Even so, giving up isn't the Japanese detective way. I was about to say they're gonna make it into a Japanese uh, thing. Stanley let out a nasal chuckle. Back to that again, are we? Same to you. Kano, uh, Kano managed a tiny chuckle of his own. Listen, Stanley went on after a moment. This is just between you and me. The mastermind behind this kidnapping case is an arms dealer who goes by the name Alfard. Arms dealer. Beyond simply selling weapons, illegal arms dealers are also frequently involved in smuggling weapons, unlawfully, obtained through deals with government or military contacts. In recent years, such enterprises have become increasingly globalized. Some dealers f form smuggling networks that also deal in money laundering, drug trafficking, and more. Alfred. The attempted bioterrorist attack on Kazumigaski, a hotel bombing in Chicago. Alfart had a hand in all of them. What do you know about this criminal? Kano asked. Sandy's expression grew even darker. Alfart's signature is extremely meticulous planning, but I don't mean meticulous in the same way you or I might normally think of it. Their plan are perfectly imperfect. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, the whole plan here. It's like a lot of variables, but somehow it was all predicted and planned for. Kano shook his head. All for a deliberately engineer's accident to make things complicated and unpredictable. It's difficult to get a good grasp of what's going on when the situation seems to be falling apart. People tend not to consider that coincidental mishaps might be anything but. In the end, they don't even realize they were playing right into the mastermind's hands all along. Kano could hear the intensity in Stanley's voice. It's the person claiming to be Kenan. I'm afraid that's all I can say. Stanley held out his right hand. See you around, Kano, if we're still alive. If we're still alive. Kano let that sink in for a moment. Now, I'll shake your hand after we finish this case. 
With a slight smile, Stanley withdrew his hand. Then the two bumped fists instead. At least they didn't shake dicks. Alright, we'll meet again, Connell. I'm sure of it. Yeah, see you then. No sooner had Stanley departed than Kuzi's voice came in over the wireless. Attention all units. As of now, further investigation on the kidnapping case is suspended. The director's voice sounded strangely cold. I repeat, as of now, further investigation on the kidnapping case is suspended. Wait, hold on, sir, Connor shouted. What is it, Connor? Could you let us know why? We've received information that Maria Osawa has been infected with an unknown virus and has been released somewhere in Shibuya. That matched up with what Stanley had said earlier. An anti-bioterrorism security force will probably be deployed in Shibuya. Well, bioterrorism, um, terrorism involving biological agents such as bacteria or viruses. Biological weapons are easier to acquire and transport than nuclear weapons, and because they rely on organisms' natural ability to proliferate or infect, they can yield powerful results for low effort. For these reasons, recent, recent years have seen widespread apprehension about the possibility that such weapons might be used by terrorists. In the event that a bioterrorist attack occurred in Japan, temporary quarantine and decontamination facilities will be set up in the area affected. This is no longer a simple kidnapping case. Our part in this is finished. No, it's not. We haven't managed to resolve anything. Kano, I assure you everyone else feels the same as you do. Kuzey's voice had a cautionary tone. They are still performing the autopsy on the body found in the blue minivan that exploded. We'll let you know once we have a positive ID. Kuzi out. The rector, but the line had already gone dead. Left at a loss, Kano gazed out at the cityscape. The sight of the bombed vehicle had calmed down briefly, but now that the news networks had begun reporting, the herd of onlookers was growing. There was also a sizable crowd gathered outside of a large home of electronic store, a large home electronic store. A large LCD television on display was showing a press conference being held by the governor of Tokyo. Kano might learn something new about the case, he decided to watch a broadcast. Kano's part when this was over, he had to hurry and find Rumi before it was too late. Yeah, let's find Rumi. <laughs> yeah, let's find Rumi. He left the electronics store and headed for the cafe where Rumi and Shizou were waiting. Café Lautrec seemed quiet when Kano arrived. Chizu was sitting alone. Kano scanned the establishment but didn't see Rumi anywhere. One of the staff greeted him. Welcome, just one, sir? No, I'm meeting someone, actually. Of course, sir. The hostess smiled and then went on her way. Chizu was glaring at him. Kano walked over to him and bowed deeply. It's a pleasure to meet you, sir. I'm Shinya Kano. You look like even more of a knuckle dragon than I thought. Shizu maintained his appraising stare. Shizu maintained his appraising. Um, Rumi had something she needed to do, so she stepped away for a while. He said after a long moment. Kano sat down across from him. There was a laptop computer open on the table. Right now, the laptop is in sleep mode, and there's nothing on the monitor, but just before Kano came in, Shizu is browsing an internet forum. He takes his user handle from a nickname for the apples that he grows on his own farm, which are pretty little things and nearly as sweet as honey. I fucking called it. Where is Fred? Fred needs to be here. He is pretty honey. He is pretty honey. I called it. Fucking called it. The 
the waitress came by to take Kana's order, so he asked for an iced coffee. And he's gonna criticize it. What are you using the computer for? Kano asked. I'm on the internet. Shizu's voice was low and gruff. This cafe has an internet connection? May as well start with a little small talk. So what? Again, Shizuo glared at Kano. Ah, uh, I just... The words couldn't come. No, actually, this is no time to be making idle chit-chat. If they got infected with the virus, Rumi and Shizuo might die. Um, look, please, you need to leave Shibuya right away. Shizuo's face contorted with confusion. What are you talking about? Why? Kano wasn't sure if he should tell the truth or not. He was strictly prohibited from discussing the case with anyone outside the department. As a former policeman himself, Shizuo ought to understand full well the secrecy an investigation required. But it wasn't like he'd just up and leave town without a good reason. Please listen, Kano said. There's a risk of bioterrorist attack. It's very important you go, though I'm not at liberty to tell you why. Just go. Even if this was Rumi's father, Kano couldn't bring himself to leak secret information. His mind spun with regret. Huh. Well, I don't need you to say so. Shizuo huffed. I'm sick of this town anyway. Kano was a bit relieved to hear that. Does this have something to do with the case you're working? Huh? You're telling me to leave Shibuya. Does that have something to do with the case you've ca uh, to do with the case? Yes, Kano admitted. So why did you run off with Rumi then? Shizuo's tone was frank. Well, I mean, when Kano didn't have an answer handy, Shizuo let out a single heavy sigh. Is your work important to you? He asked. Kano hesitated. Is it more important than Rumi? Well... Again, Shizuo cut Kano off as he waffled over to answer. Uh, waffled over how to answer. Me. I used to put my work before my family. There was no question. <laughs> No question in my mind that combating society's ills and solving cases was worth any price. And because of that, I did some pretty reckless things. Almost wound up dead more than once. Shizu opposed a forlorn look in his eyes. My wife did nothing but worry about me. So much that I hadn't, that I didn't even realize when she'd worried herself sick. I was so caught up in my work that I wasn't even there for her when she finally passed away. It was all so very absurd of me. The waitress came by and set, uh, and set Kano's iced coffee on the table. It sat there untouched until Shizuo looked at it pointedly. With a tiny nod, Kano brought the cup to his lips. Bittersweet liquid was a balm to his parched throat. I told Rumi the same story. Shizuo continued. But I didn't tell her how absurd it was. I told her that her father only did what he had to do. He took a sip from his glass of water. Rumi, she's very much like her mother used to be. Her personalities are almost identical. And I don't want her to suffer the same way my wife did. Shizuo's fist clenched in his lap. What was it that made you become a detective in the first place? He asked. He asked. Well, we know she. Uh, he just wanted to be on her father's good side. Well, at first I got the job because I thought it would make Rumi happy, and then I guess I also because also because I thought it would make you like me, sir. It was the truth, but Shizuo simply chuckled. 
true goal is to get me to like you. You may as well give up now. I'm sorry, sir, Kano said. I can't do that. Huh. Are you this stubborn around Rumi? Shizuo grumbled. I love your daughter, sir. I want to keep her safe, to make her happy. I originally loved your wife, but uh, then she died. But they share the same personality, like you said. So I guess I love your daughter now. Why is that? Whenever I think about her, I just feel so amazing. I'm sure that you or anyone can empathize with that. Everyone has someone they want to protect, who makes them feel that good. It's an admirable thing wanting to be a detective and protect the happiness of the people. But that doesn't mean you need to ignore your own happiness in the process. What you say may be true, sir. Earlier today, my partner was stabbed, and today is his wife's birthday. Fizzo will arch his brow. Is he going to make it? We're not sure yet. Last I knew, he was in critical condition. This is why I keep saying that the wife was a detective is, uh, is, uh... Shizuo's words trailed off into a lamenting murmur. Even so, Kano was unmoved. Dick dictum number one. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect. Ever. What's that? Something that a senior detective I admire very much said. It's a fundamental guiding principle I stuck to as a detective, but I was wrong about the real meaning behind it. My partner was stabbed, there are people I wanted to rescue. So much has happened, and now I finally understand what those words mean. When you see someone in trouble, you help them. That's not something a good detective does, that's something a good person does. Kano took a good lo long look at Shizuo's face. He had surprised himself finding the words to speak his feelings so clearly. And he wondered what effect it had had on the older man. I'm sure that from your perspective as my future father-in-law, my being a detective means that I'm putting my life on the line. But that's not entirely true. I can only be myself. This is the kind of person I am. I care about the helping people. Even if I were, to, uh, were a baker or a brewer or a bookseller, I'd still act the same way. You're being ridiculous. A baker and a detective don't assume anywhere near the same risks. I suppose that's true. Kano fussed with his hair sheepishly. Hmm. I think I see what kind of man you are now. Shizuo grumbled. He sounded oddly defeated. Which is why now is no time to just futz around. Kano sat up straighter at Shizuo's weighty tone. A detective means more than just passion. A detective can't solve all his problems with sheer determination alone. But at the same time, he needs more than just the ability to coldly assess the situation. He needs conviction to stick to a case when it might otherwise seem prudent to give up. There was something new in Shizuo's expression now and a gleam in his eyes that hadn't been there before. Kano almost felt like he was being ceremonized too by a senior officer. You got that? You need a cool mind but a fiery spirit. A detective without both of those is worth nothing. Do you mind if I write that, that down in my notebook here? Look. Shizu was saying, sounding suddenly embarrassed. Aren't you in a hurry? Don't you have to get back to your case? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, and sir, please, I need you and your daughter to leave Shibuya right away. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Kano conjured up Rumi's face in his mind. There was a chance he might never see her again. He forced the thought away as best he could. By the way, if I may ask... Oh. By the way, if I may ask... Shizu said. What was it about Rumi that made you fall in love with her? She has the same personality as her mother. What? 
Where is this coming from all of a sudden? Was it her looks? No, it wasn't just that. Kano found himself tongue tied again. I mean, she is pretty cute, even this even if this is my own daughter I'm talking about. Please don't go full Donald Trump, Shizu. Shizu shocked him by grinning from ear to ear. Well yes, she sure is, Kano replied, but it's more than just that. She's also very sweet and kind hearted. Oh, she is, isn't she? Yes, she really is. For the first time, Kano and Shizu smiled at one another. You're a man who lets his emotions show on his face. Shizu said. And for a detective, that's... actually, that's not so bad. Thank you, sir, Kano said. He bowed to Shizu as he stood up from his seat. Never lose sight of what you're supposed to protect her. I like that. Wise words indeed. Kano turned to look back and then bowed deeply to Shizuo one last time. That actually went better than expected. I thought uh, this is the choice that get, got me to the bad ending, but it didn't. The ability to call the assess the situation. Kano knew what he needed to do. There was one thing that was nagging him. No matter how hard he thought about it, it still didn't add up. Why would Tateno let Alcarawan go free? He needed to get back to the precinct and get the truth from Alcarawan first hand. As he walked along, he considered what he did know about the facts of the case. Just what sort of plan had Alfred put into motion here? It seemed that Tanaka and Osawa held the keys to understanding it. There had been relay handoffs of the phony attaché case, a relay that Tanaka had been complicit in. Then there was Hitomi missing, carrying the antiviral. Osawa had confirmed that himself. There is a jump. Khan was starting to, uh, to form, form a vague picture of what Alfred was up to. If the mastermind's goal was to acquire the antiviral, then obtaining the cooperation of the Osawa and Tanaka was vital to that plan. After all, the fingerprint verification was required to physically access the drug. In order to overcome that hurdle, Alfred had presumably managed to win over Tanaka somehow, and had then kidnapped Maria Osawa to provide leverage against her father. No doubt that was how they'd gotten Hitomi to take the antiviral with her to Hachiko. While the police were distracted by following the attaché case, Alfred would then take the antiviral from Hitomi. That was the general plan as far as Kano could surmise. Just then a call from Kuze came in over the wireless. We've identified the body found inside the blown up minivan. It's Tanaka, isn't it? Kano's hand tingled as it gripped the wireless. Mamoru Tanaka, male, 40 years old. An employee of Okoshi Pharmaceutical. Positive ID was obtained from the subject's personal belongings. What? Kano gasps. Yeah. Alpha didn't want any loose ends. If Tanaka was dead, it would now be almost impossible to access the antiviral drug in the laboratory. At this point, the only antiviral they had any chance of obtaining was whatever Hitomi was carrying, which was taken away by Alfred. Kano thought back to what Stanley had said earlier. Even if we get Maria to safety, the mastermind is in possession of the Uwa virus. If they want to, they can unleash a bioterrorist attack on Shibuya at any time. To put it bluntly, the lives of every man, woman and child in the city are in their hands. No. A chill ran down Kano's spine. If someone did release the old virus, there would be no way to stop it from spreading. If Alfred really was planning a bioterror attack, Shibuya would well and truly become a city of the dead. He couldn't help but feel that the whole department was playing right into Alfred's hands. Khan was staggered, physically stricken by the realization of just how terrifying a foe they were up against. To be continued? Yep, there we go. This is a good stopping point then. Yeah, I 
I'm gonna try the other choice later on. And, um, I mean, not later on, tomorrow. And then we can, uh, we already have the jump for Kano to Sawa. So it's all good. We can finish this chapter in the very beginning of tomorrow's stream. And then we can go on to 4 o'clock. So yeah, I'm done for the day. Thanks to everyone who stopped by, chatted, lurked, um, or just uh, dropped by and then realized this channel is awful and they didn't want to stick around. The tree is nice. I um, I would have liked it more if it was kind of an actual tree, with, but I don't know how they would have done it with multiple characters. I'm not sure if you played um, the Zero Escape games. Those ones have um, trees and uh, you can play with the branches. This one you don't see the branches, which is, uh, it can be a little difficult to see. Like if you want to see all the bad endings, I imagine this will be very difficult in this game. But yeah, my throat is sore. I'm probably gonna get something to eat. And uh, yeah, you know what? Let's uh, let's raid out. Let's raid. Uh, let's raid Gator. I think that's a good idea. Uh, streaming Resident Evil again, probably a uh, speed run. So yeah, I am gonna call it today. Stick around for the raid. Would be appreciated. And I'll catch you all hopefully tomorrow.